This is Josiah Plays Lone Wolf, Book 21, Voyage of the Moonstone. The Moonstone is a legendary artifact that was created by the godlike Shianti. It contains the might of all their magic and wisdom, the sum of their divine knowledge. Lone Wolf, supreme master of the Kai, has succeeded in retrieving it from the clutches of Nar, the King of the Darkness. Now the Moonstone must be returned to its creators who are exiled upon the remote Isle of Lorne in southern Magnamund. Someone must take the fabled artifact to the Shianti, and Lone Wolf has chosen you, the most promising warrior among the ranks of the New Order Kai, to carry out this vital mission. Armed with the special weapons and skills of a New Order Grand Master, you embark upon a secret voyage to the distant Isle of Lorne. However, your mission quickly becomes a life and death struggle when you encounter intrigue and deadly danger en route. Okay, hello and welcome. Welcome back to another Lone Wolf book. This is the 21st book in the series. We have read and played through together 20 of them so far. Uh, and the last book marked the end of the Grand Master series, and now we begin what is called the New Order series. And it's a pretty huge transition, because for the last 20 books, we have been playing the role of Lone Wolf, the titular character. And yet now, our time as Lone Wolf is at an end. We will now be playing a new character, one of Lone Wolf's students, a new Grand Master. So we're playing a different Kai now. No longer Lone Wolf. So I will have to bid farewell to all of my stats and everything here that I've saved up as Lone Wolf. My combat skill and endurance, my rank, my inventory. Goodbye Platinum Ingot. Goodbye Naphtha Bomb. Goodbye Summer Sword. And Silver Bracers. Goodbye all this stuff. 215 gold crowns at Monastery. Goodbye. So, what I'm going to do is hit refresh right now, and it's going to wipe this clean. Voyage of the Moonstone. Okay. We're starting over from scratch. From scratch. But not as a Kai initiate like Lone Wolf started at. We're starting as a Grandmaster, so we'll still have all the Kai and Magna Kai stuff. Okay, so these books were written by Joe Deaver, and this one was illustrated by Trevor Newton. You can see the cover of the book there to my right, or to the right side of the screen. That is what the cover looked like. I never owned this one. I never got this far into the books. Or not even close to this far, really. The books came out in the uh, 80s and early 90s. I loved them as a kid. Now we're doing them here in digital form thanks to ProjectAeon.org. They have all the Lone Wolf books on their site in digital form by permission of the author. The music you hear throughout this stream slash video is by Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com. Does lots of great royalty free music that anyone can use for anything they want. It's pretty great. So moving forward. There's a dedication, there's an acknowledgement, or multiple. And then we come to the story so far. So we're going to read the story so far and see what it says. This is basically our previously on Lone Wolf. This will get us up to speed. I'll take a sip of water and I'll do this. The story so far. You are a Kai Grand Master of the New Order of the Kai, the warrior elite of Summerland. It is the year MS 5083, and 33 years have passed since the First Order of the Kai was almost wiped out by the Dark Lords of Helgadad. These champions of evil, who were sent by the Dark God Nar to destroy your fertile world of Magnamund, have since been destroyed. The leader of your illustrious fighting order, the legendary warrior Lone Wolf, was the sole survivor of the First Order of the Kai, 
and as a young initiate he had stood amid the burning wreckage of the old Kai Monastery and had vowed to avenge the massacre of his comrades. In the year MS 5070 he was to keep his pledge when alone he infiltrated the foul domain of the Dark Lords and destroyed the base of their power, the infernal city of Helgadad. With the fall of Helgadad, chaos befell the Darkland armies who had, until then, been poised to conquer all of Magnamund. Quickly, their disorder escalated into a mutinous civil war which allowed the Freeland armies of Magnamund time in which to recover and launch a successful counteroffensive. Against all odds, a swift and total victory was secured over the feuding armies of evil. Following the demise of the Dark Lords, peace reigned in your homeland of Summerland. Under the direction of Lone Wolf, the ruined Monastery of the Kai was rebuilt and restored to its former glory, and the raising of a new order of Kai warriors was swiftly re-established. You are one of this new generation of Kai recruits. You were born in Summerland in the year MS 5063, during the era of war against the Dark Lords and you were sent by your father to the Kai Monastery at the age of seven to develop your martial skills and the latent Kai abilities which lie dormant in some some lending. During the years that followed, your skills were nurtured and honed to perfection by long hours of study and rigorous training. Your exceptional talent helped you to master all of the Kai and Magna Kai disciplines, and you rose swiftly through the ranks of the New Order to become one of only five who now hold the high rank of Kai Grand Master. It is an achievement which has brought great honor upon you and your family. In the year 5077, your skill and courage were put to the test when an attack was launched upon the Kai Monastery during Lone Wolf's absence. By means of a shadow gate, an astral corridor between the physical world of Summerland and the many ethereal domains which lie beyond it, the Dark God sent forth a host of dragon creatures to besiege the monastery and lay waste to all Summerland. He had chosen his time well, yet his evil plan was thwarted by the tenacious defense that you and your brethren maintained until the siege was raised by Lone Wolf and the King's Army of Summerland. The defeat of his minions enraged the Dark God and inflamed his lust for vengeance. Three years later, he created and sent to Summerland an evil champion called Wolf's Bane, who was the very image of Lone Wolf. While your leader was engaged upon a quest overseas, this imposter terrorized your homeland in his guise and sought to destroy the reputation and the honor of the Kai. He would have succeeded had not Lone Wolf returned home and pursued this enemy to an ancient necropolis in the Somlending city of Tyso. There, deep within a subterranean crypt, he and his evil alter ego were drawn through a shadow gate to the Plain of Darkness, Nar's stronghold, where a deadly duel ensued. Lone Wolf vanquished the foe and discovered that Nar had in his possession the fabled Moonstone of the Shianti. This wondrous artifact was created many thousands of years ago by the godlike Shianti, whose presence upon Magnamund had heralded the dawn of humanity. This stone of power contains the combined might of all their magic and wisdom, the sum of all their knowledge. So significant was the creation of this stone that all time on Magnamund has since been measured from the date of its creation. It had long been held that the Moonstone's location was a secret known only to the remnants of the Shianti, who dwell upon the mysterious Isle of Lorne in southern Magnamun. Yet the evidence of Lone Wolf's eyes had told him that this mystical artifact had somehow fallen into the hands of Nar. Hey Noxmu, how you doing? Good to see ya. What's going on, Noxmu? Moonstone. That's right. That's right, Noxmu. Lone Wolf realized that the Dark God had been using its legendary powers to generate shadow gates within the world of Magnamund at locations and times of his own choosing. Such power had enabled him to send his loathsome champions to your home world, while the forces of the gods of good, Kai and Ashir, had been held at bay. Only Lone Wolf and the new order of the Kai had stood in the way of the onslaught of Nar's agents since the demise of the Dark Lords. 
Lone Wolf successfully escaped from the Plain of Darkness and returned to Summerland, yet he knew that the fight against evil had not been won outright. He realized that he would have to return to the Plain of Darkness and retrieve the fabled Moonstone. Only by doing so would Magnamund truly be safe from Nar's legions of darkness. Two years ago, with the aid of his most trusted ally, Lord Ramoa of Desi, Lone Wolf fulfilled his vow by journeying to the Dark God's domain and retrieving the Moonstone of the Shianti. Upon his triumphant return, Lone Wolf placed the Moonstone in the Vault of the Sun, his personal chamber located deep below the fortified citadel of the Kai Monastery. He had hoped that the fabled artifact could remain there indefinitely, to be guarded by generations of Kai who would keep it secure from Nar's minions. Retrieval of the Moonstone had denied the Dark God's champions ready access to Magnamund, yet Lone Wolf knew that there were many lesser agents of Nar upon Magnamund waiting, quietly in the shadows, for the chance to do his evil bidding. Undoubtedly, they would stop at nothing to retrieve the Moonstone for their fell master. So all the forces of evil want this Moonstone. I'm doing good. I'm doing good, Nox. Thanks. Not bad at all. Within a year of his return home, it became clear to Lone Wolf that his wish could not be fulfilled. At first, the presence of the Moonstone seemed greatly beneficial to Summerland. Crops grew abundantly, incidents of disease and illness became increasingly rare, and the newly born were uniformly healthy. Even the offspring of the impoverished who, in normal times, could expect only one in three of their infants to survive longer than a month after birth, were all in good health and exceptional in their physical and mental development. The Samlending called this extraordinary period of providence the Blessing of the Moonstone. Yet this time of good fortune could not last. The power of the Moonstone was a great force for good, but it was also greatly disruptive of the natural order of Magnamund. Soon, death itself became a rarity in Summerland, and the four seasons of the year were slowly transformed into one unending spring. Lone Wolf was deeply concerned at the changes wrought by the Moonstone, and sought the counsel of his closest friend, Guildmaster Bainden, leader of Summerland's Brotherhood of Magicians. Bainden entreated him to relinquish the Moonstone before the effects of its power became irreversible. To right the balance of nature, the Moonstone would have to be taken to the Isle of Lorne, in the southernmost reaches of Magnamund, and delivered back into the hands of the Shianti. Only they, its creators, could prevent its powers from disrupting the natural order of your world. So the problem is that things are too good? Like, things are great with this Moonstone, let's get rid of it. Can't have things being this good. We need babies dying again and stuff. Stat. Lone Wolf agreed with Bainden. The Moonstone would have to be returned to the Shianti. The physical effects of its presence were beginning to attract the unwelcome attentions of those who secretly sought to enact Nar's revenge upon the Kai. When one of Nar's agents was captured by a Kai patrol within a few miles of the monastery, Lone Wolf felt he could wait no longer. He resolved to act immediately. Preparations were made for a long journey. And, especially among the lower ranks of the Kai, rumors were rife that Lone Wolf himself would take responsibility for carrying the Moonstone to the Shianti. Indeed, this speculation seemed to be confirmed as fact when it was discovered that he had secured the use of Guildmaster Bainden's famous flying ship, Cloud Dancer. It therefore came as a shock when early one morning you were summoned unexpectedly to the Vault of the Sun. In strictest confidence, Supreme Master Lone Wolf informed you that he had decided to entrust you with the task of taking the Moonstone to the Shianti. The elaborate preparation he was undertaking was simply a diversion, a bluff designed to draw attention away from the vital mission that he wished to entrust to you, the most talented and courageous of his Kai Grandmasters. All right, cool. We get a mission. It's gonna be weird not being a lone wolf. It's gonna be super weird. 
All right, here we go. I think we have to make our character now. So, brand new character creation. Here we go. First, I need to make a combat skill. 25 plus a random number. I got a 3. That's not a good roll. So my base combat skill is 28. This is not going to go well. Then I got a roll endurance, an 8. Add 30 to this number. Base endurance is 38. I think Lone Wolf's got to the age where he's just like, I'm getting too old for this shit. <laughs> he just wants to stay back in the monastery and watch Netflix. Well, I have 28 combat skill and 38 endurance. Alright. Moving forward. My Kai name. It has long been the tradition of your elite warrior caste to bestow a new name upon each young novice when they complete their first year's training at the Kai Monastery. Kai names are chosen by senior Kai masters with the aim of reflecting the individual strengths and qualities of each novice. Okay, I can create my own Kai name, or I can generate one at random using the tables below. Lone Wolf's like, I might go, but Game of Thrones is on, yeah. Um... Well, let's just imagine that I rolled one up randomly, what would I get? I'd get a 62. Wise Hawk. Alright. I think my Kai name is actually going to be different, though. Alright, Kai... Kai name. Fire Snake. Pretty predictable, really. So we're no longer playing Lone Wolf. We're now playing Fire Snake. And, and no, I'm not going to name myself Blazer. Fuck that guy. As far as I'm concerned, Blazer is dead. Alright. So... Here's a summary of the Kai and Magna Kai disciplines that I know. I'm not going to read all these because we're familiar with them by this point. The only thing that's changed here is this, and it's a really big deal. Your prefix was chosen already. It was empty. You should be Empty Helm. Empty Helm? <laughs> nice. That is not a very complimentary name. What's your name? I'm Empty Helm. Why do they call you that? Because I'm dumb, I guess. Look at this, though. This is a huge change. The curing, one point per section of the book you go through for your healing. Well, two things. One, points have to be lost as a direct result of combat, so no healing, hunger damage, or falling damage. Two, the maximum number of endurance points that can be restored in this way is limited to ten per adventure. So that is really going to hurt me. That is really going to hurt me. Alright, so moving on, moving on, moving on. Now there's New Order, Kai Grandmaster Disciplines. After years of martial training and study at the Kai Monastery, and by the rigorous practice of the teachings of your illustrious mentor, Kai Supreme Master Lone Wolf, you have achieved the noble rank of Kai Grandmaster Senior. Following in the footsteps of Lone Wolf himself, you have vowed that one day you will become totally proficient in all 16 of the New Order Kai Grandmaster Disciplines. There's some new ones. I know, that is terrible, isn't it, Noctimoon? By the way, how you doing, Frey Guy? Good to see ya. May I call you Frey Guy, or do I have to call you Frey Guy 55? Is, are we standing on formality here? I don't want to be too familiar. <laughs> Only my friends call me Frey Guy. It's Frey Guy 55 to you. You know, I don't know. I don't know how these things work. Um, by doing so successfully, you will share with Lone Wolf the responsibility, the honor, and the future glory of leading the New Order Kai as a supreme master. Alright. This says four right here, but actually, this is wrong. 
it was verified in loan in Joe Deaver's newsletter, and also it says so in the reader's handbook that we have here on Project Aeon. I actually get five. I, you're supposed to start with five New Order Grandmaster Dismos, not four. Now there are a lot of them. There's all the uh, all the normal Grandmaster disciplines that Lone Wolf had, right? And there are some new ones. And what I think I'm going to do is take the new ones and take the one thing that I never took as Lone Wolf, which was Magi Magic. I never took Magi Magic. So I'm going to take Magi Magic first thing on the new character. Old Kingdom Magic. Under the tutelage of Lone Wolf, you have been able to master the rudimentary skills of Old Kingdom Battle Magic. These arcane skills include the use of basic Old Kingdom spells such as Shield, Power Word, and Invisible Fist. As you advance in rank, so will your knowledge and mastery of Old Kingdom magic increase. So that's like the magic of Ramoa, the elder, the elder mages of Desi. The, pronounce, the pronunciation of Frey rhymes with Guy. Fry Guy? Oh, right, like Glenn Fry, formerly of the Eagles. Same spelling, same pronunciation. Fry guy. Got it. Sounds better that way. Okay. So, we're taking Magi Magic. Now, here's the new ones. Not Kayak, but here's the new ones. Astrology, Herb Mastery, Elementalism, and Bardsmanship. So, let's read those because I'm going to take all four of them. Even though I don't think the optimal ones to take are these, I think I really need, like... Grand Hunt Mastery and like Deliverance and Grand Weapon Mastery. Those are ones that I feel like I should be taking. Like if I wanted to optimize this shit. But fuck it. Fire Snake don't do things that way. He's an iconoclast. He likes to go his own way and he likes to try out all this newfangled shit. He's not stuck in the past with those old traditions. Lone Wolf. One of the new disciplines is Plant Mastery. I know, right? He, he got sick of getting fucked with by plants. Well, kind of is actually, Noxmu. Herb Mastery is almost Plant Mastery. <laughs> anyway, so these are the other ones we're going to take. They are not on the character sheet here in Stats Keeper, so I'm going to have to just, like, write down that I have them. I have them. Astrology. Herb Mastery. Elementalism and bardsmanship. That sounds so non-Kai to me, but I don't care. I'm taking it. I'm gonna fucking sing and smoke herb my way to victory and do some fucking astrological charts and shit. Alright, so here's astrology. The celestial bodies which occupy the skies above Magnamond have long been known to affect the lives of its inhabitants. Mastery of this discipline enables a new order Grand Master to predict and shape the future. Shape the future! That actually sounds pretty powerful. By studying the relative positions of the sun, the moon, and the myriad planets and stars. The number and accuracy of these predictions increase as a new order Grand Master advances in rank. So I can do horoscopes for people now. Herb Mastery. Mastery of this New Order discipline enables a Grand Master to identify readily any substance derived from living or growing organic material. He is aware of any secret uses to which an organic material may be put, and he is skilled in affecting the release of a substance's medicinal and or magical and or recreational properties. Alright, so these sound so useless compared to like the core ones that you have to have normally. These are some terrible new disciplines, but I'm taking them. I'm taking them. You can't stop me. If you'd like to perform Blazer's Greatest Hits at the end tonight in lieu of paying for a room, turn to page... Yeah. yeah. Now, Elementalism actually legitimately sounds good. Elementalism. This discipline enables a New Order Grandmaster to manipulate the four basic elements. Earth, air, fire, and water. By drawing upon individual elements that are available, or combinations thereof, he is able to detach, affix, increase, concentrate, intensify, remove, or accelerate this matter to fulfill a specific purpose. 
E.G. create a wall, hurl a rock, spray sand, remove air, intensify fire, like the sound of it. The versatility of this discipline increases as a new order grandmaster advances in rank. So I'm a straight up wizard now. And I'm a bard. Bardsmanship. Through mastery of this discipline, a Kai Grandmaster of the New Order becomes a multi-talented performer, proficient in the use of any musical instrument. He is able to sing or chant, recite or compose tales of legend, mimic speech or dialect, and stimulate a wide range of emotions among sentient creatures. The effect and power of his bardic abilities will steadily increase as he advances through the Grandmaster ranks. Honestly, bardsmanship seems like the most silly one of all. Just It just doesn't seem to fit with like what the Kai... Are and and what their and what their normal abilities are like, but whatever. Now I've got it now. Bardsmanship. All right. So I can carry my stuff forward to the next book. It says, yeah. If I encounter a Vogon, I'd be able to successfully compose Vogon poetry. Yeah. Much to everyone's horror. Equipment. Before you leave Home Guard on the first stage of your long voyage to Elzion, you acquire a map of your sea route. Oh, I love the maps. The maps always make me happy. Let's check out the map. Let's, let's take the cover off. Let's check out the map. Big map action. Alright, so we have this upper map here. This is, of course, Somerland, and the typical areas. This is like the map from the first book, except the map in the first book was tilted. Like, this, this home guard and the monastery were, like, over here, and Durinor and all this were, like, over here, or the, or the second book. It's, like, at a weird angle. It was, it was this same area, but it was straight across in the first and second book. Because there was Ragadorn where I got all my shit stolen. So, this is a bizarre map, actually. Like, in terms of how it's oriented and what it shows. The coastal route between Summerland and Desi. Oh, I see. So I'm going to go down the coast here. And then... Keep going down the coast like this, I guess. Right, because, like, this is north. North is is to the left here. Or you see. Yeah, okay. And we're we're coming down here to Elzion. Down here in Desi. Alright. Well that's the map. Alright, I got some gold. Red War Random Number, I got three. Add 20. I have 23 gold crowns to my name. I can get five items from the list below, only two of which may be weapons. Alright, I want a bow. I want a bow. That's one item. I want a quiver with arrows. Six arrows. That's two items. A flute. I probably need a flute if I'm a bardsmanship guy. A sword, two meals, a rope, potion of lomspur. Gonna need that. A rope. I'm gonna need meals too. I don't have hunt mastery. Fuck my life. I'm gonna need meals. A rope. One, two, three, four. Potion of Lomspur. That's it. That's all I can take. I can't take the flute. Fuck it. I'm taking the flute instead of a rope. I'm about to Ocarina of Time this shit. I'm just gonna pull my- pull up my flute and just randomly play it at different times through the adventure. 
and accomplish things by doing so somehow. All right, I got a flute. <laughs> a flute. This series is taking a strange turn. And I get a special Kai weapon. That's why they didn't bother to take another weapon besides the bow. Upon reaching the ultimate rank of Kai Supreme Master, Lone Wolf received as a reward from the god Kai many new skills and abilities. One of these skills was Kai Weapon Craft. Using his newfound mastery, Lone Wolf forged ten weapons of magical power in the armory furnaces of the Kai Monastery. These magical weapons are reserved for the elite of the New Order Kai who attain the rank of Grand Master. Oh yeah, I remember Bard's Tale. I actually backed the new Bard's Tale 4 on Kickstarter. Alright, I can choose my own Kai weapon from the table below, or I can generate one at random. So here's the table of possible Kai weapons. Sunstrike looks pretty good. Or Kai Star. I think I'm gonna go with uh I'm gonna go with Sunstrike. That definitely gets a trademark. So now, I add that to this. And my combat skills up to 33, which is so much lower than Lone Wolf's was. I'm really concerned about that. It says you can just pick it. So I just, I picked Sunstrike. Sunstrike. Some of these other ones get better bonuses situationally, but they're ludicrously situational. Fry guy says, just don't fight anyone. Fighting would be unbardsman like conduct. No kidding, right? Well, I'm just assuming my character is basically like a cross between some kind of fucking wizard and like. My character is like a cross between Gandalf and Dandelion from the Witcher games. Not really like Gandalf, really, because my character's pretty young. He's only 20 years old, I think. Alright. I don't think I need to know anything else here. I really need Grand Weapon Mastery pretty bad, because my combat build skill sucks ass, but... Hopefully I can actually make it through the book. Hopefully it's not so hard, you know, because they just started you over and you're way weaker than you were as Lone Wolf, so... Hopefully they're not making me fight dudes with 50 or 60 combat skill like I had to as Lone Wolf. Alright, let's go. Rules for combat have not changed. Levels of New Order Kai Grand Mastership. Yeah, this note's like, we don't understand why shit is different, and I, it doesn't really matter. And there are no improved disciplines yet, because I'm at base rank. New Order Wisdom. This says the same thing as the Wisdom thing in the beginning of every book, it's not that great. 
This is some bullshit, though. Every book has said this, and it's always been a lie. Wise Choice will enable any player to complete the quest no matter how weak their initial combat skill and endurance scores may be. No, I've run into fights that were so hard combat skill wise that if you didn't have super high combat skill, you could not fucking beat them. So don't pretend like sometimes you don't need a really high combat skill, because sometimes you do. The Chaos Master. All right, here we go. I think we're about to start. We're actually gonna start the adventure now. All right, section one, this is the actual start of the adventure. Are you ready? We are about to bard the shit out of this thing. Understand that your mission must be conducted with the utmost secrecy to ensure its success, says Lone Wolf, fixing you with his steely gaze. You nod your head in acknowledgement and watch with growing anticipation as the Supreme Master of the Kai rises from his throne and moves silently across the polished stone floor of his magnificent vault. From a concealed safe in the granite wall, he removes a seemingly plain leather satchel which he unbuckles and holds open, inviting your inspection. Nestled within lies a legendary moonstone, surrounded by a shimmering halo of golden light. Nox says it's odd that Lone Wolf would choose this guy to carry the moonstone. Why, because of the abilities I chose? <laughs> this is a mission for an astrologer herb master bard. <laughs> Not... We've got, we've got other adepts that actually know how to fucking fight, but no, I think we'll send Fire Snake. The inner lining of this bag is woven from strands of fine-spun corlinium, says Lone Wolf, as he carefully buckles the satchel's leather flap. The mineral hide the Moonstone's powerful energies, especially from those who have no need to rely solely upon their eyesight to detect its power. He offers you the satchel, and you accept it with trembling hands. Yet the moment you touch the bag, you feel all of your anxieties suddenly vanish, and the natural air of calm confidence, for which you are noted among your brother Kai, swiftly returns. Oh, he's getting sent because he's got calm confidence. Calm confidence ain't gonna help me when I'm fighting some shit with 50 combat skill and is kicking my ass. All right, Moonstone, special item. Just casually have the Moonstone in my inventory. You carry it slung over your shoulder in its leather satchel. Lone Wolf informs you that you are to journey 2,000 miles to Elzion, the principal city of the jungle realm of Desi. I remember we went to Elzion way back in, like, Book 7, Castle Death. Yeah, that's where I lost the towel. That's the adventure where I lost the towel. Never forget. There you are to seek out Lord Ramoa at the Tower of Truth. He will assist your onward passage to the Isle of Lorne. In the interests of secrecy, Ramoa is the only other person who knows about your mission. Lone Wolf has arranged for you to travel aboard a Somlending trading ship, sailing out of Holmgard for Bisutan by way of Barakish. You will be met in Barakish by Lord Lieutenant Fernand the Somlending Envoy to Vasagonia, who will join you on the voyage to Bisutan, where his rank and reputation will help speed the final leg of your journey to Elzion. To allay suspicion, you will travel in the guise of a Kai journeyman. At the same time, as you embark upon your long voyage south, so Lone Wolf will leave the monastery aboard the cloud ship, the skyship Cloud Dancer, and journey to distant Lencia in the far west of Magnamund. He shall carry with him a replica of the Moonstone to draw away the attention of any who would seek to thwart your true quest. It's like made of paper mache. Upon concluding your briefing, Lone Wolf orders you to go to your quarters and rest. You are to return to the vault at midnight in full readiness to begin the mission. Noxmu says, Lone Wolf, don't worry, if you get captured, just play Twinkle Twinkle Little Star until they let you go. No agent of Car would ever. No agent of Nar would ever suspect you to be a Kai. Right? 
All right, here we go. Turning to 235 with with calm confidence, I go there. Dressed in the plain green tunic, breeches, and cloak of a Kai journeyman, you return to the Vault of the Sun at midnight as ordered. Lone Wolf approves of your appearance and commends you for your determination to succeed. Lone Wolf just let me know my eyebrows were on fleek. He is confident he has chosen the right Grand Master to fulfill this vital mission. He opens a concealed portal in the wall of the chamber and he motions you to follow him as he steps through into a torch-lit tunnel. This secret passage passes under the walls of the monastery and emerges at a clearing in the surrounding Fryland Forest. Here awaits a party of men and horses, elite troopers from King Ulnar's Court Cavalry Regiment. Lone Wolf bids you a good luck and godspeed as you climb into the saddle of a chestnut mare. And, with a proud salute, you bid farewell to your leader before galloping away with the horsemen along a moonlit forest track. Well, let's hope uh, that Fire Snake here does better with with escorts and, and guides and stuff than Lone Wolf did. Maybe these people will survive. Your bodyguard of King's Troopers have orders to ensure that you reach Homeguard Harbor swiftly and safely. They know nothing about your mission. You ride all night and enter the capital shortly after dawn, whereupon you are escorted through the awakening streets to the harbor where the pride of Summerland, an armed caravel, is moored alongside the stone quay. From its mainmast fi flies a red flag emblazoned with a golden galleon and a five-pointed crown. It is the Home Guard Ensign, the flag of this city's trading fleet. As you rein your mare to a halt, you cast your eyes along the ship's deck and note that it is equipped with several light swivel cannon mounted upon the gunnels. It is uncommon for traders to be armed, even those that venture regularly into the Kuri Sea, which is notorious for its brigands and pirate raiders. Your voyage is destined to traverse, to traverse these perilous waters, and so the unexpected sight of the ship's guns comes as a welcome surprise. Yay guns, here's our ship, the Pride of Summerland. Looks alright, looks alright, looks kind of small actually, but, you know, I think it's, I guess we'll, uh, we'll make do. Wonder how long it takes for this ship to crash. If your name is Blazer and you wish to show the Moonstone to everyone you meet, turn to page 101. <laughs> A bristle-bearded first mate called Paol is on Don Watch, and he beckons you to come aboard. Your cavalry escort, having delivered you safely to the quay, now bids you a safe voyage and depart from the harbor with your horse in tow. Paol welcomes you and offers to show you to your cabin. He says that the ship's master, Captain Raker, is still ashore after having spent last night celebrating at the Good Cheer Inn. He says he was due back at dawn, yet he does not appear to be particularly concerned by his absence. It is not uncommon for Captain Raker to be l late back from shore leave. Oh, that Captain Raker. What a rake. Er. Especially when he and his crew are to embark on a long voyage. Payall tells you not to worry, and says that Raker should be back within the hour. Listen, this voyage is pretty fucking important. We ain't got time for dude to be all fucking around somewhere. Let's go, Captain Raker. Let's get this show on the road. Let's get moving. I can wait on board or go look for him. I'm a Kai Grandmaster. I don't go look for people. I wait on board. I'm waiting on board. Bards and inns go well. That's true. If I go to the end, I might be able to like play a little tune and I don't know what, get some bread or something, some free drinks. Let's go to the end. I, I keep forgetting. I have bardsmanship. Of course, I go to the inn. You leave the ship and walk across the quayside to the Good Cheer Inn. It is an old timber-framed tavern which looks deserted at this early hour. A bell tinkles as you push open its heavy door, attracting the attention of a doe-eyed innkeeper who is mopping last night's spilt ale from the floor. You ask if he has seen Captain Raker. 
You must be the journeyman who's sailing south. The answer comes from the top of a staircase. Moments later, a broad-shouldered man with a golden beard and sharp blue eyes comes striding down the stairs. I'm Riker, he says as he struggles to pull on his leather jerkin and fix the belt of his heavy-bladed cutlass. Hey, Squid, go rustle me up some grub. I'm so hungry my stomach thinks my throat's being cut. As the innkeeper goes away to fetch breakfast for the captain, he asks if you want some food as well. After having ridden all night without once stopping, you answer... I gotta think about what kind of voice I want to use for, for Fire Snake now. He's gotta have a voice. I don't want to do anything too growly, because he's got bardsmanship. I don't know, he's not going to really have a special voice, I don't think. I'll have whatever the captain's having. Good man, booms Raker. I ain't fond of eating alone. Here, let's sit ourselves down and fill our barrels before we set sail. Our what? Fill our what? You have to sing all his lines? <laughs> Fry guy. I'll have whatever the captain's having. <laughs> <laughs> Sing all his lines. That would be hilarious. I'll have whatever the captain's having. <laughs> Fucking bardsmanship. Captain Raker eagerly devours a hearty breakfast which consists of black bread, cold chicken, and spiced mead. Between mouthfuls, he tells you that his orders are to take you to Bissetan after docking at Barrakeesh to pick up Lord Lieutenant Fernand. He believes that you are carrying state documents for Fernand's eyes only. He has transported Kai journeymen and messengers before, and you are satisfied that he does not suspect the true purpose of your journey. Don't worry. Hey, Captain Raker, I am definitely not carrying the Moonstone, just so you know. No Moonstone here. Raker is looking forward to completing the voyage. In addition to the fee he has pocketed for your passage, he is also carrying a cargo of wheat and timber destined for delivery to a rich Fasagonian merchant in Bisutan. For him, this voyage promises to be very profitable indeed. Unfortunately, the captain is notoriously tight-fisted when it comes to spending his money. He even expects you to pay for the meal. Before you leave the tavern and return for the, with him to the ship, you must pay the innkeeper for both breakfast. What? Can I do some bard shit? So not only did I not get to make money at the tavern, I lost money. Fucking Captain Raker is not on my good side so far. Fine. 21 crowns. This is fucking bullshit! Fucking... <laughs> that's Fire Snake singing about being sad. Alright. You accompany the captain back to the Pride of Summerland, where you are welcomed aboard by two men, First Mate Pale, and a fair-haired young man whose blue surcoat is emblazoned with the scarlet anchor of the Kirlundan Isles. My name's Dryan, Sergeant Dryan of the First Kirlundan Marines, says the proud young man. I have a dozen Marines in my charge, and we've been assigned a tour of duty aboard this ship for the duration of its voyage south. You're probably all gonna die. Payal is eager to show you to your cabin, which is situated at the stern, next to the captain's quarters, but you decline his offer. Instead, you speak further with Sergeant Dryan, and learn that he and his marines have been ordered aboard the ship by King Olnar. Dryan's instructions are to protect the ship's cargo from the threat of pirate attack. At first, you are suspicious. In his briefing, Lone Wolf said nothing about an escort of marines. To determine whether Dryan is telling the truth, you probe the sergeant's mind using your psychic Kai skills and discover at once that he is genuine. He does not know or suspect the true purpose of your journey. Well, I'm glad to be sharing this voyage with you and your men, you say. It makes me feel much safer knowing we have marines on board <laughs> i'm not a good singer so i'm as bad a singer as i am a voice actor so it's not really going to be any like more embarrassing or lame than it usually is i don't know if i'll really keep singing his lines forever but right now at the moment it's amusing 
You salute the sergeant and he goes off to attend to his men. Then Captain Raker turns to his first mate and bellows, All right, Pale, set the crew to work. I want us to catch the ebb tide within the hour. Whatever the fuck the ebb tide is. Fucking sailing shit. The deck of the Pride of Sourland becomes a hive of activity as the crew sets about getting the ship ready to sail. When the last spread of canvas has been unfurled and the cables are cast off from the quayside, you feel the deck rock gently as Pale steers the cargo-heavy vessel towards the entrance to Home Guard Harbor. At first, she responds sluggishly, and the first mate curses her as he struggles with the ship's wheel. Yet, once you pass beyond the harbor's protective walls, a sea wind fills the sails and the ship is swiftly transformed. Now it's a pony. Within minutes of leaving harbor, the pride of Summerland is speeding swiftly eastwards through the foam-flecked waters of the Holm Gulf. For six uneventful days you sail across the Gulf of Durinor, the passage made easy by fair weather and a strong following wind. Hey, I have elementalism. I could, like, bust the wind up to, like, a better version of the wind. I could, like, promote the wind to, like, awesome wind. And we could go a little bit faster. I'm just saying. I have element, And I could sing songs. I could sing a wind song that would, you know, raise everyone's spirits. And so we'd do even better. And I could pass out some fucking herb that would chill the fucking... <laughs> Things I could do with my Kai abilities. And then whatever the fuck you can do with Magi magic. Just broke out into a chorus of YMCA on the deck. Alright. A strong following win. After a night's anchorage at Port Bax... The voyage continues along the Rhyme Rift and into the warm, turquoise waters of the Curry Sea. Shortly after dawn of the 13th day, an island looms into view on the horizon. Its white sandy beaches and rich vegetation appear innocuous, but Captain Raker informs you that it is one of the notorious Lacuri Isles. For centuries, the bays and hidden coves of the Lacuris have provided a safe haven for pirates, the most infamous of whom was Captain Cadro. Six years ago, this murderous buccaneer was slain by your master, Lone Wolf. I don't remember that. What the fuck book was that? I vaguely remember fighting some pirates, maybe. Yet, despite his demise, the Lacuri Islands still harbor renegades and pirates who have set up camp here during the past hour. Yeah, but are they renegades of funk? That's the question. We're the renegades of funk. Captain Raker scours the horizon with his telescope, seeking a telltale glimpse of sail among the inlets and coves which pepper the shoreline. During his last voyage, he came close to losing his ship in these waters, and he is understandably wary. Please do not lose your ship. Or your shit. Of course I don't have Grand Hunt Mastery. This is the first time in 20 fucking books that I don't have hunting. Or the equivalent thereof. The hunt, or whichever the upgraded version. I don't have Grand Hunt Mastery. I've always had Grand Hunt Mastery. Always. Nox, if you have normal Kai skills, turn to page 42. If you're some weird multi-classing hybrid, turn to page 306. I know, right? That's pretty much where we're at right now. Alright, I'm already about to start starving, aren't I? Surely they have food on the fucking ship. What kind of a ship- Oh, we forgot to bring food with us. Can you hunt some shit up for us? Using your innate Magnakai skills, you Magnakai- You Magnakai- You magnify your vision and scan the island. The shoreline appears deserted, but when you cast your eyes towards the east, you notice two tiny specks on the horizon. You alert Captain Raker to the threat, but he dismisses your warning, saying it is merely heat haze. Several minutes later, the ship's lookout confirms that there are two ships on the eastern horizon. Raker brings his telescope to bear, and after a few moments' observation, he says, You were right, my lord. I should have known better than to doubt the eyes of a Kai. Lowering his telescope, he turns and shouts an order to Pale. Sup by what southwest, if you please, first mate. Looks like we've got company. 
The Tivers... Wow, I'm having a really hard time reading today. I'm really not doing well. Kind of out of it. The timbers creak as the ship turns about and forges a new passage through deep water. Following the change of bearing, the wind is now no longer in your favor, and Paol is forced to tack against it to make headway. The lighter ships have the advantage, and they quickly draw closer. Soon you can see that they are Vasagonian men o' war, although they fly no flags of allegiance or origin. Judging by their poor general condition, it is clear that they are pirate raiders. Raker orders his men to their battle positions, and Sergeant Dryan issues an order to his marines to stand ready at the cannons as the pirate raiders bear down upon the port bow. Alright, so here we go. We're about to get attacked by pirates. And I have shitty combat skill. And I can't hardly heal myself. That's that's what's going to happen in this book. I need to... We need to go back to how it was in the very first couple of Nolan Wolf books. I have to avoid combat as much as possible. Because A, I'm bad at it. And B, I can't heal myself as much as I want like I could before. So I have to like try to always avoid combat now. If I can. Because otherwise I'm going to get my ass kicked and I'm going to die. Do I want to stay with Captain Raker on the rear deck or choose with Sar choose to stand with Sergeant Dryan at the port bow? Uh, I don't know. I guess I'll stay with Captain Raker on the rear deck. You watch as Captain Raker takes over the helm from his first mate and attempts to maneuver the ship out of the path of the oncoming vessels. The leading pirate ship is now closed to within 50 yards and its murderous crew are crowded shoulder to shoulder upon its forward deck. Clearly they intend to leap aboard as soon as their ship draws alongside. From your position beside the deck rail you can see Sergeant Dryan directing his men at the bow. Dryan's marines are busily loading the three swivel cannon, which are fixed to the port gunnel. Once loaded, each marine gunner raises his hand to signal that his piece is primed to fire. Dryan is waiting for the third gunner to signal. He is ready to give the order to fire when suddenly there is a thunderous roar and a puff of gray smoke erupts unexpectedly from the prow of the attacking ship. Oh, so they're shooting at us. Random number. Here we go. Here we go. First random number. A two. Maybe I've already maybe I've already died. I might I might have already gotten one shotted. That would be awesome. I guess not. To your surprise, you see that the attacking ship is armed with a large cannon, mounted on the prow. Moments after the pirates fire their gun, you hear the whistle of a heavy cannonball as it hurtles across the deck of the Pride of Summerland. Fortunately, the pirates are poor gunners and it passes within inches of the mainmast before splashing harmlessly into the ocean. Sergeant Dryan commands his men to return fire, and a volley of shots from the three swivel guns slams into the bow of the pirate ship with devastating effect. Two shots penetrate below the waterline, and the third severs the bowsprit. As it falls into the ocean, it rips away sail and rigging, which drag more than a dozen pirates overboard. In disarray, the enemy vessel veers from its collision course and founders in the wake of the Pride of Summerland as it enters the Bukimi Channel. I like the Bukimi Channel. It's a good one. It's not as good as the Discovery Channel, but, uh, you know, sometimes they have some good shows on the Bukimi Channel. Everything's always about Bukimi, unfortunately. I mean, which kind of gets old, but especially since I don't know what that is. This joke has also gotten old. Here, your ship picks up a prevailing wind, which propels it away from the second pirate raider. Soon, both ships have disappeared, and when Raker is sure that the danger has passed, he warmly praises both the marines and his crew for the skill and courage they have displayed. Good job, guys. You've prevented me from having to get in combat and getting my ass kicked. Thanks. Good job. Later, as the ship navigates the narrow strait dividing the two Lacuri Islands, you pass within a few hundred yards of the fire-blackened ruins of a beach settlement, which nestles in a bay, overshadowed on three sides by cliffs. This is Kida Cove, formerly a secret base from where Captain Cadro launched his pirate fleet. As you stare at the charred remnants of the pirate settlement, you try to imagine what it must have looked like before the encamp 
encampment was consumed by a tremendous fireball that sealed its doom. They keep having specials on that channel to raise leukemia awareness. <laughs> what the fuck? Telethons and shit. Awareness. <laughs> Everything's awareness in the fucking America. I have a friend from Eastern Europe who uh, makes fun of that shit. Blah 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 awareness. <laughs> We're having awareness awareness week. Try to imagine what it must have looked like. Yeah, suddenly your daydreaming is interrupted. When? To your shock surprise, you see something moving among the ruins. Kai Alchemy. Damn it! I had just taken Kai Alchemy as Lone Wolf. He had just had it. And now, immediately, they start hitting me up with this Kai Alchemy bullshit. No, I don't have it. I have Magi Magic. But I don't have Kai Alchemy. Fucking fuck. Yeah, Bardsmanship ain't gonna help me here. At work, you recently set up a customer that I have no idea what they do there. The Center for Cause Awareness. Wow. You observe a number of shadowy creatures lurking among the ruins of Kita Cove, near to the charred wreckage of a wooden jetty. And once, you inform Captain Raker, and your discovery excites his curiosity. After observing the ruins for himself using his telescope, he toys with the idea of sending ashore a landing party to investigate these creatures. Uh... Oh boy, here we go. I think... I think Fire Snake is going to have a different uh, personality from per Lone Wolf. Maybe he won't ever investigate anything. Like, instead of investigate, which Lone Wolf always investigated everything, maybe he's just going to be like, no, I refuse to investigate anything. I don't know, that's lame, though. If you wish to persuade the captain, yeah, I do. I think I do. I think I'll go. I need to go investigate this shit, even though I'm probably going to get my ass kicked. Together with Payall and a party of five armed marines, you row ashore in the ship's longboat. With weapons drawn, you and your search party sift through the ruins of Kadro's encampment, but find few items of any practical value. There are several tracks which have been made by the creatures you glimpsed earlier, but they all lead away into the surrounding jungle, and you can no longer detect their presence. Mindful of the risk you are taking simply by being here on the island, away from the ship, you signal to the men to return to the longboat. As you are descending the beach, you trip accidentally upon something half buried in the black sand. Closer inspection reveals it to be a fist-sized ball of iron that has been crafted into the shape of a human skull. Wow, that's cool. Do I want to keep this iron skull? Well, yeah. Obviously. Alright, let's continue. On returning to the ship, you and your party clamber aboard, and the longboat is quickly hoisted back onto the main deck. Captain Raker is keen to get the ship underway, and he commands his crew to unfurl every square inch of canvas to catch the prevailing winds. Within minutes of your return, the Pride of Summerland is once again back on course, forging a swift passage south through the Bukimi Channel. Could be used as a drum? Well, it, yeah, I guess. I don't think a solid iron ball would make a very good drum. Maybe it's not solid though, it's probably hollow. Even so, iron, not the best uh, not the best drum material. You could just you could, it would you kind of have to just tap on the outside of it. It 
Such irony. Oh, good one, Nox. Good one, Nox Moo. Irony, I see what you did there. You really proved your comedic metal there. Steal yourself. More puns are coming. Could do a Hamlet reenactment at the end. That would be cool. Iron Hamlet. Like Shakespeare, but like made all metal and shit. Hamlet walks around with a fucking electric guitar throughout the entire play, and like, he punctuates like every line after he says every line, he like, plays a fucking riff or something. <laughs> that actually sounds kind of rad. I would go to see that play. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer. The slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. Or to take arms against the sea of troubles. And by opposing end them. That'd be pretty that'd be pretty cool. I'm just saying. Upon emerging from the Bukimi Channel, the pride of Summerland is caught by a strong northeasterly wind which propels her swiftly toward the Vasagonian coast. For two days and nights, she rides the scudding waves, her speedy passage more than making up for any time lost in the Lacuria Isles. Then, late on the third day, the lookout catches his first glimpse of Barrakish. Excitedly, the crew gather on deck to stare at the golden domes and towers of the city. I don't like Barrakish. I had bad experiences here as well. Everybody tried to kill me the last time I was in Barrakish. Of course, that was Lone Wolf that was in Barrakeesh. I guess Fire Snake doesn't have any memories of Barrakeesh. He's like, ooh, Barrakeesh, this place seems cool. Because he doesn't know. He doesn't know the treachery that lies just underneath its shining surface. Excitedly, the crew gather on deck to stare at the golden domes and towers of the city, which glimmer like orbs of burnished gold in the glow of the setting sun. In fading light, Peol brings the ship silently into the great curve of Barrakeesh Harbor and moors her at the end of a vacant quay. Few eyes notice another trade ship, but one pair takes a special interest. They belong to Lord Lieutenant Fernant, the Somlending envoy to this rich desert realm. When finally the ship is docked and the gangplank is lowered to the quayside, he is waiting there to greet your arrival. Fernand is a tall man in his mid-forties, clean-shaven and of slim and athletic build. His face has characteristics which are unmistakably somlending, yet his skin is richly tanned from the many years he has spent in this sun-drenched land. After a brief talk with Captain Raker to confirm that the ship will be ready to sail tomorrow at noon, he offers you the hospitality of his house in the city. After nearly a month at sea, you gladly welcome the chance to bathe in a proper bath and sleep in a proper bed. Ooh! Last time I was in this city, when I was here as Lone Wolf, I, ba I bathed also in a bathhouse, and that's where I got the towel. Barrakeesh is where I got the towel. Now I'm bathing. Maybe I could get another towel. Because it doesn't say anything about letting me take a towel. But I mean, seriously, could I just st steal a towel from fucking Fernand's house? Because if I just had a towel again, everything would be okay. Fernand's house is only a short distance from the harbor. It is a large two-story dwelling with a flat roof and a walled garden that smells sweetly of picanda and larnuma fruit. After a luxurious bath with a towel and a feast fit for a king, Fernand tells you something about the changes which have occurred in Vasagonia since the demise of its hated ruler, Sakan Kima. I killed him. Well, as Lone Wolf I did, I threw the dagger of Vasa at him and killed him with it. Who, during the Dark Lands War, allied himself and his reluctant nation to the Dark Lords of Helgadad. Shuwali is the new Zakan now, says Fernant as he peels the skin from a ripe Laruna, Larnuma, and slices it neatly in two with a pearl-handled dagger. 
He is an honorable and intelligent man. He has brought peace back to this land through trade. Its enemies, who once swore to destroy Vasagonia, now come and barter their wares in the rich markets of Barrakish and Bisutan. Later, during the evening, talk turns to the details of your mission. Fernand is unaware of its true purpose. All he knows is that he is to offer you every assistance to ensure your swift and safe passage to Elzion. When you tell him that you are not at liberty to discuss your mission fully, he nods sympathetically and vows he will refrain from ever mentioning the subject again. Shortly before midnight, there is a knock at the front door of Fernand's house. He signals to one of his servants to go and answer it, and you comment that it is an uncommonly late hour for someone to be paying him a visit. Quite so, he says, but this is a visitor I've been expecting. It's someone I'd especially like you to meet. Alright. Hopefully it's not like a fucking Dark Lord or something. Fernand's servant returns to the room with a beautiful young woman by his side. If Lone Wolf was here, he'd be getting awkward as shit right now. She is dressed in the simple brown robes of a peasant girl, yet her long black tresses and smooth olive complexion indicate that she is of high-born ancestry. For a moment, she holds you with her deep brown eyes, and you sense at once that she is as intelligent as she is beautiful. Apparently, what among my abilities is sense intelligence. I know it. No, I know what he's talking about, but still, it sounds funny. This is Oriah, says Fernand, rising from his seat. Welcome, my dear. You're among friends here. The young woman offers him her elegant hand, and he kisses it lightly before turning to face you. I have promised your safe passage to Bisutan aboard the Pride of Summerland. I trust you do not object, he says. At first, wait, here we have the illustration. This is, uh, what's her name? Oriah. What's going on here? Oh, he's kissing her hand, okay. She looks bored as fuck by this. She is not enchanté right now. He kisses her hand and she is just like, Fuck my life. Why do I have to put up with this shit? I mean, she looks like... Like, just... Shell-shocked and like weary. She looks like a refugee or something. Who's just fucking showed up at your refugee camp after like... Walking 300 miles to escape the terrors of her war-torn country. At first, you were wary of permitting a stranger to join the ship. She is a very attractive young woman, and her company would certainly be appreciated during the long voyage south. Can I use some bardsmanship here to, like, woo her with bardsmanship? That's what bards do. They woo people. The agents of Nar have been known to adopt many guises to further their evil aims. Oh, yeah. She's a Hellgast. Totes a Hellgast. Fernand, sensing your reticence, attempts to persuade you by explaining the predicament in which Oriah has been placed through no fault of her own. You learn that Oriah is the daughter of Kazulo, the Funtal of Fiofadali. The, the, the what? They just made that up. That's not a real title. The Funtal of Fio Fidali? That's awesome. A rich, powerful, and very ruthless man. He has pledged his daughter's hand in marriage to Sescaterra, the ruler of the city-state of Goltabras in northern Shadaki. Sescaterra is a brutal, a brutal and cruel, a cruel and brutal suitor. And Oriah will be sure to spend the rest of her life as little more than his slave if the marriage takes place as her father has planned. Alright, well, I'm not down with that. We can't have that. Her father is deaf to her wishes. His only concern is for the political union of the two cities. His daughter's happiness means nothing to him when compared to the riches and power he will gain from a marriage to the house of Sescaterra. Fire Snake does not, uh, does not countenance women being used as chattel. Oriah has run away from her father's palace in Fiofidali, although Fiofidali sounds like a cool place. 
and she has sought refuge in Barrakish. But agents in the employ of her father and Sesquiterra have traced her to the capital, and now she must flee once more. Fernand, moved by the plight of this brave young woman, has pledged to help her reach Bisutan, where trusted friends will smuggle her to safety in neighboring Kakush. Having heard her story and satisfied yourself that she poses no threat to your mission, you agree to allow her to travel with you to Bisutan aboard the Pride of Summerland. Great. Here, welcome the Hellgast on board, folks. Araya and Fernand thank you for your compassion, and the Lord Lieutenant suggests that perhaps it is time to retire for the night. He has his servant take Oriah to an adjoining chamber, and he offers you the use of a room upstairs. It is a very warm and humid night, and you decide that perhaps it would be more comfortable if you were to sleep outside on the roof. For not has his servant bring you a mattress upon which you settle down to sleep under the desert stars. Yes! Astrology! Let's do this! Yes, I got astrology. Yes. If you if you picked a ridiculous and impractical uh, ability just to be just to be saucy, turn to 133. If you chose wise wise disciplines like a smart person, that it will actually help you and not get you killed, turn to 327. One thirty-three. It is. I'm about to predict the future, yo. I'm writing. I'm writing Oriah's horoscope on the roof. As you lie on the mattress and stare at the night sky, you call upon your knowledge of astrology to search for portents among the configuration of stars. You determine the outlines of a serpent and a wide-bladed sword. Hey, a serpent. That's auspicious. That's good for us. We have snake in our name. A serpent is good, right? And a wide-bladed sword. And you take these images to be a warning of possible treachery and conflict ahead. Why, why, why they always gotta make it so where things relating to snakes always have to do with treachery and shit? Snakes aren't treacherous. There's nothing inherently treacherous about a snake. The images stay in your mind's eye until gradually you drift into a fitful sleep. Stop the snake hate. You are awoken shortly after dawn by the sound of a plaintive voice echoing across the rooftops of the city. It is the cry of a Vasa elder, and he is calling the faithful of Barrakish to early morning prayer. You gather together your equipment, and Fernat's servant brings you a bowl and a pitcher of water so that you may refresh yourself by before sharing breakfast with Oriah and the Lord Lieutenant. After breakfast, Fernat oversees the loading of bags and other personal items aboard his mule-drawn carriage. Then, an hour before noon, the three of you leave for the quay and go aboard the Pride of Somerland. At first, Captain Raker is unhappy about transporting Oriah, arguing that the presence of a beautiful young woman aboard his ship will distract his crew from their duties. Don't worry, don't worry, I'll do some bardsmanship. Get to work! Get back to fucking work! Everybody get the fuck back to work! Stop staring at that woman and do your fucking job! That was my terrible bardsmanship song right there. However, his objections quickly evaporate when Fernand offers to pay him 20 gold crowns for her passage to Bisutan. The ship leaves Barrakish on the noontide and makes swift progress ahead of a favorable southerly wind. But by dusk, the wind has dropped, and Raker decides to spend the first night at anchor, in a protected cove a few miles to the east of Chula. The night passes peacefully, and you wake at dawn to a spectacular sight. Spectacular sight, huh? I better see an illustration. That's not spectacular! They didn't even illustrate it. You are aware that something unusual is happening the moment you open your eyes, for you can hear the excited chattering of crewmen and marines who are pacing about the deck directly above your cabin. Quickly, you rise from your bunk and go aloft to investigate the commotion. And, to your surprise, you discover that the waters around the ship are stained blood red. 
The transformation has been caused by millions of tiny fish. A vast shoal of scarlet trarta, who, like the pride of Summerland, have shot, sought shelter here overnight in this secluded cove. Alright, so we're surrounded by bloodfish. That's cool. And then they all start chewing through the hall and they, they like, eat us. Captain Raker permits his men to spend an hour or two fishing for Trarta. They are a delicacy, and they will serve to supplement the crew's basic provisions of salted meat and biscuits. By noon, the Trarta Shoal have left. In search of deeper reaches and clarity returns to the turquoise waters of the cove, revealing a new and interesting discovery. Resting on the sandy floor of the cove, 20 feet below the ship's keel, lie the remains of a Batarian galleon. Oriya is fascinated by the wreck, and she asks Captain Raker if she may be permitted to dive down and search its shattered hold. Yeah, nothing could go wrong here. The captain has no objections, as long as she is back on board within the hour. I didn't even know the Hellgasts could swim. Oriya is clearly excited by the prospect of what she may discover aboard the wreck, and as she gets ready for her dive, she asks if you would like to accompany her. Oh, here we go. It's a date. Diving down to a wrecked ship. Nothing doesn't get more romantic than that. Only thing I don't like about being underwater is I can't sing while I'm down there. I can't play my flute. I can't believe I fucking have a flute. <laughs> what the fuck kind of lone wolf book is this? I think it's balanced out by the fact that I also have an iron skull! So, you know, it's fine. Uh, obviously I'm gonna accept her invitation, cut the games. After having stripped to your undergarments and locked your tunic and equipment safely away in your cabin, you join Oriya at the bow of the ship, where you prepare to enter the sea together. Fernand and Raker watch from the forward deck as the two of you leap into the warm waters of the cove and make your first dive upon the wreck. Araya is a strong swimmer, and you can tell by the effortless way she descends through the water that she is a skilled diver. Oh yeah? Well, I'm an herb master, so if there's some seaweed and shit down here, I can identify the fuck out of it. Also, elementalism. I can... I should be able to use elementalism to just breathe underwater. To, like, make a bubble of air around my head that holds the air and I can just breathe it. Like, I mean, elementalism, yo. The galleon is broken at its center and lies with its fore and aft sections separated by an expanse of debris-strewn sand. As you view the halves of the wreck, two areas of particular interest catch your eye. A gaping hole in the hull of the forward section, and a cabin located on the rear poop deck. Wow. Uh... Resisting the urge to make any sort of connotate, any sort of, uh... Innuendos or anything right now with gaping hole and poop deck. Just leaving that shit alone. Alright, so... Investigate the hole in the hull or the cabin on the rear deck. I think the cabin on the rear deck sounds like the, the way forward. Sounds legit. Let's do this. There is no door to the cabin, and you are able to swim through the opening with ease. Inside, you discover very little that has survived since this galleon fell prey to a violent storm a year ago. With the tip of your weapon, you sift through the mire of decomposing wood, rust, and rotten fabric that lies like a thick, muddy blanket on the floor of this cabin. It is a laborious process, and in return for your efforts, you discover nine gold crowns and a dagger. Taking them. Taking them. I have an extra free weapon slot. I'll take a dagger. Nine crowns. Taking it. Loving it. Oh yeah. My fucking wealth increases. Soon I will be a powerful magnate of some kind. Through the hole in the roof of the cabin, you glimpse Oriya ascending to the surface for air. Noob. I'm just happily elementalisming it up in here. Elementalism, elementalisming it. What? And I don't even need to return for air. I mean, that's what's happening in my in my head canon. 
Satisfied that there is nothing else of value aboard this wreck, you leave the cabin and return to the Pride of Summerland. Once you are both aboard, Captain Raker gives the order to weigh anchor, and soon the Pride of Summerland is forging a course- Wait, what did she find? I want to know what she found in the ship. I found some bullshit, what did she find? See, it's not going to tell me. She found some awesome shit, I know she did, and she's hiding it from me. She's hiding it from all of us. And by she, I mean, you know, it, because obviously Hellgasts, I don't think they have a gender, really. Soon the Pride of Summerland is forging a course once more through open seas. Or are they open Zs? With all sails unfurled, the ship cuts a swift course through the foam-flecked ocean. During the afternoon, your southerly passage is joined by a school of dolphins who entertain you by leaping and plunging into the azure waves. And I entertain them by playing a nice dolphin song on my flute. That's the dolphin song right there. Just in case you wanted to know what that sounded like. The wind is strong and the voyage continues without incident until early the following morning the isles off Cape Kabar appear in a line upon the southern horizon. You meet with Fernand and Araya on the rear deck and share a breakfast of bread and grilled trarta. As you eat, you talk about yesterday's dive and the items that you found in the sunken wreck. I want to know what she found. You are enjoying the company of your traveling companions when suddenly the relaxed and easy mood is shattered by the lookout's frantic shout. Pirate Raider off the starboard bow! Whatever, shoot the fucking cannons at him again. Handle this. I'm fucking eating fish right now. From the cover of the distant isles, there emerges a fearsome warship. You magnify your vision and focus upon the oncoming vessel to see that it is rigged with a scarlet mainsail emblazoned with a strange design. A serpent entwined about the blade of a silver curved sword. Oh, I saw a vision of this because I am an astrologer. You relay these details to Fernand, and Araya gasps with fright. It's a symbol of Galtabras, Fernand says, the city-state ruled by Sescaterra. The merest mention of her evil suitor's name is enough to make Oriah faint with shock. You catch her as she falls, and then Fernand lifts her into his arms and carries her below to her cabin. Once they have left the deck, you turn your full attention to the oncoming vessel, for now it is clear by its course that it intends to ram the pl Pride of Somerland. Fry Guy says it's on the cover of the book. Is it? Oh, I see it. Yeah, there's the there's the like scimitar with the serpent around it. A very friendly looking serpent. No treachery there. What is the fuck is going on here though? Spoiler alert: There's going to be some kind of giant ass crab or spider creature, whatever the fuck it is. Spoiler alert: It's going to shoot lightning at us. Yeah, and now I know to be careful of the lightning shooting crab spider. I'll yeah, I'll sing it. Music soothes the savage beast. I'll just sing it a song, and it'll it'll be fine. Electra spider of doom, please don't make us go boom. I just wanna go to my room. I'll sweep you overboard with a broom because that's the only thing I could think of that rhymed with room and doom and broom. Or whatever. Could have used gloom. 
Captain Raker sounds the battle alarm, and his crew attempts desperately to bring the ship out of the enemy's path. This barbsmanship thing was a bad idea. I can already see. It's gonna lead to a ludicrous amount of really stupid jokes and really bad singing. I never should have taken barbsmanship. Captain Raker sounds the battle alarm. Still. And his crew attempts desperately to bring the ship out of the enemy's path. Sergeant Dryan's marines hastily load their cannons and get ready to fire upon his command. The enemy vessel alters course to maintain its attacking line and, as it closes to within 200 yards, you see that it is a formidable fighting craft with a fucking giant Electro Spider of Doom for some reason. Plates of iron protect its prow and lines of warriors clad in scarlet and silver armor man its decks and forecastle. Then, you notice a dark shape perched upon the ship's ram, which protrudes from below its bowsprit. You focus upon this strange shape, but before you can determine its nature, your senses are assailed by a wave of powerful psychic energy. Of course I don't have Kai screen. I don't have Kai screen, I have bullshit like bardsmanship and herb mastery and crap. I have the most impractical abilities there are. Of course I don't have Kai screen. If I had been not a dumbass, the five I would have taken would have been Hunt Mastery, Deliverance, Weapon Mastery, Kai Screen, and Kai Surge. Then I would have been a badass, ready to handle anything. However, I don't have any of those. <laughs> I have silly stuff. I pull out my flute. If you possess Kai Screen Turn 02, if you have a flute, turn to 319. Okay, good. I can use my flute here. You are knocked backward by the searing pain of this unexpected psychic attack. Your innate mental defenses knit together to protect the fabric of your mind, but before this protective shell is fully erected, it's not fully erect yet, you experience the chilling effects of psychic shock, lose four endurance points, and I can't heal this with my curing thing, so I just have to take that four to the face. As the pain in your head recedes, you open your eyes and see a sinister new threat loom into view. Great. Here we go. There it is. There it is. The enemy ship is less than a hundred yards off the port beam when you see the dark shape at its prow begin to twitch and shudder. At first, it resembles the body of some grotesque gigantic tick. Then, eight rubbery legs spring from its black underbelly, and suddenly the shape takes on a far more sinister aspect. A gasp of terror arises from the crew when this spider-like monstrosity opens its scarlet maw and emits a high-pitched, chittering shriek. As the enemy vessel speeds, speeds nearer, you watch with mounting dread as this hideous spider creature raises its forelegs, as if in readiness to pounce. Furiously, it rubs its forelimbs together and a mass of blue-white sparks appear at their tips. Then suddenly, there is a deafening crackle of electrical power. A bolt of blazing energy shoots from the creature's maw and snakes across the water towards the crew and marines aboard your ship. The creature's attack hits its mark and the effect is swift and devastating. The crackling bolt ignites timber and sail and leaves a dozen men sprawled dead or unconscious across the decks. Through the smoke of the burning sailcloth you see the enemy vessel bearing down to ram the pride of Summerland. Impact is but seconds away. What the fuck is this thing? What the fuck is up with Electro Spider of Doom? Why is a ship carrying a giant lightning shooting spider what is going on right now and how am i going to use herb lore and fucking bardsmanship to deal with this problem yeah i do possess a bow though maybe i can one shot this thing with a bow like a champ Enemy Magician must have Animal Mastery? Yeah, I guess so. Enemy, enemy Magician probably has all kinds of useful things that I don't have. It just sits in the mess hall waiting to jump on enemy ships. <laughs> Alright, let's use the bow. 
Quickly, you unshoulder your bow and snatch an arrow from your quiver. Bracing yourself against the ship's rail, you draw back your bowstring and scan the decks of the attacking ship for a suitable target. Uh, how about the fucking lightning shooting spider? That's a suitable fucking target. How about we shoot that thing right in its fucking gob? Two immediately loom into view. The first is the ghastly maw of the giant spider, yeah. The second is the head of a warrior who is standing inside the forecastle. From the way he is shouting at those around him, you suspect that he must be the commander of the enemy vessel. No, fuck the commander. We're shooting at the spider creature. You take aim at the creature's ghastly mouth and release your bowstring, sending your arrow arcing across the water towards its target. But before your missile finds its mark, the creature springs into the air and launches itself into the rigging of your ship. That seems fair. Alright. Random number. I don't get to add anything now because I no longer have all my cool old abilities of lone wolfness. If you would like to shoot at the cabin boy wandering around the enemy ship's deck, turn to page 71. Come on, high roll, high roll, no whammies. Bam, 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 bam. Gonna roll an 8 or a 9. Watch this shit. Watch this really high roll. Here it goes. Now, that's a 4. That's not... That's not what I wanted. That's not good. I mean, at least I didn't get the 3 or lower, which is like the you shoot yourself in the dick fucking section that you turn to. At least, you know, I'm in the middle, middle of the road here. It's only a minor failure. Your arrow misses its intended mark. The steel tip grazes the creature's belly as it leaps into the air, yet the wound is superficial and it does not stop the beast from hurling itself successfully towards your ship. You are about to reload your bow and fire again when suddenly there is a tremendous crash. The pride of Summerlin lurches violently and you are thrown backwards across the deck. If Saito was here, he'd be making some fucking comments about the silver bow of Do It On right now. But he wouldn't have that either right now because only Lone Wolf could have that bow. So even if you had it as Lone Wolf, you wouldn't get to keep it as your new character, so... Uh. You scramble to your feet and pause to unsheathe a hand weapon before you struggle across the heaving deck and regain your position at the ship's rail. The enemy vessel has rammed the Pride of Summerland, and now a host of screaming warriors is swarming aboard your stricken ship. A shadow passes overhead, and when you look up, you see the giant spider scurrying toward the crow's nest. The Somlindi outlook shrieks hysterically, and in blind panic, throws himself into the sea to avoid being consumed by this hideous monster. Yeah, that's what I would do. As soon as I saw that thing in the rigging, I'd be like, nope, 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 jumping in the ocean. If there was fucking sharks right there, I would still jump in the ocean. At least sharks aren't going to shoot lightning at you. Noxmoo, if you would like to use the Moonstone to send an angry mental voicemail to Lone Wolf about not being given the Samus Word or the Silver Bow of it on turn page 11. Alright, so this, the lookout throws himself in the sea. Through the smoke which shrouds the deck below, you can see Sergeant Dryan and his men fighting bravely to repel the raiders. Those of Raker's crew who have survived the collision hurriedly arm themselves and rush to support the outnumbered marines, but they are not trained fighters and they are clearly no match for this ruthless enemy. Do I want to fight alongside Sergeant Dryan's marines on the deck below? Or climb the rigging and attack the giant spider that's now perched upon the crow's nest. That sounds like a horrible idea. I was thinking that too, Nox, in the very beginning. I thought, you know, I've got this ultra, like, the most powerful artifact in the entire world. So powerful that time is named after it. The, the year, MS, whatever, that MS stands for Moonstone. It's so powerful and, and I can't use it for anything. 
How about option three? If you wish to pull out the moonstone and blast the fuck out of that spider with moonstone power. Of course, I can't really reveal that I have it or whatever. Dude, this sounds like the worst idea ever. Not only fighting that thing's a bad idea, but fighting it up in the rigging where it's got all the advantage. It's a spider, it's up in there, it can maneuver around and keep its footing and everything. And you can't because you're not a fucking spider. No. But again, if I don't attack that thing, who is going to? Something, somebody's got to take it out, and I'm the only one here that has fucking herb mastery, so I guess it falls to me. I'm about to fucking throw some herbs all up on that motherfucker. Alright, I climb the rigging with my, with my flute <laughs> grasped in my teeth. As I, you know, because it's like, it's like normally if you're on a ship thing and it's like swashbuckling action, the guy's climbing the rigging and he's got a fucking dagger in his teeth. But this is like that, except I've got, I've just got a flute. I've got a flute held between my teeth as I'm fucking heroically climbing up the rigging. All right. This is a bad, bad, bad idea, but I'm going to do it anyway. Put the iron skull on the end of the flute so it can be like a lightning rod. Here we go. Skillfully, you ascend the rigging and approach the giant spider from behind and below. It is busily tearing at the mast and topsail with its fanged maw, and at first it fails to notice you. When you pause for a few moments to unsheathe your weapon, by weapon it means flute, suddenly the creature swivels its head and fixes you with a pair of ghastly green eyes. Chittering excitedly, it rubs its forelegs together and sparks appear, warning you that it is preparing to launch a bolt of energy. Quickly, you cut free a trailing rope and swing away from the rigging just in time to avoid being burnt to a cinder when it launches its burst of crackling blue fire. Your swift reflexes save you, but as the momentum of your swing carries you back towards the rigging, you can see that the creature is preparing a new form of attack. It waits until you come to rest upon the crisscross of ropes, and then it ejects a stream of sickly gray fluid from a sack located below its gaping maw. Ew, it just squirted sliggins at me. This fluid hardens as it passes through the air and is transformed into several long and sticky strands which threaten to engulf you. I do have elementalism! Let's elementalism this shit. I also have Magi Magic, actually. Alright, I'm in elementalism, because I've never used it before. Come on. Let's do something really cool. Fire snake while swinging away. Yo-ho-ho. -ho. I fucking... What I do... Alright, this is my... This is, this is what I would do if I had elementalism and I was there. I fucking... Ignite the... The... The sticky strand, you know? Like... By, by super agitating the molecules in the air around it and causing it to burst into flame and send the flame roaring up the, f the, the, the flammable thing right up into its fucking sack that it came out of, causing it to explode. That's what I would do. Let's see what, let's see what is actually going to happen. Fuck my life. Drawing upon your mastery of the elements, you summon a gust of wind to deflect the gout of sticky fluid. That's way less cool than what I had in mind. Your swift and timely action saves you from becoming entangled in the gluey strands of this creature's web, and you are able to climb the remaining few feet towards the creature's perch. Frantically, it lashes out at you with its rubbery legs as you attempt to plunge your weapon into its vulnerable belly. Combat skill 40. Nice. So we got something that's already 7 points up on me. This is going to go well. I'm about to lose a lot of about to lose a lot of fucking health here. An Otoke. All right. Fuck. 40. Wait. I'm fighting in daylight. I am fighting in daylight right now. That means I get an extra plus one from my sword, which means I'll lower him down to a 39. Not that that's going to help me much, but still. Every little bit. Here we go, 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 here we go. Round one, 34, 40, go. 
Ooh, I lost four, he lost five. This is this is this is not great. Thirty and thirty-five, go. I lost none, and he lost nine. That's excellent. That's excellent. Thirty and twenty-six, round three, go. Ooh! I lost none. And he lost eight. Okay, this is working out for me. I'm loving it. Thirty and eighteen, go. I lost none and he lost Oh, I lost three and he lost six. Okay, okay. Twenty-seven and twelve. Round five, go. I lost five. He only lost three. It's not great. Twenty-two and nine. Here we go. Option to use bardsmanship. Could have jammed your flute up its nostril. Yeah. Man, bardsmanship. What the fuck? That's never going to come into play. He just put it in there just to fucking troll people. Twenty-two and nine. Here we go. 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 Ooh, good! I took him for eight, and I didn't lose any. All right, let's try not to lose any health on this last round as we kill him. Here we go. Oh, I lost three more. Man, I'm, on, I'm down to 19 endurance already, and I can't heal myself that much. All right, end and save. End and save. Turn to 315. I'm going to start healing myself. I have to keep track of how many of these I use, though. Because I only get 10 per adventure. So that's one. Whoa. No. You strike your killing blow, and the Otoke emits a loud and terrible shriek. Its great body convulses, and its hissing and hissing sparks cascade from its limbs and maw as slowly it relinquishes its grip upon the masthead. You watch with awe as the creature plummets through the rigging and crashes down upon the deck, the deck rail, with terrific force. Five enemy raiders are crushed to death, and several more are consigned to a watery grave when they become entangled in the creature's legs. They are dragged screaming to their doom as the Otoke rolls through the shattered ship's rail and disappears beneath the foaming waves. Yeah, I did it that way on purpose. Totally did that on purpose. The death of the Otoke sends a wave of panic coursing through the enemy's ranks, and soon they begin to falter and fall back to their own vessel. The enemy leader curses and screams as his men swarm aboard, and you hear him threaten personally to tear the throat from any warrior who, who refuses to fight on. This threat appears to work, for the raiders cease their retreat, and begin instead to regroup in preparation for another attack. You watch as the leader leaves the protection of his ship's forecastle, and takes his place at the head of his troops, ready to lead this second assault. Alright, let's see if we can ace this guy with the bow now. Let's see if we can ace this guy with the bow. Here we go. Up to 21. I'm used to... You draw an arrow to your bow, and take aim of the leader's chest as he leaps aboard the Pride of Summerland. The moment his feet touch the deck, you release your bowstring and send your arrow speeding towards his heart. Come on, let's get a high roll. I need that six or higher. I need that six or higher. I need that six or higher. I got a seven! Lucky number! dun da da dun da da, -da. Come on, let's one-shot this guy. Here we go. Your arrow punctures the leader's breastplate and brings him tumbling to his knees. Desperately, his fingers scrabble to wrench the shaft free, but it is penetrated too deeply, and he is soon overwhelmed by the pain of the mortal wound he has sustained. With one final gasp, he keels over and falls face down upon the deck. <laughs> Noxby says, Fire Snake, yeah, I took a week of archery for PE at the Kai Monastery. This is no problem. <laughs> it was an elective. Alright, so... I just took archery because there were a lot of girls in the class.
So he falls down. He's dead. I got him. Are we done here? Can you can you people kick rocks now? That'd be great. For a few moments, the raiders stand transfixed with shock, as if they are unable to comprehend that their leader is truly dead. Then the reality of their loss crashes in upon them, and they become overwhelmed by their worst fears. Without their leader, they panic and hurriedly cut the grappling lines which hold the two vessels together. When the last rope is severed, there is a great rending of iron and timber as the ram of the pirate ship wrenches itself free from the pride of the Somerland's port side. Then a cheer resounds from the mouths of those some lending who have survived the battle when they see the enemy ship turn about and flee for the safety of the isles off Cape Kabar. Yay, we win. 23. Use 4. Twenty-four. I think I'm gonna stop healing now. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna save my other five points. Cause I might get some free healing from something, and I don't want to waste. You know what I'm saying? I killed the spider and the pirate leader. Everyone owes you big time. Yeah, I know, right? I'm pretty much the MVP of this motherfucker. The Zaylers in the water are going, hey, what about us? You accompany Captain Raker as he conducts a hasty tour of his ravaged ship to assess the extent of the battle damage. And you are both shocked when you discover that half his complement of crew have been killed or badly wounded. That's not good. The few who can still stand count themselves lucky to have survived. Raker sets Payall and some of the survivors to work repairing the gaping hole in the ship's port beam that was made by the enemy's ram. While the remainder tend to their wounded companions and clear away the debris that lies smoldering in heaps upon the blood-stained deck. Among the enemy dead, you are saddened to discover the bodies of young Sergeant Dryan and nine of his men. Only three marines have survived the battle, and stoically they set about wrapping the bodies of their fallen comrades in canvas and consigning them to the waves. Having done what you can to help on deck, you decide to go below and make sure that Fernand and Oriah are safe. At the foot of the steps, you discover a dead raider lying sprawled across the body of another man. You turn the corpse over with the toe of your boot and gasp when you see that the man lying beneath is Lord Lieutenant Fernand. He's dead already? Man, that guy didn't last long. I do have a lone wolf-like effect on my fucking escorts, ships, and guides. <laughs> Good to see the tradition is passed. Is past, the torch has officially been passed. I will get you killed. The hilt of a Shatakin dagger protrudes from his chest, and a smear of blood stains his lips. He is dead. Fearing the worst, you rush along the narrow corridor and throw open the door to Oriah's cabin. You find her huddled below her bunk, sobbing quietly. You comfort her as best you can, but she is overcome with grief. Ferdant died whilst protecting her, and she blames herself for his death and for the calamity which has befallen the pride of Somerland. She tells you that the raiders came from Gold to Brass, the city ruled by her evil suitor. She is convinced that the reason they attacked the ship was to capture her. Well, that does make sense. At length, you persuade Oriya to accompany you onto the rear deck for some fresh air. Here, you are met by Captain Raker, who informs you that the ship is listing and taking in water. The voyage to Bisiton cannot proceed until proper repairs have been carried out. So he has set a course for the nearby port of Cape Kabar, where he knows a trustworthy shipwright who can fix the damaged hull. While you talk with the captain, Oriah watches the surviving crewmen disposing of the enemy dead. You hear her gasp. And when you hurry to her side, you see that she is pointing at the body of the warrior leader. Did you know this man? Have you seen him somewhere before? You ask. Yes, she replies tearfully. He's Darasun. He was the brother of Saskatera, the man my father wishes me to marry. 
I, I gotta stop with the singing. My fucking lines. It's terrible. It's so terrible. So the brother... Alright, so that's one down. How many more of this family do we gotta kill? Araya returns to her cabin to rest, whilst you stay on deck and help tend the wounded crewmen. Using your Kai curing skills, you do what you can to ease their pain and repair their battle wounds. To your great surprise, many of the injured men's wounds heal at a remarkable speed. In fact, some recover so quickly that you acquire something of a reputation among them as a miracle worker. Secretly, though, you suspect that it is the presence of the Moonstone that is the real reason for their miraculous return to good health. Whoa, where's my healing from the Moonstone? Yo, Moonstone, I could use some heals. I could use some heals, Moonstone. Moonstone's like, sorry, oom. That was a World of Warcraft joke right there. It is shortly before dusk when Captain Raker brings his damaged ship limping into the harbor of Cape Kabar and moors her alongside its redstone key. Leaving Pale in charge, he goes ashore to seek out his shipwright friend, Kimple, at the harbor shipyard. Soon, he returns with a wizened old man, and together they inspect the damaged hull. It's going to take a month to fix her right, says the captain on his return. Kimple says her, heels da her keel's damaged and she'll have to go into dry dock. This is going to be a long job. After talking with Raker and the others, you decide that you cannot stay here for a month while the ship is being repaired. Oriya too is anxious to leave for she fears that Cape Kabar is the first place Sescaterra will look for her when he hears of his brother's death. Oriya has friends in Bisutan, whom she trusts and she suggests that you travel there together. She is confident that her friends can help you reach Elzian quickly and safely. Alright, sounds legit. In addition to Oriya, you also agree to take with you the three surviving marines. Oh, those guys are so dead. Don't come with me unless you want to die. You've heard it said, come with me if you want to live. This is the opposite of that. Come with me if you don't want to live. Ernan, Sly, and Oswin. Ernan has visited Cape Kabar once before, and he knows the route south to Bisutan. He also knows of some stables on the far side of town where the five of you could acquire some horses. You agree that it would be worth a visit. Moonstone refuses to acknowledge me with my sing-song voice? Yeah, I guess so, Nox. Before you bid farewell to Raker and his crew, you share one last meal with them. I must now eat a meal or lose three endurance. Alright, I'm eating a meal. Boom. Meal eaten. Still got my flute, though. Still got my flute. It is dark when you finally bid farewell to Captain Raker and the crew of the Pride of Summerland. Ernan leads your party through the warm, lantern-lit streets of this fragrant coastal town, and soon you arrive at the Barjack Stables. This grand establishment comprises a large, single-story building with arched windows and a clay-tiled roof, surrounded by numerous orchards, paddocks, and porticos. The estate is shrouded in darkness and appears to be deserted, although your keen Kai senses detect that there are people asleep somewhere inside the main building. Next to the main gate stands a wooden notice board displaying a dozen sun-yellowed parchments. Side quests! I take all the side quests. A closer inspection reveals them to be a handwritten roster of all the horses that are for sale. Never mind. You cannot help but notice just how expensive they are. If the five of you were all to pull every gold crown you possess, you would still not have enough to buy even the cheapest horse on this list. I thought Araya was a noble woman of high birth with lots of money and stuff. Apparently not that much money. In a paddock behind the main building, you can see a dozen horses quietly enjoying the warm night air. Sly points out that there is nobody around and he suggests that it would be easy for you to help yourselves to five of these fine steeds. Apparently, Fire Snake is all prissy about stealing horses. Man, Lone Wolf stole horses all the damn time. I'm not a horse thief, you retort, and I've no wish to rob these stables. 
I respect your honesty, my lord, says Sly. But surely you don't want to have to walk all the way to Bissetan. I'm not saying we steal five horses. I'm saying we just borrow them for a while. We, we can hire a rider to bring them back just as soon as we reach Bissetan. You are not entirely convinced that Sly is sincere, yet you agree reluctantly to go along with his plan. Do I have animal mastery? No, I do not. I have herb shit, though. I have herb shit. Can I use that? Herb mastery? No? Okay. Bardsmanship? Can I sing some songs in order to get animals? No. All right. Horses for sale, Shadow Fax, Slipnare, Pegasus, Mr. Ed. Haha. <laughs> nice. All right. I don't I don't possess that skill. No. You tell the others to wait for you outside the stables and then you approach the paddock alone. The horses become restless as you draw closer, yet you are able to subdue them by using your natural Kai powers of animal control. Silently, you open the paddock gate and command the nearest five horses to leave the enclosure. Obediently, they obey your mental commands, following meekly as you lead them in single file to your waiting companions. Pied Piper the horse is out. I know, right? I have a flute. You mount your borrowed steeds. Borrowed. Nice. And Ernan leads the way along a broad avenue that ends at the town's southern gate ho gatehouse. We got fucking GTH going on here. Grand Theft Horse. Two sleepy-eyed guards watch with indifference as you pass through the open gate and depart from Cape Kabar along its dusty coast road. And now it's random number time. Just random, random number. We don't know what it's for. I got a six. So let's see what that means. You are less than 50 yards from the gatehouse when suddenly the dull clang of an iron bell shatters the evening calm of Cape Kabar. The owners of the Barjak stables have discovered that some of their expensive horses are missing and they have raised the alarm. Through the open gate you glimpse the flicker of torches and your keen ears detect the sound of beating hooves. It's okay, Pied Fire Snake left free front row passes to his next concert at the Kai Monastery. <laughs> <laughs> Fire Snake live at Red Rocks. It is an armed search party, and they are following your tracks while they are still fresh. You call to your companions to stay close as you urge your horse to the gallop. For ten miles, you race together along the flat coast road and are able to maintain a safe distance from your pursuers. But when the trail begins to ascend into the hills, the lack of saddles and stirrups begins to exact its toll. Those following behind have no such disadvantage, and they close the gap rapidly. You are ascending a steep slope toward the crest of a moonlit ridge, when ahead you see the beginning of a hill track. It forks away from the main road and disappears into the hills to your right. Uh, hill track, huh? I don't know if that's a great idea. But, I guess we'll go for it. Staying on the coast road, they're definitely going to catch us. You veer off the main road and lead the way along this narrow dirt track as it winds a tortuous route into the hills. For several minutes, you climb this trail until it ends abruptly at a boulder-strewn plateau that commands a magnificent view of the coast and surrounding land. Far below, you can see a cluster of tiny yellow lights moving through the darkness. They are the torches carried by your pursuers, and you watch intently as these flickering specks of light draw closer to the place where the hill track meets the coast road. You are praying to Ashir that the riders will ignore the track and continue along the road, for this plateau is a dead end. The track is the only way to approach or leave here on horseback. Suddenly, Sly taps you on the shoulder and points to a dark shape at the center of the plateau. At first glance, it looks like a pit, but when you magnify your night vision, you see that it is a flight of rough-hewn steps which descend into the solid rock. Oh yeah, looks like a safe place. Sure, very safe. Let's investigate these steps, yo. 
Let's get let's start getting some of these uh, escort guys killed. Oriya accompanies you as you make your way quickly towards the stone steps. The marines stay on the surface and observe the riders while the two of you investigate where these mysterious steps lead. Together you descend 50 feet into the ground. and arrive at a chamber that is littered with skulls and human bones. There is a carved archway near the bottom of the steps, but it is sealed by a slab of gray marble. As you inch your way towards it, you try to decipher some of the engravings which embellish its surface. They are in an ancient script, yet you are able to determine their meaning. They are clues to the number which must be spoken aloud if you wish for the portal to open. To discover the number which will make this portal open, you must first determine the distance in miles of your journey from Holmgard to Elzion. What? Having found this number, you must then divide it by the number of Grand Master Disciplines which exist. How the fuck do I know the number of miles? Alright, well let's go to the map. Let's consult the map. You are fucking tripping. About tree fitty. Oh, about tree fitty. What? How the fuck am I possibly gonna figure this out? I mean, yes, there is technically a scale right here, but. the number of miles this is a hundred miles right here okay but like how am I measuring it you know what I'm saying like how am I even measuring it In a straight line? Like a straight line from here to Barakala, Karakala, and from Karakala to Elzion? Alright, let's say that we measure this in roughly a straight line for, across there. Uh, let me get the cover off of here real quick. Okay, so... I'm using my fucking fingers right now. There's like... This is ridiculous. There has to be some way that we could have actually figured this out, right? It's around 1600, maybe? Ish? I mean, heavy, heavy ish? That's give or take a couple hundred miles at least. Maybe it's around 1600? There are 16 disciplines, so if I'm dividing by 16, then the number would be 100. But that's only if it really is 1600. And that's in a straight line. This is the distance of your journey, which is going all the way around the coast and shit. I'm just going to try going to number 100, and if, and that's probably wrong, so I'm going to probably have to go to the loser section. Yeah, this is not it. How the fuck am I possibly supposed to figure that out? 
Hold on. This is section 174. Somebody remember that. 174. Did they tell me? Oh, they did! 2,000 miles! They did tell me. One twenty five should be the answer. I just wanted to Yeah, that's the correct answer, but here's the thing. I already fucked it up. So I'm gonna go to the I fucked it up section. Yeah, like you're gonna remember that shit. I mean, I guess if you had this book, you wouldn't have to remember it. You could just flip back to the beginning and look at that, just like I just did, real quick. No, I got it. It's 125. Fuck it. Going to 125. Upon the instant you utter the ancient number, there is a creaking of stone, and the marble slab begins to descend slowly into the floor. As it falls, it reveals another chamber where an ugly bronze idol rests upon a plinth of rough hewn agate. Fixed into a hollow in the chest of the idol is a shimmering green emerald as large as your fist. There's no traps here, I'm sure. Cautiously, you sniff at the stale air of this secret chamber, and your Kai senses detect the foul, lingering odor of evil sorcery. 125 is the ancient number, yeah. It's not quite as ancient as 1 through 124, though. I don't have Kai Alchemy, again. I have Magi Magic and shit. I, I, I could play my flute. Foul lingering odor of evil sorcery. Araya urges you not to enter this chamber. She too can sense the evil that lingers here and she fears that it will harm you if you should disturb it. You heed her warning and move away from the entrance to this sinister chamber. All right, so I guess we didn't really matter if we got in there or not. What the fuck is the point of that then? You don't even get a choice whether you go in there or not. Like if you're like, "No, I can't figure it out." What it leads to the exact same result. If you don't figure it out, you're like, "Oh, we can't get in," and you don't go in. If you do figure it out, you look in there and, "Oh, if you have Kai Alchemy, you could do something different." Okay, never mind. Alright, there, there was a different other option, if you had Kai Alchemy. You and Araya climb the stone steps and return to the marines who are now hiding among the boulders at the edge of the plateau. Ernan tells you that during your absence he watched the riders pass by the entrance to the hill track and continue along the coast road for several miles. Just a few minutes before you arrived, these same riders came galloping back along the road towards Cape Kabar. He is convinced that they have called off the chase and have decided to return to their town. Now that the threat has passed, you and your companions remount your horses and leave the plateau. You ride all night along the empty coast road and cover many miles. Shortly after dawn, you pass a stone signpost pointing to the south. Carved into its surface is the following message written in ancient Vasagonian script. Beer Rabalu, 160 miles. Beyond this sign, the coast road ascends into an expanse of arid hill country, which is populated by herds of wild goats. To the east, you occasionally glimpse the ocean beyond the barren hills. 
while to the west you can see a range of distant mountains, their snowy peaks glistening stark white beneath the fierce desert sun. Shortly before noon, you happy, happen upon the town of Killage, which lies in a narrow pass between two steep hillsides. Oriya and the marines are tired and sore after the long night's ride, and they urge you to stop here so that they might eat and rest a while. Together, you ride into the town's busy market square and dismount at a stone water trough where you allow your horses to drink their fill. Around you, the mood of the townspeople is friendly as they barter and trade their wares. A young boy offers to look after your horses while you visit the market. Initially, you are suspicious of his motives until your sixth sense confirms that he is an honest lad and one worthy of your trust. Oriah gives him a gold crown and his face beams with joy. He'll be able to eat well this week. The Marines want to explore the Market's Bazaar in the hope of finding some blankets and rope. Blankets! Yes! Let me get a blanket! Second best thing to a towel. Blankets and rope with which they can improvise saddles and reins for the horses. Araya is intrigued by the sheer number of people who fill Killage's Market Square, and she wants to find out what has drawn such a large crowd to this remote town. You too are curious, and you agree to accompany her. After arranging to meet the marines at the horse trough in one hour's time, you follow Araya as she pushes her way through the teeming crowd. When finally you reach the center of the marketplace, you were confronted by an unexpected and shocking sight. Dun dun dun! It's a wooden platform, I know it. Wooden platform time, here we go. Oh my god! <laughs> oh! <laughs> That's amazing! That is amazing! I just called it, and the first fucking thing, a large wooden platform. First fucking thing. Oh, wow. Wow. I, I am some kind of savant. I called it, and the first thing it says is a large wooden platform. Lone Wolf would be losing his shit right now. A large wooden platform has been erected at the center of the marketplace, upon which twenty men and women are standing side by side with their heads bowed. These poor wretches wear heavy iron manacles which encase their wrists and ankles. Standing behind them are eight hard-faced guards, each with a loop of knotted rope that dangles menacingly from their wrists. The scorching desert sun beats down without mercy upon those in the line, yet if any of them should dare to move but an inch, they immediately feel the stinging lash of a rope across their backs. Noxmu says that's why Lone Wolf didn't take the Moonstone himself, he has a wooden platform PTSD, right? He totally does. Over the years, you have heard many tales about the slave auctions of Vasagonia, but you had never anticipated that one day you would witness one. This cruel auction fills you with feelings of anger and revulsion, as, one by one, the slaves are dragged from the line and sold to the highest bidder. The owner of the slaves is a stout Vasagonian with small piggy eyes and a wart which sits like a ripe brown cherry on the end of his nose. Every time a slave is sold, he cackles like a witch when the new owner steps forward to pay the auction price. You are about to suggest to Araya that you should leave the square and go back to the horses, when suddenly your Kai senses alert you to danger. Within the crowd, there are many pairs of eyes that have been staring avariciously at your beautiful companion. Don't even fucking try it, y'all. The slave trader has become aware of this, and you see him signal to his henchmen. Immediately, they enter the crowd and move to encircle you and Araya. You unsheathe your weapon and command the slaver to call off his men, but he ignores your order. Suddenly, the crowd melts away to reveal his six muscular thugs. They are no longer holding knotted ropes. Now they hold scimitars and axes with which they slash the air as they advance slowly towards you. Slay him! 
shouts the slaver. Slay the Northlander and bring me the girl! You must fight them. Alright, assholes. Okay, here they are. They look pretty fucking... Ah, they, look, they look pretty obstreperous, these guys. Let's put these pusillanimous fucks down. Slave traders henchmen. Combat skill is really low, that's good. I like how I consider this really low. It's the same as mine. <laughs> really low equals the same as mine. Also, am I in daylight? I think I am. Hold on. You rode all night. Okay, now it's now it's the next day. Okay. I'm in daylight. In that case, They only have 32, ha. Huh? Here we go, round one, 24 versus 36, let's do this. There we go. There we go. They lost 14, I lost none. 24, 22, go, I lost three. They lost six, that's not great. 21 and 16, round three, go. Ooh, I lost three, they lost six. Round four. 18 and 10. Ugh. I needed to win in four rounds or less, and I failed it by, by one point. By one point. 16 and 1. Oh, and I'm down to 14 endurance again, too. I need to, uh, you know what? 14 endurance. I won, and it took me five rounds. I'm drinking this right now. Going back up to 18. All right, bad things are gonna happen because it took me more than four rounds. I'm gonna start healing as well a little bit. You step back from the body of the last henchman to fall to your deadly blows, and you move to take hold of Araya by the hand before making a hasty escape from the square. But as you turn on your heels, you discover that she is no longer behind you. Then you hear her scream, and when you look up, you see that she is being carried away on the back of a gigantic bird. Seriously? Seriously? Elementalism, I set the bird's wings on fire, or some shit. It is an Itacar, a huge Vasagonian eagle. And seated astride its feathered neck is a warrior who has taken Araya captive during your fight with the slaver's henchmen. Desperately, you race after the great bird as it carries her away over the rooftops of Killage. Yet, as you sprint across the square, you see a dozen armed men emerge from the watching crowd to block your path. The Itakar and its precious cargo are rapidly disappearing towards the northern hills, and you know now in your heart that it is too late to save Oriya. Then you hear the sound of cruel laughter echoing across the square, and it brings you skidding to a halt. It is the laugh of the slaver. He can barely contain his delight at having captured such a beautiful young woman, and he is relishing the thought of watching as the remainder of his henchmen make you pay for the deaths of their comrades. Naxu says, send out a tweet on your flute at it. <laughs> nice. Uh, swiftly you assess your perilous situation and determine two ways in which you may save yourself from the slaver's gang of bloodthirsty thugs. Could I kill everyone? No, I can't. My combat skill sucks. And I can't heal myself worth a damn. I don't feel much like a Kai Grandmaster in this book. I feel like a fucking Kai initiate again. A fucking noob. A bard. I feel like some scrub-ass bard. Some spoony bard. Run back across the square and attack the slaver, or attempt to reach the town's bazaar and find the marines. Fuck this slaver. Fuck him. This isn't a good idea. The smart thing to do is go for the marines. But fuck this guy. Fuck him. Fuck him. Fuck him. Fuck him. Fuck him. I'm going after him. Fucking my character fire snake in this book. I went from playing Lone Wolf, Kai Supreme Master, to playing some spoony bard. 
Son of a Submariner. Get Tella to cast Meteo. Oh shit! Man, I loved that game. Final Fantasy IV, aka Final Fantasy II in America. Loved that game when I was a kid. Attacking the slaver. Healing as well. Healing as well. I have a feeling these books are going to kick my ass way worse than the lone wolf ones ever did. The slaver sees you running towards him, and the sight immediately wipes the sneer from his face. With a squeal of fright, he grabs hold of a young female slave and cowers behind her, using her body as a shield to protect himself from you. Repeatedly, he screams the name Svolta, until, in answer to his frantic cry, a short man in a close-fitting gray robe suddenly appears from behind the row of slaves. He is carrying a Vasagonian cavalry bow with an arrow already fixed to the bowstring. The slaver commands him to fire at you, and the man obeys with breathtaking speed. Let's use elementalism again. I set the arrow on fire, and then using the wind, I have it turn around and fly back and kill the guy. And also the earth erupts under the other dude and swallows him up. I don't think my, element, my, my elementalism is quite as strong as I'm imagining. Hastily, you use your Master of the Elements to summon a gust of air to deflect the arrow that is now speeding towards your chest. Pick a random number. Motherfucking fuck! If your current endurance total is 20 or lower, it's exactly 20. Alright. I have to subtract too. What can you do? High roll, high roll, high roll, high roll. No! Let's go to the failure section. I'm about to get wrecked. Your attempt to avoid get being struck by the arrow is not as successful as you could have wished for. It penetrates your left shoulder, and the energy of its impact is enough to bring you crashing to the ground. The archer laughs with glee when he sees you fall, and with encouragement from the slaver who is screaming at him to finish you off, he drops his bow and leaps down from the platform. As he rushes towards where you lie, he snatches his sword from its scabbard and raises it in readiness to deliver a fatal blow to your head. Reduce my combat skill by three for the first two rounds of this fight. This is really going to hurt me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be super low on health at the end of this if I survive. Alright, how the way I'm gonna do this is add I get I get to take one off of him for daylight, okay? So that's 36. I'm gonna give him three for the first two rounds. So he'll be at 39. Round one, here we go. 20 and 36. I lost four, he lost four. Round two, 16 and 32. I lost five, he lost two. Now he goes down to 36 11 and 30 oh I'm gonna die I'm fucked 5 he lost 3 I'm gonna die I'm gonna die I'm gonna die 6 and 27 oh there we go he lost 9 at 6 and 9 18 2 and 14 and I'm dead I lose that is my first death of this book. Alright, we gotta try fighting him again. We're gonna back up to right here. We're gonna use a thing of healing as we approach this, as we come into this thing. And now we're gonna get, get down there. And now we're going to roll this again without the without the penalty. 
And we still failed it. We still failed it, yo. I don't think I can, Noxmoo, because I don't get to have any of the abilities that Lone Wolf has unless I, unless it explicitly tells me I have them or I have the actual Grandmaster version. So, like, if I go back here, it's like... I can't do it unless I, until I take, until I actually take Kai Surge. Well, let's try this again. Use the flute at the start of combat? Yes! If only I could use the flute. Twenty-one and thirty-six, here we go. Eighteen and thirty. Eighteen and twenty-one. Now he goes down to thirty-six. Eighteen and twenty-one. Thirteen and eighteen. Thirteen and nine. I think I'm gonna win this time. Thirteen and nine. Eight and six. Dude, having my endurance be this low though, and I can't heal myself. This is gonna be really bad. Throw the electro spider of doom's carcass at him, says Noxmu. Is this daytime? Yes, it is. I'm already. That's why his combat skill is only 36 instead of 37, because of the the sunlight. Eight and six. Six and zero. Well, I won. After dying once, I won, but I only have six fucking endurance. I've already used my potion of Lomspur. I only have two more points of healing left. Oh, man. So the next fight I get in, I'm fucked. I'm probably fucked for the rest of the book. I lost. All right. I mean, I won, but I feel like I've long term speaking, I'm going to lose. Zvolta screams as your killing blow pierces his chest. He drops his sword, staggers drunkenly backwards, and then falls off the edge of the slave platform to land in an undignified heap on the dusty ground. His master, the slaver, has disappeared into the crowd, but by using your sixth sense and tracking skills, you discover that he has slipped away to hide in the adjoining bazaar. You leap from the platform and set off across the square toward the market bazaar. The slaver's henchmen, fearing that you may escape, immediately move in from all sides to block your path. The crowd scream and scatter as you approach them, for they are terrified at the prospect of being dragged into a bloody melee when the slaver's thugs catch up with you. Then, suddenly, in the midst of this chaotic tangle of running and screaming people, appear Ernan, Sly, and Oswin, mounted upon their steeds, and yours and Oriah's horses in tow. News of what has happened here at the slave market has spread like wildfire through the rest of Killage. On hearing these reports, the marines have rushed here as quickly as they could. Come, Grandmaster! shouts Oswin, and he throws you the rope that is now attached to your steed's head. We must flee this town at once! Yeah, this town is fucking... went crazy. You leap onto the blanket saddle, which is tied to your horse's back. Take hold of the rope reins in both hands, and dig your heels into his flanks to urge him to the gallop. Two of the slaver's henchmen rush to block your escape but they are trampled into the dirt when your horse bolts away. You race towards a tree-lined avenue on the south side of the square with your three companions galloping close behind. As you enter this thoroughfare, you see one of the slaver's men come rushing out of a doorway. He is armed with a bow, and as you gallop past him, he draws an arrow to his lips and takes careful aim at your head. While leaving, you make up a song about Killage the Killer Village. Nice. 
Killage do loot do do. Killage do loot do do do. It's killer. It's village. That's what we call it. Killage. Killage do loot do do. I said a killage do loot do do do. Fucking killage, man. This place sucks. Alright, if I have a semblance, add three. No, I don't have it. Endurance score is 200. I deduct two. Right here, this is instant death. This will probably kill me too, because it'll probably be damage that, that'll kill me. Or take me very close to dead. Although I do get to heal up one this, this section. Alright, let's pick my random number. See if I die again. Six minus two is four. I'm probably gonna. It might not do as much damage, but it's gonna hurt me. It's gonna hurt me real bad. You press yourself flat against your horse's neck and listen as the archer's arrow buzzes towards you like an angry hornet. Then you feel a sharp pain in your back as its tip grazes your spine. Lose two endurance points. For a few uncertain moments, the marines believe that you have been mortally wounded, but they are quick to cheer when they see you sit up and glance over your shoulder. Despite the stinging pain of your wound, you manage a smile, and you acknowledge their glad shout with a wave of your hand. Then you dig your heels into your horse's flanks once more, and gallop along this avenue which leads out of Killage, the Killer Village. I'm out of healing stuff now. I've used it all. I'm so boned. I need a mo I need a heal from the moonstone or something. Killage. Killage do loot do do. I said a killage do loot do la do. It's killer. It's a village. That's what we call it. Killage. Killage do loot do do. I said a killage do loot do la do. All right. For an hour, you ride without daring to stop. In case the slaver has dispatched his henchmen to pursue you, the hills keep the interior of this country hidden from view until you reach a broad-based canyon bisected by a meandering stream. The threat of pursuit has now passed, and so you halt here to slake your thirst before continuing your long ride south. Beyond the canyon, the road crosses a rolling coastal plain, which lies at the eastern edge of the dry main. Vasagonia's vast desert. The undulations of its windswept sands give this great sun-bleached emptiness the appearance of a vast yellow sea that seems to stretch away into infinity. You feel a disturbing unease as you stare across this wilderness, for there is nothing to break the view, and nothing that could offer you a place to hide should the need arise. Riding through the desert on a horse with no name. As dusk approaches, you are pleased to see that the road bears to the east, and passes within sight of the ocean. The heat of the day is now surrendered to a biting night wind that makes your horse and your companions shiver. Mindful of their need for shelter, you leave the road and scout the rugged coastline in search of a cave in which to spend the night. Your tracking skills lead you to a dry cave that is ideal, and you camp here and build a fire from driftwood. Over a meal of roasted crab meat, the conversation turns to Oriah and your fears for her safety. Later this night, as you sit the first watch, you offer a prayer to the goddess Ashir to protect her and keep her safe. You have a strong feeling that the young woman is still alive and that one day, sometime in the future, your paths are destined to cross once more. Oh boy, destiny. Moonstone. Oh, you guys. Didn't you read the fine print? I don't work on Kai's. Yeah, I guess not. After a few hours, Sly wakes from his slumber to take his turn keeping watch at the mouth of the cave. Gladly, you hand over the duty to him and settle down for some much-needed sleep. You may restore three endurance points. Wow, big three. I'm good to go now. I'm all set now. I'm covered now. Don't even trip. I have nine.
You awake with the dawn, feeling refreshed and eager to begin the day's ride south toward the city of Beer Rabaloo. You know... I think I'm gonna do something... that I have never done in these Lone Wolf books before. The last 20 books, I did them all in one shot. One stream, one video, no breaks. But this time, I don't know, I've, my throat's been hurting this whole time, really. Which is weird. Normally, if it's gonna start hurting, then start hurt, start hurting toward the end. But it's it's been bothering me like the whole time. And I'm starting to really feel it. I don't know that I can finish this book right now. I'm also pretty tired, and not really doing a great job of reading and stuff anyway. So, I think what I'm gonna do is actually stop, and just pick this back up tomorrow and finish the book in a second session. Which, I, I, like I said, I've never done that before with these books. I've done them all before in one shot, but this time I don't think I'm going to. I think this is going to be a two-parter. And this seems like a natural place to stop. You need sleep anyway, Noxmu? Yeah. So this seems like a good place to stop. We just ended the drama of Killage, and we're about to start on a whole on a new a new section, basically. So I'm just gonna stop right here and pick it back up tomorrow and finish it. So. I think I'm, I think I'm just going to stitch these videos together, though. So if you're watching on YouTube, it'll still be all one video. And we are back. We are back to continue Lone Wolf Book 21, Voyage of the Moonstone. So, we're waking with the dawn here, we're starting a new day, we're in really bad shape. I'm thinking if I get to a point where I get killed and I can't proceed, I might go all the way back to the beginning of the book and re-roll my, uh, re my stats, try to get better combat skill, and then zoom through everything really quickly, redo the battles so I can get to, a better, to this point with a, more endurance, but... Yeah, I forgot about the, yeah, the bardsmanship, exactly. I'm doing good, I'm doing good, Noxmu, and I am ready for some bard action. So here we go. You awake with the dawn, feeling refreshed and eager to begin the day's ride south towards the city of Beer Rabaloo. During the morning, you and your traveling companions pass several traders and caravans that are heading north to sell their whalers. Their whalers? Sell their whalers. They're selling Boston whalers. They're selling boats. Now, to sell their wares in Cape Kabar, your fair complexions and some lending clothes draw many suspicious glances from the caravan drivers, prompting you to stop when you come to a village shortly after midday. Here, the marines go looking for some maktis, the flowing gray and white robes traditionally worn by the desert dwellers of Fasagonia. While they busy themselves in the hunt for new clothes, you water and feed the horses at the village stables. You are tending to the horses when you are approached by an elderly street vendor. He is pushing a handcart on which he has displayed the following items for sale. So he's got a dagger, some scented oil, some candles, slippers, slippers, nice, a copper cup, a rope, a lantern, a liar, oh we gotta get a liar, a ball of chalk and three arrows, each thing costs one gold crown. What are we buying? What are we buying? What are we buying? I think I've actually used... I, I think I only have four arrows left. Let's buy some arrows, get, my, get ourselves back up to six. 
let's uh I don't know. I'm in the mood. I'm in the mood to get a little bit silly. Let's buy some slippers. Let's buy a liar. Let's buy some candles. Let's buy a rope. Let's buy a lantern. Let's buy a ball of, bo a ball of chalk. Yeah. Oh yeah, of course I bought the ball of chalk. This ain't my first rodeo. Let's buy, uh... Some scented oil. That's eight items I just bought. I don't even give a fuck. I'm spending eight crowns like I got it. Don't even care. After a while, the three marines return to the stables. They are now dressed in Maktis, and when they pull up their hoods, you feel sure that they could pass for native Vasagonians. What about me? I don't get a disguise? They bundle and tie their marine uniforms to the saddle blankets of their horses, and then the four of you mount up and leave this village. The sun is sinking below the desert horizon when you come to the next village on the road to Birabalu. It is located on the fringe of a wide beach and it can only be reached by a sandy track which branches away from the main coast road. As you reach this junction, you notice a group of local people have gathered around something that has been washed up on the beach. Let's go check it out. We gotta go check it out. As you ride across the firm sandy beach toward the excited crowd, you see that they are gathered around the carcass of a whale. These poor villagers are celebrating their unexpected good fortune, for this whale will provide them with food for a month, and enough oil to fuel their lamps until winter. A cheerful-looking old man hails you with his walking stick, and you slow your horse to a halt. You'll be bound for Bear Rabbalo, good sirs? He asks. Cause if you is, then you do well to heed my advice. And what advice would that be? Replies Ernan. The old man gives him a thin smile and then hobbles nearer to your horse. He does not say anything. He simply holds out his hand in the hope that you will pay him something for his advice. Naxu says, Fire Snake the Kaibard kills Electro Spider of Doom, goes shopping at the local mini mall outlet. <laughs> well, we're going to pay this guy. This guy sounds like he knows what he's talking about. I trust him. Let's give him a gold crown. You take a single gold crown from your money pouch and toss it to the old man, who catches it with surprising dexterity. He tests its worth by biting down on its edge with his blackened teeth before tucking it safely away in the folds of his tattered maktis. There's a mutiny taking place in the city of Birabalu, he says, his creaky old voice barely audible above the crash of the surf. The funtal of the city has imposed heavy taxes on the guild's merchants. And we've heard from travelers that the Traders Guild have paid foreign assassins to come and do away with them. Suddenly, the old man's face drops and his myopic eyes narrow with suspicion when he notices that you and your companions are not natives of this land. <laughs> yeah, hi, we are the foreign assassins. Sup. Don't be alarmed, says Oswin. We're not assassins. We're... Traders. He smiles uneasily. Clearly he is not convinced, and, without saying another word, he turns around and hobbles away across the beach. Silly old fool, says Sly. We're wasting our time here, Grandmaster. Let's be getting on. You nod in agreement and signal to the others to follow as you turn your horse back towards the coast road. It is a clear night, and the brilliant moon is nearly full. With luck, you could be in Beer Rabaloo well before midnight. Osman didn't sound suspicious at all, I know, right? He sounded legit. Completely legit. And by the way, if I do different voices for any of the characters in this than I did yesterday, it's because I've forgotten how I did them, so... Sometimes characters' voices just change. You understand. You ride the moodlit coast road, covering the remaining 25 miles to Beer Rabalu in little more than three hours. Your first glimpse of the great trading port comes when the road crests a ridge of hills within a mile of its perimeter wall. 
From here, you can see that the city is built in a semicircle between two great jutting spurs of land which protrude into the ocean like the horns of a huge bull. Within the city wall are hundreds of lavish buildings, yet the grandest of all is a castle which stands upon a steep hill at its center. This one towering stronghold dominates all the other splendid structures of this rich metropolis. Your arrival at the North Gate at such a late hour is greeted with suspicion from a pair of surly guards. Eventually, you are allowed to enter, but only after Oswin bribes them with the horse that Oriah once rode. Beyond the gate, you ride along a torchlit avenue which leads down to the harbor. This is filled with trading ships of all nationalities. The quayside and its taverns are alive with activity as the captains and crews of these vessels drink themselves senseless with the money their cargoes have earned. You select one of the quieter taverns and stable your horses at the rear before making your entrance. The tavern's tap room is crowded with sailors and traders, most of whom are listening to an uncommonly fine musical performance being given by three Cloasian minstrels. Wait a minute, I could give an uncommonly fine performance. I have bardsmanship. Come on, let me bard some shit up. Your companions are hungry and tired, and so you make your way to the counter and ask the tavern keeper his price for food and a night's lodging. He tells you that ten gold crowns will fill all your bellies and buy you each the use of a comfortable room. You agree to his price. How do they know I have ten gold crowns? I might not even have ten gold crowns at this point. Fine. I have ten gold crowns. Now, now I'm starting to get concerned and also regretting perhaps some of my purchases. Bard Mastery Face-Off. Yes, let's have a Battle of the Bards. You agree to his price, and he hands each of you a numbered key. The marines are not impressed with the minstrel's classical recital, and they decide to eat their meals in their rooms. Before they retire for the night, you may arrange to meet with them here in the tap room, first thing in the morning. You seat yourself at the counter, and listen to the recital as you enjoy a meal of grilled meat and sugared desert fruits. As you wipe your mouth and push away your empty plate, your eye is caught by a rotund little man who is seated alone in an alcove. Ho, journeyman! He calls, beckoning you with a plump hand that is laden with gold and ruby rings. Please, will you join me at my table? Hey, Saito, good to see you. How you been? Musical version of Face Off, where Nicolas Cage steals John Travolta's face to perform illegal renditions of Green Sleeves. <laughs> Man, you missed the first half of this book, and it was so ridiculous, Saito, because they had me singing all kinds of songs. Because my character has bardsmanship as one of my disciplines now, and so we've resolved that I will sing every line that my character says, and also I just sing other random little songs at certain times, because I'm a bard. And it's not good. It's not good at all. Oh, you saw it? Yeah, you saw how bad it was then. So there's plenty of laughing at me available. Watched it just before this? Really? Alright. Please, will you join me at my table? I don't have telenosis because I don't have any useful ones anymore. I took all the lame ones instead. Fucking herb mastery and shit. Alright. No. No, I'm just gonna go over there trustingly. This dude's probably a hell gas too. By using your basic Kai skills, you are able to determine that this man is a rich trader from Cassiorn, the city of merchants. He seems harmless enough. His only fault, perhaps, is that he has consumed too much ale. Yet you are suspicious of the fact that he has identified you as a journeyman, which leads you to suspect that perhaps he has met other Kai in the past. You are about to ignore him and retire to your room when he repeats his request that you join him at his table. Out of curiosity, you decide to find out what he wants. Also, I'm getting my ass kicked. I only have 9 endurance left, and I have no way to heal myself. Welcome, Master Journeyman, says the smiling trader. I'm most pleased to make your acquaintance. My name is Kolostimi Ayusidihara, but most people know me better as Kol. 
I see by the cloak clasp you were wearing that you are a Kai Juryman of Summerlin, yes? <laughs> Ballad about Alton and his glorious triumph over Lone Wolf? God damn it. It's over now. I'm not playing Lone Wolf. I can't I cannot be shamed about the the Lost Archery contest or the Silver Bow of Do It On because this new character, Fire Snake, could never have had that in the first place. You nod to affirm this, and the excited little man proceeds to tell you about himself and his business. You hear that he is a merchant who was born in Cassiorn, but who now lives in the city of Kuchek. When he was a young man, he traded silk for wheat in Holmgard, where he first encountered the Kai. Once, when his caravan was attacked by a Giak war party on the Ruinon Pike, it was the timely intervention of a Kai journeyman that saved his life and his cargo. Since that day, he has revered your warrior order. Oh, we got us a fan. Barely pausing for breath, he tells you proudly that he has a ship moored in the harbor which is filled with timber that he intends to trade for spices in Bisutan. He plans to set sail tomorrow at noon. When at last he pauses to take a sip of ale from his tankard, you inform him that you and your three companions are traveling overland to Elzion. By horse? Such a tiring way to travel, and such a difficult road, too. He says, I would gladly offer you passage aboard my ship, but, alas, I carry such a heavy cargo that I could only accommodate one extra passenger. You would be most welcome to sail with me to Bissertan, but sadly I am unable to offer such a favor to your friends. That's fine, fuck the marines. Oh, I guess I mean to say no to that really good idea. You thank Cole for his offer, but decline it, preferring to stay with the marines. You are tired now, and so you rise from your seat and bid the friendly trader good night and a safe voyage. As you turn to go to your room, he calls out, if you should change your mind, remember I sail at noon. My ship is moored at the end of the East Key. She's called Desert Jewel. All right, buddy. I'll keep it in mind. <laughs> Colostomy, are you city holla? <laughs> he wants to buy one of your CDs. Nice. I got the Marines here. Oh, I'll have to send the Marines down. They've got my merch. They'll sell, they'll sell you some of my merch. <laughs> I totally let him win, Noxmoo. Totally. You find your room at the end of a corridor on the first floor, and you are pleased to discover that it is clean and well furnished. You fall asleep within minutes of lying down upon the feather-mattressed bed, yet it seems as if you have barely closed your eyes when, two hours later, you are rudely awoken by noises in the taproom below. The clomp of iron-shod boots and the hubbub of angry voices make you leap from your bed and reach for your weapon. Quickly, you gather your equipment and cloak and ease open the door to your room. Outside in the corridor, you see your companions. Like you, they have been awoken by the commotion downstairs. The Marines also served as his backup singers for his doo-wop version of In the Navy. <laughs> uh, wow. That sounds amazing. It's the city god, whispers Oswin, who is peering down the stairwell. Then the tavern keeper appears, and he comes rushing up the stairs. His face is red as a beetroot, and he is shaking with fright. The, the, the Funtal of Beer Rabalu's men are here. He says, his voice wavering. They've had word that there are assassins abroad in the harbor, and they're checking all foreigners. You're to go down to the tap room at once. Uh, yeah. Okay, why not? Let's go talk to this city guard. I'm not concerned. Reluctantly, the, mar the marines follow as you descend the stairs. The moment you set foot in the tap room, you are surrounded by armed guards and made to ha hand over all your weapons. Delete all normal weapons from your action chart. 
You need not delete your Kai weapon, which you keep hidden beneath your cloak. Yeah, this fucking, this fucking longsword that I've got here, they won't find that. They won't find that, but this dagger? They'll, they'll take my dagger, quick. Alright, well, whatever, I lose my weapons. I'm not gonna delete them at the moment, I'm just gonna remember that I don't have them for right now. Once you and your companions have been disarmed, you are herded toward the counter to join more than two dozen others who are of foreign nationality. I don't appreciate this racial profiling. These motherfuckers need to check their Vasagonian privilege. The officer in charge of the armed guards then strides to the middle of the taproom floor and proceeds to inform you in an imperious tone that you are to be taken to the Funtel's castle where your trading papers and travel documents will be scrutinized. This doesn't sound good. The others, who all appear to be traders and merchants, are outraged when they hear this degree. They protest loudly and many refuse to leave the tavern. They say that it is all just a cynical ploy by the Funtal to confiscate their cargoes. They order you to hand over your flute and lyre. <laughs> no! Call appears by your side and he whispers to you to follow him. As the Funtal's guards move in and grapple with the angry merchants, you and the marines slip away with Call and hide in the cellar below the tavern's kitchen. An hour later, as dawn is breaking, the tavern falls silent and you emerge from your hiding place to discover that it is now completely empty. Alright, well, that's kind of lame that they took my stuff. Fucking cops. You really like how Lone Wolf is actively trying to make Samer sword? I think you mean Samer Somerland? A shittier place by sending you on this quest. Yeah, I know, right? Like, oh, things are really, really good since the since the Moonstone is here. Let's get rid of it. Get it out of here. The gods don't want us to be this happy. We are meant for suffering and strife. It is the lot of man. The Funtals are madmen, splutters call. All those poor fools who got took away last night are going to lose their cargoes, or their gold, or their ships. You mark my words, I'd not be surprised if some of them lose their lives into the bargain. It's not safe here no more, not like the old days. Call then proceeds to wash down his hearty breakfast with a tankard of ale. He pauses to emit a long, loud belch, and then he repeats his offer of a place aboard his ship which sails for Bisutan at noon. The marines do not object to you leaving them if you so wish. Should you decide to continue your journey to Elzian without them, they will attempt to sell your horse and use the money to buy passage aboard the next ship heading north. Uh, oh, this is a pretty tough decision here. This is a big decision. If less people are dying, where will Bane and find orphans to torment? <laughs> right? Uh, well, ships have been bad luck for me so far. But it does seem like it would speed things up. No, I think I'm going to trust Lone or Fire Snake's original in instincts here and decline this and stay with the Marines. You bid Call good luck and wish him a safe voyage before you and your companions collect your horses and set off from the tavern. The streets of Beer Rabalu are quiet this morning and you reach the city's south gate without incident. Here you gallop through the open gates to avoid any risk of being detained by the surly guards. They shout and curse you and loose off a few arrows in your wake, but these are poorly aimed and you escape from the city unharmed. It is approaching noon when you arrive at a junction where the coast road splits in two. Ahead of you are the gentle foothills of the Kaneshi Mountains, and beyond them you glimpse the snowy peaks of that great range rising majestically into the cloudless sky. Away to the east you can see the rugged coastline of southern Vasagonia, where the cresting ocean waves break their backs upon wild and rocky beaches. 
A signpost at the junction points to the east and to the south. To the east it reads Core 100 miles, Bisutan 225 miles. To the south it reads Koneshi Pass to Bisutan 125 miles. Saito, I just have this image of Lone Wolf looking over a flowering field while a pregnant woman cries tears of joy upon hearing the news from a midwife that she is due for healthy triplets. He shakes his head as a single tear falls from his face and he whispers, Not on my watch. <laughs> yes. Alright, let's consult the map. Let's consult the map. Consulting the map. Alright, we're right here, essentially. Okay. We can go east to Kor and around to Bisaton, or we can go straight through the pass to Bisaton. Well, that's kind of a no-brainer. I mean... This is, like, much more direct. So we're gonna go, we're gonna go south, not east. Cut the games. Or wait, north is like this direction on this map. Anyway, we're gonna go through the pass. Mountain Road South. If Lone Wolf couldn't have a happy family, nobody can. As you climb through the foothills and leave behind the coastal plain, so the oppressive heat of the desert sun gradually cools as you go higher. Thankfully, the hill road is in a good state of repair, and you are able to relax and enjoy the magnificent scenery as you travel towards the Koneshi Mountains. It is early in the evening when you come to a stone bridge which passes over a steep-sided gorge. On the far side of the bridge, you can see a toll booth, an inn, and a few stone hovels which comprise a tiny mountain village. With daylight fading fast, you decide to cross the gorge and spend the night at the inn. You are halfway across the bridge when a muscular young man, dressed in a scarlet mactis and clutching a ceremonial sword, emerges from the toll booth and signals for you to halt. He tells you that you wish to cross, if you wish to cross the bridge and spend the night at the Mountain Inn, the price will be 20 gold crowns. I don't think I have 20 gold crowns anymore. I don't. So, nope. What if I just fucking, like, fustro doll this guy off the bridge? Just saying. Can I just play some songs for my... Man, Bardsmanship has not come in useful at all. Every time when you theor theoretically might use Bardsmanship, it won't let you use it. And then any other time, it also won't let you use it. It's just lame, Bardsmanship. Why did I t Herb Mastery too. Can't use that either. I don't have the sum. Let's go to 338. I need some healing, though, badly. Your refusal to pay infuriates the toll collector. He brandishes his sword at you and threatens to cut off your ears. I just immediately thought of the scene in Raiders of the Lost Ark when the dude does the whole display, swirling the sword around all fancy, and fucking Indiana Jones just fucking pulls out his gun and shoots him. Like, that's what I can see happening here. He's brandishing his sword at me, and I'm just like... <laughs> Bang. Consult the stars at him. Consult the stars at him, yes. Buster Duff falls under Grand Nexus. What about elementalism? I can I, I can call I could called up a, cust, a gust of wind earlier. Why can't I gust of wind him the fuck out of here? The Marines laugh at his bravado. They are in no doubt who would end up the loser if he was foolish enough to pick a fight with you. Their disparaging laughter wounds his pride, and you sense that he is about to fly into a blind rage. Using your psychic Kai powers, you cool his anger and persuade him to put away his sword. He does so, and politely now he asks that you pay a toll of four crowns to cross the bridge. With a nod of your head, you indicate to your companions that this is a fair price, and you each hand him one gold crown apiece. Okay, good. That's more reasonable. Okay. 
Here's what he looks like. Man, that guy looks bajiggity. He's all like, uh You're lucky. You're lucky you didn't go flying off the bridge, sir. Hey, boss, Pi, how you doing? Good to see ya. Doxmu, you begin to summon a windstorm, but realize that it is just gas. Yeah. The reduced toll charge does not include a night's lodging at the inn, and so you ride through the village and set up camp on a wooded slope a mile beyond. The night is bitterly cold, and the close proximity of scavenging timber wolves frighten your horses and prevent you from getting my- WHAT?! Lose th I need healing! I can't- I don't need unhealing. I don't- oh my god, lose three endurance- that's a third of my health! And I have no way to heal. Prevents you from getting much sleep. At first light, you strike camp and continue your ride through the Kaneshi Pass. Oh man, the New Order series sucks. <laughs> this curing rule is horrible. The road becomes increasingly tortuous as it traverses the central reaches of the Kaneshi Mountains. Long winding climbs around precipitous cliffs are followed by steep descents into wooden ravines, wooded ravines, which test your nerve and your horsemanship to the full. Among the trunks of the blonde Vasagonian mountain pines which border this route, you glimpse the feral eyes of hungry timber wolves. Their howling disturbs the horses, and you are forced to use your Kai skills throughout this difficult crossing to keep all four of the steeds calm and controllable. Blah blah blah, Axie the horse. It is a little after midday when you hear the rumble of thunder echoing through the surrounding peaks. You suspect a storm must be approaching, yet the sky above is clear and your keen senses detect no winds nor any change in atmospheric pressures. Later, as the trail pot passes around a s dip, whoa, I got distracted for a second there. Lone Wolf, you're back. How'd you do on your quest, Fire Snake? Well, the good news is that I developed Grandmaster skills of panhandling and pickpocketing. Also, a crippling fear of wooden platforms. Oh man, that wooden platform earlier. That was a ter terrifying moment, was it not? I, I go home and start telling Lone Wolf the story. So then there was this wooden platform, platform and Lone Wolf was like, No! Stop! Just don't even tell me! I don't even want to hear it! Just don't even talk about it! It's okay, I took pictures, Lone Wolf. Do you want to see? No! No! I'm not going to provo promote you to any ranks that I made up if you don't stop talking about this. All right. Later, as the trail passes around a steep cliff face, you see the cause of the rumbling. Ahead, the narrow trail is blocked by a landslide. The dust has settled, and when you magnify your vision, you think you can see a way to cross the mound of broken rocks. You tell the marines to wait for you while you go ahead to check if it is safe for you all to proceed. You're picking your way cautiously across the rockfall when suddenly a loud roar fills your ears and you look up to see a thousand tons of loose shale come tumbling down the mountainside. It is too narrow to turn your horse about and so you dig your heels into his flanks and urge him forwards. To your horror, he panics and rears up on his hind legs in an attempt to throw you off his back. Oh, this is instant death right here. Lone Wolf, tell me another story, anything else? So, well, there was this one woman I was traveling with, and I think Fire Snake has already spent more time around a woman than Lone Wolf did in 20 fucking books. <laughs> Lone Wolf, get out. You'll lose your flute privileges if you continue. Alright, random number time. I do not have animal mastery, so, and once again, all of my abilities are fucking useless, much to my great shock. I got a four. That's gonna. Uh, I'm gonna die. I'm gonna die. I'm gonna lose some endurance here, and I can't be losing endurance right now. Fuck me. Despite his best efforts, you manage to stay on your horse and steer him toward the crest of the rockfall. 
The first boulders are beginning to smash down around you as he carries you valiantly to the top of the mound and gallops over the far side. You are half blinded by dust, and you fail to see a boulder which hits you in the middle of the back and flattens you against the neck of your horse. Lose three endurance points. Okay, sure. That seems reasonable. I've got all kinds of endurance to spare, no probs. When you are out of harm's way, you rein in your horse and turn him about so that you can take stock of the damage caused by the second rockfall. Although in fairness, that is a really small amount of endurance to lose from a fucking giant ass boulder coming down a mountainside and hitting you in the back. Like, that would probably hurt you more than just three endurance points. When the dust settles, you see that the Kaneshi Pass is now blocked and completely impassable. You shout to the marines on the other side to let them know that you are safe, and you hear them calling back, but even with your acute Kai sense of hearing, you are unable to make out clearly what they are shouting. However, by drawing upon your Magna Kai skill of divination, you are able to make telepathic contact with Sly. By way of mental commands and suggestions, you tell him to lead his comrades back to Beer Rabaloo, where they are to sell their horses to raise the money they will need to buy passage home aboard a trading ship. Sly is unable to answer you telepathically, but you sense that he will comply with your suggestions. Wary of the risk of further landslides, you turn your horse around and ride off along the open mountain trail towards the south. Well, now I wish I had taken the ship with what's his name? With. Kumbaya Pickwiddle, or whatever his name was. <laughs> Probably not his actual name. Alright. Just a second. Okay, so we've lost our marines, we've lost almost all of our health, we've lost all, almost, all, almost all of our money, and we have a bunch of useless ass abilities. This is not going well at all. Chance of success approaching zero. <laughs> Magnifying your vision out to sea, you see the merchant guy waving to you beauty pageant style as he sails on ahead past the blockage. may think your disciplines are useless, but just wait until you come across an evil ficus who attacks individuals with unpleasant gusts of warm air and can only be stopped by melodies about the constellations. Then you'll be set. <laughs> yes, I am ready for that eventuality. And some kind of special challenge roll where you, ha you get bonuses to the roll the lower your endurance is. Then I got it. It is noon of the following day, when eventually you emerge from the Kaneshi Mountains and catch your first exciting glimpse of the great city of Bisutan, seated upon an island in the estuary of the River Korda. With an air of expectation, you follow the mountain road as it meanders down through sagebrush hills, until, at dusk, you finally reach a titanic stone bridge that spans the shimmering waters of the Korda. This mighty bridge has for centuries carried a flow of traders to and from a towering gatehouse which is set into the city's protective wall. It is not the custom of Bisutan city guards to stop travelers without good reason, for here the merchants of all Magnamund meet to haggle and trade and barter their cargoes. With a courteous smile they allow you to pass through their great gate and enter their magnificent city. Yay, we made it to Bisutan. It's a milestone. Your endurance score is exactly one, turn to page 350. That'd be nice. I'm just going to 250 instead. Let's take a look at the old map here. 
So, we're getting close. I mean, we started way the fuck up here, and we had to go down, and around here, and down here, and down here, and down here, and now we're all the way to Bissaton, and Elzean's right there. So, you know, we just have to make it through this little area. You follow a broad avenue which is teeming with commercial travelers, people who have come here from the four corners of Magnamund to trade their wares. Merchants, farmers, jewelers, and slaves are just a few people, a few of the people, you observe as you ride towards the heart of this great city. Everywhere is bustle and hurry, even at this late hour. At a fountain of fresh water, you stop to allow your horse to drink. As you sit and wait, you observe a struggle taking place on a flight of stone steps close by. Two greasy young louts are attacking a woman who is attired in a long black dress and black headscarf, indicating that she has been recently widowed. Greasy young louts, huh? Incensed by the sight of this cowardly attack, you leap from your horse and rush toward the steps with your weapon drawn. As you begin to climb the stairs, to your surprise, you see the two louts. I don't know why I'm yawning so much. To your surprise, you see the two louts and the woman cease their struggle. Together, they run to the top of the steps and disappear through a door which they slam shut behind them. So this was some sort of uh, trap, huh? Some sort of scam. On reaching it, you discover it has been bolted shut from the inside. You are trying to make sense of the situation when suddenly you realize what has happened. From the top of the steps, you look down at the fountain below to see that your horse has now disappeared. He has been stolen. Cursing your own naivete, you descend the steps and continue on foot along the busy avenue until you arrive at a place called Donomet Square, where a busy evening bazaar is taking place. You are mindful of your need to find lodging for the night, and also some new means by which you will be able to continue your journey to Elzion. As you stop to look at the market and the facades of the shops and taverns which encircle it, your eye is caught by the gaily decorated merchant stalls and the exotic wares they display. Now that I've got rid of all my money, yeah. This is about to become the fantasy version of Death Wish. So got a couple greasy young louts there, attacking a widow. Got a fountain with a fish spitting a lot of water into the air. I'll take a closer look at the market stalls. Maybe I can find a healing potion. Oh my god. How much money do I have left? Oh, okay. You tour the market, and one stall in particular holds your attention. It is run by a small and timid-looking man, and he offers you herbs and potions which he has gathered from all over Magnamund. As you examine the hundreds of vials, filters, and flasks that are laid out upon his stall, you notice there are many types of herbs that you have encountered before, and some you have not. Of all his selection, the following four interest you the most. Hey, Fry Guy, how you doing? Good to see you. Gotta go soon, but you figure you could stick around till I die? Can't be long, right? Yeah, good call. Good call. Well, we definitely want a potion of Lomspur. And a potion of Alather. There's also a potion of Mustau. Creates a foul choking gas when released into the air. And a potion of Sabaris. Purifies contaminated water when use only. All right, here's the deal. I'm already about to start throwing shit out that I just bought. I'm gonna drink the potion of Lomspur right the fuck now. And I'm gonna buy this potion of Alather.
Do you think they took my arrows when they took my bow? I mean, technically, they didn't say they took my arrows, they just said weapons, but I think arrows count, so I'm gonna get rid of my arrows as well. I'm gonna heal myself for four. Oh yeah, I'm up to seven. What's up now? The stall merchant screams for the city guard as a spoony bard shambles up to his stall zombie style and chugs all the lumps for potions like it was a frat initiation. <laughs> Nice. Alright, let's just go about our business. Oh. I wish to make your purchase. Turn to 221. Uh-oh. You slip your purchase inside your backpack and then bid farewell to the smiling herbalist before returning to the middle of the square. Here you stop for a few minutes to watch a juggler. As you watch him perform with clubs and daggers, you are continually jostled and bumped by the crowd. You are about to move off when suddenly you feel something tugging at your back. Glancing over your shoulder, you see a suspicious young man running away through the milling crowd. He is clutching something to his chest that you feel sure he has just filched from your backpack. Uh, chasing this guy seems like a bad idea. Next section. You pass to the next door where a sign reads, Towels, Ten Crowns. I would fucking know. I would start the whole book over. I would start the whole book over. I would start the entire Lone Wolf series over if I had to. If I if I got towels for 10 crowns and I didn't have 10 crowns, fuck it, I'm starting again from the beginning. Should I chase this guy? It's probably a terrible idea. It's really, really a bad idea. God, it's a bad idea. I'm gonna chase him. I'm gonna chase him. It's a bad idea, though. I think we've established that. The man snakes his way through the crowd with surprising speed. He is fast and agile, but he is no match for a Kai Grand Master, and you quickly catch him. Your suspicions were correct. He is clasping to his chest an item from your backpack, the first item on your list. He took my slippers! Oh, hell no! My fucking shower shoes! I gotta get those back! Having been caught red-handed, this wily thief now tries to turn the tables on you. He screams at the top of his voice that you are robbing him. His wailing cries attract the crowd's attention, and soon you find yourself surrounded by a score of scowling faces all looking accusingly at you. Yes, and I finally get to use bardsmanship! Yes! Oh my god, I can sing my way out of this! All right, Bardsmanship, it's time for Bardsmanship. It's not that hard if you're a bard. All right, let's do this. Let's do this. Let's do this. You take hold of the thief roughly by the throat and using your Kai mastery to mimic his nasal accent, you say, of course, what I really do is I sing. Accuse your own brother of theft, would you? I'll teach you to go filch him with things when my back is turned. And with this, you slap him across the top of the head with the back of your hand and snatch back the item he has stolen from you. The crowd immediately loses interest in what they now believe is just an everyday squabble between two brothers, and they continue about their own business. The thief is struck dumb by the sheer audacity of your ploy. <laughs> sure he is! Imagine if, I, imagine if you stole somebody's shit, and they caught you, and then they started singing at you. <laughs> I would just be like, ah, fuck it, I robbed a madman, what was I thinking? Please take his stuff back, take some of my stuff, just get away, just get away, please. Of course he's struck dumb. Oh. When you release your grip of his throat, he scurries away into the crowd like a frightened rat. Sato says, I like to think that you turn to 286 and it says, you begin to sing a song about how you didn't steal anything and are immediately set upon by the crowd because why the fuck would being a bard help in this situation? No, because it includes acting ability. I just, I just did some acting there. 
All right. Wow. More bardsmanship, please. You walk to the south side of the market, where it is less populated. Here, sandwiched between a warehouse and a storage shed, you discover a small lodging house. A sign in the window says that there are clean rooms available, and so you enter to inquire about the price. You are greeted by a woman whose almond-shaped eyelids tell you that she is from Chai, a land far away in southern Magnamund. She tells you that a room here for the night will cost you three gold, three gold crowns, a price which also includes a morning meal. I might get some healing if I stay here. I'm a little suspect of a place that has to advertise that their rooms are clean, though. Our rooms, our rooms, very clean, very, very clean. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> when when you have to point that out specifically, it seems a little bit questionable. We might have a different definition of clean. But I do want to stay here for the night. I'm spending all my money as well. Lots of money is getting spent in this book. Maybe I'll get some heals. Across from the lodging house, you see a bathhouse offering towels for six crowns. God damn it. Don't. That's not even, it's not even funny. <laughs> Never forget the towel. Never forget. You pay the woman, and she hands you a key on which is stamped the number four. Then she points to a corridor on the grand floor which leads to your room at the rear of the building. As you are about to insert the key into the lock, you hear a suspicious noise coming from inside your room. Silently, you unsheathe your weapon, unlock the door, and then fling it wide open. The door bangs open against the wall, and a loud screech echoes from your room. This painfully sharp noise makes you raise your weapon defensively, but as you prepare to strike a blow, you suddenly see a startled cat come hurtling through the doorway. You smile to yourself and sheathe your weapon as you watch the terrified cat scurry along the corridor amidst a cloud of dust and loose fur. Hashtag I would dry for you. <laughs> Very clean trademark. Kai Journeyman with a grand mastery in sanitation and scrubbery stayed here last night. Well, I mean, uh, that's not that much more ridiculous than some of the abilities I took. Astrology. Herb mastery. Bardsmanship. Fire Snake is like the hipster Kai. He's like he like takes all the you know all the like lame ass disciplines that are like <laughs> you know trying to be cool and shit. Like it's like ironic, you know. Oh yeah, <laughs> I've devoted myself to the mastery of herbs. <laughs> Everyone else is looking at him like whatever, dude. As they're practicing with weapons and stuff. Other people are like blowing shit up with their mind, and fucking Fire Snake is over here like cultivating a little bonsai tree. Like, look at this, guys. He's Blazer's supplier. Nice. Didn't comment on how the Marines knew you were a Grandmaster. Did the Marines know I was a Grandmaster? I don't remember it saying that they knew that. The room itself is shabby but clean. You take off your cloak and equipment, wash from a cracked porcelain bowl, and then sit down on the threadbare mattress which serves as a bed. Now your thoughts return to your mission, and while you are pondering what may yet lie in store for you on the road to Elzion, you open the satchel containing the moonstone and bathe in the warm glow which radiates from this wondrous artifact. Well, maybe I, maybe I let them know during our travels, you know, once things started getting crazy. Maybe I had to, I had to uh, read them in. You use the Moonstone, gain zero endurance points. Yeah. Why am I bathing in this warm glow? Just for the lulls?
Suddenly there is a knock on your door. The sound gives you a start and quickly you buckle the satchel and stow it under the mattress. I don't have either of these skills, which are ones that I always had before. I started with both of these as Lone Wolf. In my very first book, I had Sixth Sense and fucking hunt and hunting. Because I knew that these were important to have, and now I don't have them because I have some dumb shit instead. Alright, here we go. I, don't, I possess neither of these skills, so I'm going to try to sing at whatever's going on here. It lights up Fire Snake's face with a glow that looks great on the stage. <laughs> Your basic Kai senses reveal to you that there is nothing evil nor hostile ex outside in the corridor. Yet the fact that someone is knocking on your door at this late hour makes you feel a little anxious. You reach for your weapon belt and buckle it on before you move cautiously to open the door. You inch open the door and see a tall, lean, gray-haired old man standing outside in the corridor. He wears the silvery gray robes of a magician, and his broad facial features are unmistakably Kakushian. Oh shit, not Kakushian. I don't know what that means. Forgive me for disturbing you at this hour, he says politely, but I felt compelled to make your acquaintance. My name is Rose. I am journeyman to the Magician's Guild of Nikesa. I sense the power within this room, and I thought perhaps that you might be a fellow student of sorcery. Am I correct? Actually, I fucking am. I got Magi, Magic, and Elementalism. I'm a fucking straight-up wizard, yo. And a bard. What's up, Boss Pie? Hey, what the heck is this? What the heck is what, Boss Pie? Who on earth changed the color? What color? Your sixth sense tells you that this old magician is genuine. He is who he claims to be. Your common sense tells you that he is also incredibly nosy. Listen, dude, I certainly do not have any moonstone here in my room, so... What the hell? Let's talk with him further. Maybe he'll heal me. He won't. Who changed the color? His name's color? Then color of theirs? Text? Uh... I don't know. I mean... Oh. It's different every book. I think. I'm gonna talk with him further. You decline to answer his question directly, for you do not wish to give him the impression that you are familiar with the ways of magic. Rather than reveal your true identity, or the reasons why you now find yourself in Bisutan, you simply say that you are a traveler who is on his way south. Hmm, mutters the old man, clearly bemused. Perhaps you have acquired something magical whilst on your travels? I am a collector of magical artifacts. In fact, that is why I've come to Bisutan. If you have anything of an arcane nature, I would be most keen to make you an offer of purchase. I'm gonna sell this guy the Moonstone. Joe likes to change the colors. He was a big into ethnic and diversity in his books. Is that right? Dude, the text is not purple. The basic text? You mean like this text? This is still black, like always. Only, the, only these lines right here and the actual links are purple. If you're seeing this text as purple, there's something going on with your screen that is not accurate because this is not purple. This is black. Oh, I do have an iron skull. Fire Snake, well, this flute has given me many magical performances. I have an iron skull right here. 
Let's do it. You invite the magician to enter your room, and after checking that the corridor is empty, you close the door. You can sense his excitement as you place the item that you would like him to purchase on a small table, which stands beside the mattress. It's the Iron Skull. Rouse picks up the skull and weighs it in his hand before examining its pitted surface. You can tell by his sour expression that he is disappointed. He had hoped for something more exceptional than this. After a few moments, he offers you eight gold crowns. You haggle with him, and finally you settle on a sum of ten gold crowns. So if I'd had these other things, they're worth a hell of a lot more, but of course I don't have them. Yeah, now how will I perform Iron Hamlet? Metal Hamlet. Well, let's let's collect my ten crowns, I guess. Next damn thing I'm gonna be is gonna be like, do you have an iron skull? Because you could use it for something, and I won't be able to because I sold mine. At least I can buy a towel now if I encounter one. See you later, frag guy. Have a good one. Thanks for stopping by. You try to sell him the Moonstone, but he quickly identifies it as a fake after he glances at your poor endurance score. You might have gone insane, Boss Pie. It happens. It's happened to all of us. Well, at least to me. I can't speak for everybody, I guess. Alright. Dare I turn to 349? Oh, it's so close to 350! Knowing that I'm that close to the end, but not really there. It's gonna drive me crazy. How about some healing for sleeping in this fucking place? How about some healing? Can I get some healing? Having concluded your business, Rouse gets ready to leave your room. But when he reaches the door, he suddenly turns around and glances down at the mattress. The strap of your satchel can just be seen. Are you sure you have nothing else you wish to sell me? He asks ruefully. Firmly but politely, you say no and bid him good night. The old magician leaves, and as you close and lock your door, you hear his footfalls gradually fading as he walks off along the corridor. Before you settle down to sleep, unless you possess the discipline of Grand Hunt Mastery, which I don't, you must now eat a meal or lose three endurance points. It's alright, I do have one more meal. I have one right here. So, I'm okay. No, it's not Lone Wolf. I'm playing a scrub character now. I started the New Order series, and in this series you're playing one of Lone Wolf's students. I'm not Lone Wolf anymore, so that's why I suck. <laughs> Noxmoo, footnote on 349. If you have taken Bardsmanship or Herbs Mastery, or God help you both, this is the furthest page number that you will get in this book. Probably. You wake shortly after daybreak to the appetizing smell of boiled eggs and cured meat. This shortly turns out to be your breakfast, which the landlady delivers personally to your room on a tray. Before she goes, you take the opportunity to ask her if she knows of any means of transport departing for Elzean today. She says that there is no regular transport to the Decian capital, but she says that there is a merchant's caravan leaving today for Hykus. It takes paying passengers, she says, but you better hurry if you wish to catch it. It leaves from Zakan's Mount in less than an hour. Am I about to miss the bus? Am I going to miss the bus? Because that's all, that's, that is not heroic. Fire Snake, Great Kai Grandmaster, misses the bus. Going to see you people later. Alright, have a good one, Boss Pie. Thanks for stopping by.
Take it easy. I figured that's what you were making a reference to, Saito. Like the Mad Hatter. But it just didn't really seem to warrant comment. Then you're going to go to the eye doctor. I mean, try refreshing your page or something. You really see this text is purple. The text that I'm highlighting right now. You see that as purple. Because it ain't. At least not on my screen. Quickly you finish your food and prepare to leave. Before you go, the landlady gives you directions to the Zakan's mount written on a scrap of parchment. Turn to 77. I like 77. I'm a little unhappy that I didn't get any healing from staying in the, uh, that inn. The whole reason I paid money to stay there is so that I could get healing from sleeping. Uh, I'm getting just jacked here. <laughs> she emphasizes paying, her tone quietly implying not street pharmacist bards like you. Ha 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 ha. Honestly, astrology, bardsmanship, and herb mastery. My character's a, a, a snake oil salesman. It sounds like the skill set of a charlatan to me. Step right up, ladies and gentlemen. All of your ills can be cured by this miracle concoction. You, sir, I notice you're missing an arm. Would you like to have your arm back? Just drink some of this. All right, let's go to 77. Following the landlady's written directions, you make your way through the streets of the city to a wide concourse which ascends to a knoll called Zakan's Mount that overlooks the south gatehouse. What's going on with the music? It just decided to stop for the lulls? What? Let's just do a little shuffle, 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 because you really need to hit shuffle more than once, you know. That's how these playlists work. You make your way through the streets of the city to a wide concourse which ascends to a knoll called Sakan's Mount that overlooks the South Gatehouse. Through the open gates, you can see the mighty bridge which spans the lower fork of the River Corda. Beyond lie the Bavari Hills, shimmering in a heat haze, and towards the horizon are the great Masoran Mountains, which appear like a jagged purple frieze joined to the sky. Standing in line before the south gates is a caravan of wagons drawn by sturdy dugas, the sand horses of the dry main. Many wagons are piled high with merchants' goods destined for Bavari. A rich cargo watched over by a dozen armed outriders in the pay of the caravan's owners. You approach a line of trestle tables set up near the leading wagons where passengers may purchase a seat aboard the caravan for the three-day journey to Bavari. Chalked upon a slate is the price of the fare, seven gold crowns. Alright, where the fuck is Bavari? Where the F is Bavari? Bavari, 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 Bavari. That's it? Seven crowns just to go to there? And I still have all that other way to go? I'm not impressed. I'm not impressed one bit. Ask me if I'm impressed. Are you impressed? No. Alright. I do possess seven gold crowns, however, so I guess fuck it. Because I sold the Iron Skull. Otherwise, I'd be like, nope. The Moonstone disapproves of your lifestyle choices, so it gives you no healing. It doesn't like Spoony Bards. Alright, let's, um... Let's do this. I hand over seven gold crowns. Of course I do. Why not? I'm made of money, apparently. 
you hand over seven gold crowns to a young ticket seller, and she paints a dot of indelible crimson ink upon the back of your right hand to indicate that you have paid your fare. Nobody could forge that. Displayed upon adjoining tables with dried foodstuffs and other provisions for the journey. You may buy some of this food if you wish at the cost of two gold crowns per meal. Okay, I'd, be I'd better do that. I'd better buy a couple meals. I'd better do it because otherwise... Actually, I could only buy one. I could only buy one. A few minutes later, an outrider comes cantering down the line of parked wagons, announcing to everyone that the caravan will depart in five minutes' time. With mixed feelings of trepidation and excitement, you take a seat aboard one of the spacious passenger wagons and make yourself as comfortable as you can for the long journey ahead. Saito says, looking into the moonstone surface, you see the words etched into its surface, make Somerland great again. Oh, God. God help me. Please, no. Buys all the meals. Isn't asked about meals for the rest of the book. Right, Noxmu? That is so how it's gonna go. So how it's gonna go. Buys all the meals. Next section, gets a bunch of free meals. Yeah. All right, one second. Okay, I'm back. All right, you'd think that being an herb master would mean you could rustle up some fruits and veggies. You would think that, but you would be wrong. Young city children wave and cheer as the caravan trundles out of Bisutan. I like trundling. Soon you cross the Great Southern Bridge, and when you look down at the sparkling blue waters of the Corda, you see there a flotilla of tiny fishing craft plying their trade. For the first hour of the journey, you content yourself with the view, and watch the lush scenery and picturesque villages of the river basin pass before your eyes. However, when the caravan enters the Bavari Hills, this pleasant landscape soon gives way to a more mundane vista, a seemingly endless sea of barren mounds and arid rocky outcrops. After a while, your attention turns to the other passengers, they are a cheerful group of Vasagonians who are returning to their homes in Bavari after family visits and business in Bisutan. You pass the time exchanging stories and playing cards. You learn that this caravan is regularly used by the merchants of Bavari and Hikas. They prefer to transport their wares by road rather than risk the sea voyage through the Bay of Sharks. Contrary to its name, you hear that there are no longer any sharks in this bay. They migrated to southern waters many centuries ago. One of the passengers jokingly suggests that the reason they left was because of the pirates. The bay is a notorious haunt of buccaneer fleets and renegade privateers. The surrounding country may be bleak and barren to the eye, but the road is good and the territory is safe. The merchants have established armed outposts every 20 miles, which help to deter bandits from raiding the caravans en route. The first night is spent at an outpost, and the second night a camp is struck at an oasis, where the road is joined by a track. This neglected track traverses the mountains and leads to the Great Masurin Trail, an ancient trade route. Many of your fellow travelers have been looking forward to arriving at the oasis, for it, enable, it allows them the chance to visit Temujin the Sage, the famous soothsayer of the Dry Main. I can say some sooth. I have astrology. If you need sooth sad, I can say some sooth. I'm just saying, I could play some songs, something. No? I'll just sit here and be useless then. 
And when the caravan arrives there, they hurriedly disembark. You watch with fascination as half of your wagon's passengers scurry towards Temujin's hut, which is pitched at the edge of a shimmering pool, whilst the other half gather about a blazing campfire and share their food while they enjoy a performance given by a troop of actors. I can perform. So here we have Temujin's hut. And a bunch of crowded people crowding around. Do I want to visit Temujin the Sage? Go to the campfire and watch the actors. That's what I'm thinking, Saito. Herb mastery clearly is focused on one particular type of herb. Saw how there's been so many inns and performers around, but no little bardsmanship opportunities. That is what I'm saying, Noxmoo. What the fuck? I thought I'd be like a traveling performer, stopping to do, you know, little impromptu drama and or music here and there, but no. Alright, let's visit Temujin the Sage. Why not? In the reverent way the passenger spoke about Temujin during the journey, you were expecting him to be either a very wise old cleric or a gifted charlatan. You take your place in line with the others who are queuing to enter his tent, and idly you listen to their excited chatter. While you wait, a young boy clad in a maktis of striped silk walks along the line collecting Temujin's fee. For five minutes consultation with the learned sage, the charge is two gold crowns. Wow. Five minutes for two gold crowns. Fuck it. I'll pay it. I don't care. I got crowns left. An hour passes before your turn comes to enter Temujin's hut. Awaiting you inside is an old man swathed in a silk robe. He wears a jewel-encrusted collar and a large blue turban that is wrapped impeccably around his frail head. He is seated cross-legged on a mound of pillows, and he cradles a sphere of rose-colored crystal in his lap. Without once looking up from his crystal sphere, he tells you to sit, sit opposite him and place any weapons you may be carrying on the floor beside you. When you comply with his wishes, he closes his eyes and begins to concentrate. A few moments later, he opens them and stares at your satchel with a look of shocked surprise. You sense at once that he has detected the presence of the moonstone. The frail old man begins to shake, and beads of sweat trickle down his wrinkled face. For a moment, his eyes widen, and then he faints and falls backwards among his pillows. Wow. Moonstone apparently knocks dudes out. Saito says, instead, Fire Snake has to sit in a shame corner with his bardsmanship right next to Garrick. <laughs> uh, the least it could have it could have the use of helping to keep your amount of gold crowns up. I know, but instead, it has the use of nothing. Alright, let's try to revive the old man. You use your Kai healing skills to revive the old man and calm his trembling limbs. Then you help him to sit up, and, when he has regained his composure, he looks into your eyes and says, You are one of the Kai, yes? You nod your head, and a smile deepens the wrinkles around his mouth. You possess a stone of power, a legendary stone. This time you hesitate, but you sense that it is a rhetorical question. The old man already knows the answer. Briefly, he searches among his pillows and retrieves a leather-bound tube. He flips open one end of the tube and tips a plain-looking ring into the palm of his hand. It seems to be crafted from petrified wood. Take this, Kai Lord, he says and proffers you the ring. It will keep you safe on your long journey. That which you seek to return must be delivered. You take the ring and place it in the pocket of your tunic. Temujin's ring. Sounds like something which requires a trademark. Oh, it's not rings. Just one ring.
<laughs> Frail old man wakes up. Oh my god, I'm fully healed. Fire snake, terrific. Limps out of hut. <laughs> the old man smiles once more, and although no words are exchanged, you sense that he is deeply satisfied to be able to assist your vital mission. Okay, that's one minute. Where's my other four minutes worth of consultation, yo? You thank him and leave his tent. Once outside, you walk down to the edge of the oasis to bathe your face and drink the warm, fresh water. The yellow flames of the campfire are glimmering on its surface, and you pause to consider joining the travelers who were seated around it, enjoying the show. I just had an image of Lone Wolf going down, or, or La Fire Snake, he's down there, he's on his knees by the, by the fucking water, and he's like, splashing the water on his face, and like, drinking, gulping deeply, drinking and splashing it on his face, and he looks over to his right, and just like 10 feet away to his right, he sees like a fucking camel just like, pissing in the water. <laughs> that is the image that just went into my, my head of what's going on here. Uh, all right, I'll go to the campfire. Why not? You seat yourself near the crackling campfire, and one of your fellow passengers offers you a piece of fruit, which you gratefully accept. Does, the he does it heal me? Does it heal me? You think selling the iron skull is a bad idea? Well... Probably, yeah. I'm probably gonna wish I had it. The troop are gifted acrobats and jugglers, and the performances they give are very entertaining. During their act, the leader of the troop climbs upon a large barrel and challenges the audience to answer a riddle. An old one-legged farmer, his wife, his dog, his horse, and his cows have a hundred and three legs between them. How many cows does the old farmer have? The leader is sure that nobody will answer his riddle correctly. He is so sure that he offers 10 gold crowns to anyone who could give him the correct answer in less than 30 seconds. Uh, one-legged farmer has one leg. His wife has two, his dog has four, his horse has four, and his cows. So, what do we have? Four, eight, ten, eleven... So the, the cows between them have 92? 92 cows, that'd be 20 cows plus 3 cows, 23 cows? 23 times 4 is 92. So 23 cows is what I'm coming up with. The leader is sure that nobody- oh, we already read that. If you would like to accept this challenge, use the second hand of a clock or a wristwatch to time yourself while you work out the answer. Yeah, well, I didn't time myself, but I don't care. I'm turning to section 23 now and calling it a day. The leader of the troop says nothing, yet the crestfallen look on his face is enough to tell you that you have answered his riddle correctly. Your fellow passengers cheer and applaud your display of mental dexterity as you walk to the barrel to collect your prize of 10 gold crowns. If you already possess the maximum number of gold crowns permissible, you share the coins out generously among those passengers who are traveling in your carriage. No, no, I don't share out shit with anybody. I take my 10 gold crowns and I hoard them to myself jealously. The show continues. But you are feeling tired, and so you return to the empty passenger wagon. Before you pull your cloak around yourself and settle down to sleep, you must now eat a meal or lose three endurance points. I have one meal left, so here we go. But apparently I don't get healed from sleeping again. There are 350 cows due to 327 of them being in the secret cow level at the time. Why is Fire Snake getting the crowns? I answered first. Damn Kai privilege. Fucking Kai privilege. You are woken early the following morning by the motion of the carriage. As you rub your eyes and stretch your aching limbs, your fellow passengers tell you that the caravan has been on the move for more than an hour. They are eating a breakfast of bread and fruit, which they generously offer to share with you. 
It is almost noon when the stone town of Bavari looms into view. Most of its sun-bleached shops and houses are contained within a wall of uncemented stone blocks which rise to twice the height of a horse. The road approaches a heavy wooden gate, banded and studded with iron, which is flanked by circular guard towers. Perforating the walls are slits for archers and openings for larger machines of war. The procession of wagons passes through the gate and comes to a halt in the middle of Bavari. As you disembark, you sense an air of excitement pervading this town. You overhear the other passengers talking and you learn that today is the third day of the Bavarian Gladiatorial Circus, an annual event which attracts the finest warriors of Vasagonia to come here and compete with each other in armed combat. Great wealth and status are the rewards for those who triumph. Disgrace and sometimes death await those who fail. You are curious to see this great event, and so you follow a group of passengers to Bavari's arena, where the gladiatorial circus is being staged. Entrance to the arena is free, and you take a seat on one of the many stone tiers that encircle its oval-shaped fighting area. Throughout the afternoon, several combats are staged between warriors on foot and on horseback. The heat of the desert sun is unrelenting, and by late afternoon you are feeling parched. During a lull in the contests, you hear the tinkling sound of running water, and you decide to seek out its source. You descend to the edge of the fighting area, and enter a tunnel which passes beneath the tiers of seats. Halfway along this cool tunnel is an open door set into the whitewashed wall. Through the doorway you see a bronze fountain standing in the middle of an empty room. It is richly embellished with engravings which depict ancient gladiatorial contests, and a stream of sparkling water issues upwards from a nozzle at its center, inviting you to drink. Hmm, this seems dodgy. Yeah, more performers, and I can't do any bard shit. That's true, Noxmu. You are desperate to slake your thirst, and so you enter the room and stoop over the fountain. You are swallowing the deliciously cool water, when suddenly you sense someone rushing at you from behind. And I'm going to swallow some deliciously cool water. Immersion time. Okay, I'm so immersed. Not literally immersion in the water, because that'd be crazy, but... I have a giant pool of water sitting next to me, and I just dunk myself in it now and then. Trust me, it's not as weird as it sounds. It's not as weird as it sounds. Alright, somebody's rushing me from behind. Um... Well, I'll draw my weapon before I turn around in case I should have to defend myself against a surprise attack, yeah. Your weapon is clasped firmly in your fist when you turn around and find yourself staring into the face of a tall and powerfully built Vasagonian warrior. His eyes are glowing with maniacal anger as he comes rushing towards you with his hands outstretched, as if his intention is to strangle you. Before he can utter a sound, he slams into your chest and impales himself on your weapon. This would be really weird if your weapon was like a warhammer or something. With a yelp of pain, he pulls away and turns toward the open doorway. He takes three faltering steps and then collapses and lies motionless upon the tile floor. I just accidentally killed a dude. Well, whatever, I didn't lose any endurance doing it, so... Can't complain. My name is Josiah and I'm streaming Lone Wolf from the dunk tank at the local water park. <laughs> yes! That strange splashing sound you hear now and then, just ignore that, ignore that. And the sound of, like, children laughing and shit. Uh-oh, I'm in trouble. Suddenly, six burly gladiators come rushing into the room with their swords drawn. How dare you enter the chamber of the font! Screams one scar-faced fighter. It is forbidden! Shouts another. Only warriors of Vassa lineage may enter here and drink the holy waters! There is further outrage when they see your attacker lying on the floor. 
The scar-faced fighter kneels and places a hand to the man's neck, and then glares at you and screams, He's dead! You've killed my dudes! We'll see you pay for this! Shouts another, and slowly the angry men advance into the room with murder blazing in their eyes. Desperately, you look around for a means to escape, but the doorway offers the only way of leaving the room. You are about to rush at the advancing gladiators and fight your way through them, with seven endurance, when suddenly you see something that stops you dead in, the tr in your tracks. I see the fact that I have seven endurance. A wooden platform! Another fucking giant lightning spitting spider! A dozen arena guards rush into the room and elbow their way through the gladiators' advancing ranks. They are armed with boar muskets, which they level at your head and chest. These primitive firearms are wildly inaccurate at ranges where a bow can be precise and deadly, but they are devastating when used at close quarters. Reluctantly, you sheathe your weapon and raise your hands in surrender, for, an attempt, for to attempt an escape now is futile. The gladiators surround you swiftly and drag you out of the room. You are manhandled roughly along the tunnel and brought before a distinguished looking man who is clad in fine white linen and jewel encrusted armor. He is Torvax, the owner of the dead warrior slave Malduz. The news that his finest gladiator is dead sends him into a blind fury. That dude was your finest gladiator? Honestly, your gladiators suck then. If your finest one runs up and impales himself on a sword and dies... <sighs> finest gladiator, my ass. Malduz was to fight at dusk in the final combat of the circus. Now Torvax stands to lose the winner's purse of a thousand gold crowns. In his rage, he orders that you be executed at dusk before the entire arena. The situation is looking hopeless, until, as you are being dragged away, you offer to fight for Torvax in Malduz's place. All I need is a, is a heal first, please. Just a heal, and I got this. Torvax, played by James Earl Jones, circa Conan the Barbarian. Oh, no shit, right? James Earl Jones was awesome in Conan the Barbarian. All right, pick a random number. If your endurance is 20 or higher, add two. I, it's not. If your endurance is eight or lower, eight or lower, and mine's seven. Eight or lower, and mine's seven. It's like they picked exactly the number they needed to pick to just to encapsulate my low endurance. I get to add, I get to subtract two, yay. I think right here the book's telling you, dude, if your endurance is 8 or lower, you ain't gonna win this fight anyway. Oh, look, and I got ex- <laughs> I got a 5. Minus 2 is exactly 3, which is the bad score. I'm about to lose the book right here. I rolled exactly what I needed to get the bad result. Uh, this is some bullshit. Torvax commands the guardsmen to halt. Then he swaggers over to where you lie, and he looks down on your fatigue-racked body with a sneer of disdain. Insolent dog, he hisses. You are not worthy even of public execution. And with this chilling remark, he signals to the surrounding guardsmen. As he walks away, they raise their boar muskets and take aim. Suddenly, an explosion of noise and color obliterates your senses as you are hit by a volley of musket balls. Death is mercifully swift. Tragically, your life and your quest end here in the gladiatorial arena of Bavari. And I didn't even die with honor and glory upon the sands. I died under the arena like a chump. Well, that's it. I lost the book. I guess we're done. We can't proceed. I have to start over from book one, I suppose. No. 
Here's the deal. How fast could I go through this book again if I didn't read anything? Pretty fast, I think. Pretty fast, I think. I'm starting over from the beginning. From the beginning! Alright, fine. I'm gonna re-roll the random number against this. I thought it was the Riddle of Steel. If you've ever owned a flute, turn to the back cover and burn this book. Alright, we're gonna try re-rolling this. Before I start the whole book over like a madman. <laughs> Even lower this time. Boom! Your life and your quest end here. If I could remember all the choices I've made. Alright, here's the deal. We're going back to the beginning, and we're gonna zoom through it. We're gonna zoom through it, don't even trip. Riddle of Steel would be copyright infringement. All right, so first thing we need to do, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. Oh, you're not holding up. You're not holding up, book. I need, I need, just need you to hold up. First thing we're gonna fucking do is roll, re-roll our fucking combat skill is what's gonna happen right now. Four? No, uh-uh. I take my four, I go through the book, I fail again. I start over. Zero? No, <laughs> definitely not zero. Three, that's what I rolled the first time. How come I can't get a good combat skill? Five is not acceptable either. Fuck it. Fuck it. I just keep re-rolling until I get a good fucking roll. Like eight. I can live with eight. What do I get for endurance? Five. I can live with five for endurance, too. I picked the same stupid talents, okay? I'm not changing that. I'm not changing that. I picked the same sword. Throw my money real quick. Seven. Twenty-seven crowns. All right, I take a bow. And a quiver. And six arrows. And a flute. Of course I still take the flute. So what do we take? Bow, quiver, flute. Two meals. Potion of Lomspur. I always want to keep something I can lose at the top. Alright. Okay. That's what we do. Now, we, we're going to zoom through this shit. We're going to zoom through it. Same sword, whatever, 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 whatever. 
You're saying something about my re- I didn't re-roll for an hour and something, though. <laughs> I just re-rolled a few times. Alright, we got the Moonstone, we go to 235, we go through this stuff. I look for him at the Good Shear Inn, blah 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 blah. I erase two gold crowns, begrudgingly. I keep moving, I keep moving, I keep moving, I keep moving, I keep moving. I don't have Grand Hunt Mastery, I keep going. I stay with Raker on the rear deck. I pick a random number. I got a nine. Hey, this is something different than I got last time. Isn't it? I think I need to go with like the same things I got last time. I got zero to three last time. Go through here, don't have Kai Alchemy. Uh, volunteer to lead the thing myself. Got the Iron Skull. Iron Skull. Keep going, keep going. Keep going. We meet her. I have astrology. I do some astrology. I keep going through here. Wait, what was that? Okay. I accept the, I explore the thing. I go to the cabin on the rear deck. I got nine gold crowns and a dagger. Again, all the same, all the same. I don't have Kai screen, I lose four endurance, it hurts, I say ouch. Here we go, there's the bullshit spider, I try to use a bow. I fire my bow at the spider creature, I think I failed last time. Yeah, I failed, so I used up an arrow. And then I climb the rigging to fight the spider creature, I use elementalism. Then I have to fight the thing. Okay, so we get to the point now where I can fight the fight the thing. I'm in daylight though, so I can get, I can make it a 39. And now we do the first actual fight again. Don't skip the part where it says that it doesn't matter how low you're. Yeah, that's such bullshit though. If you have really low combat skill, you are screwed in these books. Screwed. All right, here we go. 31 and 40, 26 and 38, 21 and 35. Oh, man, I'm getting my ass kicked! 16 and 32, 14... <sighs> no. Ending that fight with three endurance is not fucking acceptable. I reload my save game and start that shit again. I got my ass kicked. 31 and 40, 29 and 32, 29 and 22, 27 and 15, 25 and 8. There we go, that's much better. Then I'll start healing myself. I've used up one of my things. I used my bow. I think I rolled shitty. Wait. No. Yeah, this is what happened last time. One, two, three. Four. Five. I'm going to use up five of my things and bring myself back up to 30. Okay. And then I keep going. Then I eat a meal. I don't have animal mastery. What happened here? Did I... Ah, uh, yeah, the clang of the iron bell, right? We went on the hill track, we investigated the steps, I solved the riddle, but I don't remember, it was 2000, it was... I don't know, I did I went in there, but nothing fucking happened anyway, so we leave. 
keep going. Now I gotta fight these guys, right. So this is the second fight. Ace the captain here. It was 125. Yeah, exactly. I solved the riddle, but I didn't get to do anything because I didn't have Kai Alchemy. So nothing nothing changes there. So then we get back and I had to fight these guys. So let's um Let's do this battle. Again, I think it's daylight, so I can reduce them to 32. Hopefully I won't lose much health here. 30, 36, 27, 28, 24, 22, 18, and 5. Okay, good. I'm down to 18. I can live with that. Uh, I'll go ahead and drink this now. Boom. I'll go back up to 22. Uh, I ran back across the thing and attacked the slaver. I used elementalism. What happened here? I failed this. Oh, but it's because I had to... No, I failed this. Creepy baby hand. Yeah, so then I had to fight this guy. Which is where I lost all of my fucking endurance last time. But hold on. I'm going to heal up one, two, three. I'm going to heal up three more. Used eight. All right, now we fight this guy. All right. I reduce him by one because of the daylight thing, but then I had to add three to him for the first two rounds of the fight. So round one, round two... Now this goes down to 36, and we, and it still ends up terrible. It still ends up terrible. It really does, it still ends up terrible. Seems like there's no way to avoid it ending up terrible. So I, then what happened here? Not that. This, this is what happened here. I heal myself one, I heal myself two, but I lose two, so I'm still at five, and I've used up all my everything here. Fuck. We roll for a better outcome on the bow. How much endurance did I have right now before I started that fight? Oh yeah, right here. He said, come Grandmaster. I didn't notice that. Well, I guess he knows, obviously. All right, right here I had 21. I had 21 right here and I had used five of these, right? So if I roll this and I don't deduct two, I could get a better roll. I could get a five or higher. Your action to avoid being struck by the arrow is a success. The slaver and his archer cannot believe what they have seen, and for a few vital seconds they stand frozen in stunned disbelief. You seize this advantage and rush towards the platform with the hope of catching them before they can regain their senses. Yet as you make your leap, you see the archer drop his bow and reach for his sword. His blade clears its scabbard barely a second before you make your attack, yet he is able to turn aside your first blow. The skill with which he handles his blade leaves you in no doubt that you are facing an expert swordsman. Frightened slaves throw themselves off the platform as you and Zvolta begin a desperate fight to the death. Now this time I get to add two to my combat skill in the first round to the momentum of my attack. So... He goes down to 35, and then he goes down to 33 for the first round. So, first round, 
Okay, now the second round. And further, he's here. Oh, that's much better. I ended with 19 that time. It's a success. The slaver and the archer cannot believe the hacks and are stunned with their disbelief. Yeah. All right. Wait, hold on. I healed up one, two, three before that. So I actually have used eight. And now after this, I use nine. Ten, and I lose two. So, okay, so now I've used up all my things, okay? But... I'm sitting at 19 now instead of 5, which is much better. You are believing going to bring this up during The Witcher 3 when Josiah complains Quen cheapens the game? What do you mean? I'm not cheating. I started the book over. If I, if I, started, the, if I started The Witcher 3 over from the beginning every time something bad happened, then it would be the same thing. This is just like starting a game over and skipping through the dialogue, which is what I'm doing. Actually, in a game like that, you have a saved game, so you can just reload the save as many times as you want. And then I restore three endurance points. That's great. Alright, now we go now we come back to this thing and I'm gonna buy some stuff. What do I wanna buy? I wanna buy. I'll buy myself back up to six arrows. That's going to cost one thing. I'm going to buy three candles. That's two. Three. Four. Five. Six. Seven. I'm not going to buy the scented oil. I'm going to spend seven. Okay, then we go through here. Um, we go down to the beach. We see the whale. I give him one crown. We go through here. We go through here. I deduct 10 crowns and I'm very sad about it. I don't have telenosis. Blah, blah, blah. I meet Colostemi Ayu Siddhara. I go downstairs. I lose my weapons. Lose my weapons. Keep going. I reject Cole's offer. I choose the mountain road. I refuse to pay the price. I deduct one gold crown. I lose three endurance points from bad sleep. I'll keep going. I think I got the middle thing? I did, and I lost three more endurance points. Keep going, keep going. Take a closer look at the market stalls. Okay, now I buy Potion of Alather. And I buy a Potion of Lomspur. I drink the Potion of Lomspur right now. I go back up to 20. Make a purchase. I chase the man. I use bardsmanship. I spend the crowns to stay the night, even though it sucks because I don't get any healing out of it. Uh, I don't have those skills. I talk to the guy. I talk to him further. I sell him the iron skull. I sell him the iron skull. I get 10 crowns. 
I give say goodbye to the Iron Skull. I continue on my journey. I use my next meal. I'm out of meals. I keep going. I pay seven crowns for this stupid journey. Surely he has more than one Lomsper potion at his stall. It'd be nice if he did, but it just said he had a Lomsper potion. There's no money in Lomsper anymore. Oh, and now I can buy I can buy meals for two gold crowns apiece. One, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I buy two meals, okay? I buy two meals for four gold crowns. I'm down to five. All right, we go through this. We visit Timujin the Sage. I spend two more gold crowns to see him. I'm down to three. Uh, I revive the old man. He gives me Timujin's ring. I have that now. I go to the campfire. I win the the riddle. The number. The answer was. Do I have to seriously figure it out again? The answer was uh, like 62 or something. No, it wasn't 62 apparently. All right, one, two, six, 10, 11. That's 92. 92 is is um, 23. 23. 23. I get my 10 crowns. Now I have to eat another meal, so I eat one. Back to here. I continue. I go through here. I turn around quickly and face the per oh, I draw my weapon. He dies. He impales himself. These people are pissed. Now I'm back to where I was. That didn't take that long. I'm back to where I was, and I have 20 endurance now, and I have much better combat skill than I had before. So I actually have a chance of, like, succeeding. So let's make this roll again. How many times have I actually died? Three. Plus all the times that I went through the book and failed and re-rolled re because I started again in the beginning. So basically, infinite number of deaths. Well, not infinite, but a lot. Alright, this time I got a three. Seriously? Ah, but my now now my endurance is 20 or higher, so I get to add two. Yes! So I got it this time. I got it this time. James Earl Jones is pleased. Torvax commands the guardsmen to wait. Then he swaggers over to where you lie, and he looks down at you with a thoughtful expression fixed upon his lordly face. His eyes glitter darkly. You lack weight. I like my fighters to have weight of muscle, he sneers. But you have strength of spirit. I have seen gladiators who could lift an ox with their bare hands, defeated in the arena by puny men with fire in their souls. Perhaps you have fire in your soul, Northlander. Fire enough to win for me the victor's purse. Torvax signals to the guardsmen, and they pull you to your feet. Very well. You fight for me at dusk. You will fight Dromodon the Invincible, and you will win. Then he turns into a snake and slithers away. And if I lose, you say... Barely daring to ask the question. Then you die, Northlander. The final combat of the circus is always to the death. Alright, I got this. You like fighters with weight on them so they can impale themselves on any sharp object sticking out. Right? The guardsmen take you away to a dingy cell below the arena, where you are kept until the time comes for you to meet your opponent. You are allowed to keep your weapons, including your Kai weapon, but you are warned that the use of sorcery within the gladiatorial arena is strictly forbidden. Torvax despises magic, and any breach of this rule will result in immediate execution. This contest is restricted to hand weapons only. If you possess a bow, it is now confiscated, and you must delete it from your action chart. Fortunately, I've already lost my bow. 
Within the hour, the guardsmen return. It is time for you to meet your adversary. As you are led from your cell and escorted along the tunnel, you can hear the crowd above roaring with excitement. Then, as you step into the fading sunlight, you hear gasps of astonishment from some quarters. They come from your fellow travelers who cannot believe that it is you, the friendly Northlander, who is to fight Dromedon the Invincible to the death. They're like, wait, the bard from our caravan is fighting in the arena? What the fuck is going on right now? I don't know, dude. I thought that guy was just an herbalist or something. He didn't really seem to know what he was talking about. Why is he fighting? I mean, isn't he too spoony for this shit? <laughs> Saito says, I like Fire Snake songs, but he never does different genres. I prefer the eclectic tunes of Laser, Blaze, and Blazer. <laughs> the guardsmen march you to the center of the arena and leave you standing there alone under the watchful gaze of the expectant crowd. Minutes later, the crowd erupts when Dromadon emerges from the tunnel. Dun dun dun, Dromadon, Dromadon. Alright. Dromadon strides into the arena with his arms flung wide to receive the frenzied adulation of the crowd. He is a magnificent lion of a man, with broad shoulders and a mighty chest that ripples with bronzed muscle. So I'm fighting Conan. His grim face is stern and majestic beneath a mane of wild black hair, and he moves with the confidence and grace of a huge predatory animal. At first, he appears to be the very embodiment of gladiatorial perfection, and you regret that you should have to fight this heroic warrior to the death. But your regrets soon evaporate when you look into his eyes, for you see revealed there his true nature. Beneath the facade of his heroic exterior lurks a soul filled with evil. Your senses tell you that he is a secret worshipper of Nar. The Dark God has given him many rewards, his strength and his status. And in return, Dromadon has consigned hundreds of noble souls to an eternity of slavery and the thrall of Nar. Now you see him for what he really is, a ruthless murderer, a heartless killing machine, and all empathy with him as a fellow warrior is lost. This will be a fight to the death, and you must fight to win. Half the audience loses interest and goes home thinking this is ending with a sing-off. Alright, this Dromadon. That sword in his hand seems strangely small. He does have a dapper smile, though. Immune to all forms of psychic attack. Dromadon. He still has a lot of combat. See, now, if I had just showed up here before with my 33 combat skill and my 5 endurance or 3 endurance or whatever I had, I literally, it would have been impossible for me to win this fight. Now, at least it's possible. I mean, I'm going to get my ass kicked pretty badly, but it's possible that I can win here. Before, though, it absolutely would not have been possible. Oh, it doesn't matter if your combat skill is low, you'll be fine, it says in the... Yeah. <laughs> my ass. Okay, here we go. It is daylight, however, so I get to lower his combat skill to a 43. Oh, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to cheat and drink a potion of Alether right now. Boop! Yes, I am. Yes, I am. That'll lower him to a 41. You realize that Dromadon is truly the son of Kadak, arch nemesis. Oh god, I'm going to see Dromadon again in like four more books. Alright, here we go, let's do this. But round 1, 2039. Yes! I took 10 off of me, took nothing from me. 2029, go. 18 and 22, I can feel it, I can feel it, I lost 2, he lost 7. 18 and 22, go. I lost 5, he lost 2, oh. 13 and 20, 13 and 20, go. I lost 6, he lost 1. That's not good. Alright, round 5, 7 and 19. Come on, come on, come on. Oh shit, he's gonna beat me anyway! How much health did I have at the start of this shit? 2 and 17. 1 and 9! Oh, what's gonna happen here? What's gonna happen? He's gonna kill me with 2 endurance left. Alright, hold on. Skip that. That didn't happen. I started with 20? Is that what I started with? I must have, because here it is on 20. 
All right, let's try it again. Let's try it again. So that's another death. So the, the deaths are really adding up in this book. As I thought might be the case when I read the fucking new curing rule and the fact that you, like, your, your stats go way the fuck down. And you lose all of Lone Wolf's abilities and stuff. Man. First thing I'm taking, next book, first thing I'm taking is Weapon Mastery. You have to have it. You have to have it. Alright, so Dromedon beat me. I failed. Let's try again. Let's try again. Maybe the RNG will be in my favor this time. 20 and 39, go. I lost 2, he lost 7. 18 and 32. I lost none, he lost 10. That's great. 18 and 22. I lost 5, he lost 2. That's not great. 13 and 20. I lost 4, he lost 5. That's not really that good. 9 and 15. I lost 1, he lost 8. That's great. Come on, let's do this. He has crushed his enemies, saw them driven before him, and heard the lamentations of their women. Yeah, he, he has. He really has. Eight and seven. Come on, come on. All right, I lost four. He lost five. I could take him out here, or he could take me out. It could go either way. Four and two, four and two. Come on, round seven. Yeah, I beat him with two left. Just like he beat me with two left last time. Ha, Dromedon. I don't feel bad for cheating and using the Alther Potion either. I don't feel bad at all. Of course, I still might lose the book, because if, if I have to fight anything else with my two endurance and no way to heal... Right? I don't have anything. I've used up all of my ten points of curing. Fuck. Alright. But I did win, at least. The crowd roars with excitement the moment you strike your killing blow. Dromedon staggers back, blood trickling freely from his mouth, and he spits a curse with his dying breath before crashing to the sand. The crowd erupts with wild elation and the guardsmen are hard pressed to keep them from rushing headlong into the arena. Dromedon's corpse is dragged unceremoniously away, and amidst the screams and cheers, you are ushered before Torvax. He praises you for your fighting skill and bravery, and he offers you the post of principal of his gladiator school in Farufazan. Politely, you decline. It is customary for the winner of the final combat of the circus to be granted one request. My one request is that I be healed to full, please. Let me get like, you know, eight Alather potions or something. That's my request. Then you have to fight two more gladiators with 40 combat skill apiece. I wouldn't, I wouldn't even be surprised. Wouldn't even be surprised. You ask that you may be allowed to go free with a bunch of fucking not not Alather Lomspur. Just immerse me in a like a tank of Lomspur, like a back the tank from Star Wars. Just fill an entire tank up with Lomspur and let me just like soak in that shit. Torvax nods in agreement. He is grieved by the loss of his warrior slave Maldus, but he does not hold you responsible for his death. You accept and become principal for a couple weeks until you're forced to resign due to growing illegal substances in the gymnasium. I am an herb master. Herb master's got a herb, you know? Hashtag herb life. Before he instructs his men to escort you to the gates of the arena and let you go free, he hands you a silk pouch containing 20 gold crowns. I'll take it. If you had a bow confiscated before the combat with Dromodon, this is returned to you on your way out of the arena. Now listen. This is where I this is where I fucking <laughs> rules lawyer this shit. I did have a bow confiscated, and it did occur before the combat with Dromodon. It was quite a bit before, but it did happen, and it was before the combat with Dromedon. So technically, I should be able to have my bow returned, the one that was taken away from me by guards in a totally different town. Because, I mean, 
that was before the combat. Like, that happened, and then later, the combat with Dromedon happened. So surely I should be able to get my bow back now, right? So I could see myself making this argument to, like, a GM. And Joe Deaver's just, like, just shaking his head. Just shaking his head, like, heavy sigh. No, you can't have your bow back. Fine, I can't have my bow back. I want my bow back, bow back, bow back. I want my bow back, bow back, bow back. It's nice that he absolves you of Madusa's death after you have to do that fight to the death. Well, yeah, I just that's how I earned the absolution. If you had a bow confiscated at the outpost as Lone Wolf, it is returned to you now. All right, two endurance. What am I going to do about this, guys? This isn't good. If I have to fight anything else, I'm boned. <gasps> Herbalist shop. The moment you set foot into the streets outside this arena, outside the arena, you are mobbed by a crowd of excited citizens. To avoid them, you are forced to flee into a maze of alleys, and eventually you lose them in the town's east quarter. Night is fast approaching, and you sense that it will be completely dark within the hour. As you walk along a cobbled street towards the town's east gate, you glance into the front windows of shops and emporia that are still open for business here, despite the lateness of the hour. Alright, which is more likely to have more healing shit? A Gemo's Emporium? Could have anything. Could have potions. Or the Herbalist Shop? The Herbalist Shop seems like the best option. Silversmith Shop? Fuck that. The Herbalist Shop, though... It's probably the place to go. Although, really, a Gemmo's Emporium could have really cool stuff. We don't know. I think I'm going herb shopping. I am an herb master, you know. Time to herb up. As you step into this dusty little shop, you are hit by a cocktail of aromas that literally take your breath away. You cough to clear your throat of the sickly taste left by these pungent smells, and suddenly the owner of this shop appears in a doorway behind the back counter. He thinks that you are trying to attract his attention. A quick scan of the shelves tells your experienced eye that there are no herbs of great value or interest here. Most of the potions on display are placebos and quack remedies. However, as you turn to leave, the herbalist produces a black box which he opens for your inspection. Inside are the following potions. All right, well, so are we assuming there's just one potion of Lomspur here? It says there's a potion of Lomspur in there. It doesn't say there's more than one, but it does say if you wish to purchase one or more of them, I mean, that could mean one or more of the three different potions, or it could mean one or more of any individual potion. I think, I think, uh, you know, we really need to look at this as an opportunity to maybe buy more than one potion of Lomspur. Is that cheating? Am I cheating? I just need chat to tell me that I can do, that I can get away with this. It also doesn't say there's only enough for one dose. It's, that's true that's true well I mean how big is this box that he pulled out I'm just gonna assume I can buy as many as I fucking want I have 33 crowns. If I bought like five of them and drank them right now, that'd get me back up to 22. And like, maybe, maybe we'll get like six of them and drink them right now. That's 18 crowns. And then... We'll buy one more. Uh, 
And we'll buy a potion of Alather as well. So I bought six, seven, eight. That's eight potions. Fuck it, I'll buy two more. That'll be ten. That'll cost me thirty crowns. I have three left, but it'll heal me up. Well, no, no, that's I'll keep I'll keep a little bit more money. I'll keep six crowns. Heal myself to thirty. Take one extra and one alather, and call it a day. I'm glad we stumbled upon this place. This might have saved me. This might have saved me. You buy all three shopkeeper. Yay, I'm sold out and can close up shop now. Once he sells all these potions, he can focus on selling that blue kush. <laughs> Alright, let's leave the shop. It pisses me off that I didn't get to use Herb Master here, though. Because under Herb Master, it's like, you know the secret uses of herbs that other people don't know. There should have been an herb in here that it was like, if you have Herb Master turned to whatever, and you turn to it and it's like, you recognize this certain herb that everybody thinks is useful, but you know how to use it to do some rad shit. So, you know, you can get this now because you have Herb Mastery. This is a perfect opportunity for Herb Mastery, and I didn't get to use no Herb Mastery here. Fire Snake's skill set suggests he's a drug dealer. Well, that's basically... Yeah, well, All right. Let's go. Let's just go. I spent almost all my money. I'm glad I got a nice purse for winning the arena fight, though. But now we should actually be able to survive. Let's turn to 17. At the end of the street, you discover a tavern which adjoins the town's east gatehouse. It has a stables and a small blacksmithy, and the first floor has been given over to a rooming hostel. It is a popular place, and you see several people entering and leaving by its main door. Beyond this door, you discover a warm tap room with great padded chairs and tables of yellow Sienese elm. You approach the tavern keeper's wife, who is serving ale to customers in tankards made of hardened leather. You inquire if she has a room for the night, and she nods and smiles. Three gold crowns, she says. And for that, you can have as much ale as you can stomach. You pay her three gold crowns. Apparently, I, it just knows I have three gold crowns. Fine, I happen to have the crowns. But you decline a tankard of her ale. It has a peculiar smell that makes you think of greasy animal hides. Hold on. I gotta know something. What was in here? Oh, see, if I had gone to a Gemmo's Emporium, there was just a bunch of bullshit. So I'm glad I didn't. It has a peculiar smell that makes you think of greasy animal hides. That doesn't sound very good at all. Wanna hit up some Moonstone? I got a ball of chalk here, if that's more your style. You could have got a blanket. Wait, was blanket listed there? Motherfucker! I could have got a blanket. But then I would have, like, failed the book because I wouldn't have gotten the healing. Oh, I missed out on a blanket. Why would a silversmith shop have all this stuff? This is a bunch of weapons. Oh, because these weapons are inlaid with silver. You'd think they'd be more expensive than this, then. All right, here we go. Let's get. Let's move on with our business here. You are climbing the stairs to your room on the first floor when an old man bumps into you on the landing. He is wearing thick spectacles, and he is scrutinizing a strange box-like device made from cubes and tubes of iron, quartz, and grass. 
Brass. Grass? Wow. It's not made of grass. It's made of brass. When they were putting your corpse to rest, they could have draped your fancy new blanket over you. <laughs> Part of this device snags your cloak and rips it. He apologizes profusely and offers to mend the tear in your cloak. As you look into his bespectacled eyes, your magnetized senses detect a faint aura of magic. Hmm. Alright. This seems legit. Sido doesn't think so, but he seems legit. I'm gonna let him mend my cloak. The old man places his hand over the torn cloth, mumbles a few words, and when he removes it, you see that the fibers have knitted together and your cloak is now as good as new. At once, your magnetized senses tell you that he has used the Brotherhood spell, Mend, to repair your garment. Just a little trick I learned in Torren, he says jocularly. Then he raises his box-like contraption and sighs. Alas, tis a pity I can't use the same trick to fix this convexor. I was never much good with machines. He looks at the box and then at you, and a flicker of recognition passes across his wizened face. You're some lending, aren't you? He says, and then he moves a little closer and inspects your tunic and cloak. By the bells of Tef! You're a Kai! Well, well, bless my soul! And with this, the old man begins to reminisce about the part he played in the Darklands War, how the peoples of Northern Magnamund owe their lives to your illustrious leader, Lone Wolf, and how appreciative he is of the Kai's tireless fight against the forces of Nar. You're welcome. We do what we can. It is clear by his enthusiasm that he is honored to have made your acquaintance. When finally he finishes his gushing eulogy, he offers to buy you an evening meal. Oh, this guy's gonna get killed. Just like the mage guy in fucking book six. This guy's gonna get killed. Don't be too nice to me, mage guy. That never ends well for anyone. I'm gonna accept his offer, though. I am. Ooh, I got healed out of that. Hello. Over a delicious supper of fish roe and steamed vegetables, you learn that the old man's name is Uranai. Is Irenai. And that he is a native of Hikus. He was on his way home from Bisutan aboard his flying cra- What? His what? Take me to Elzion, bro! Aboard his flying craft when it developed a mechanical problem, and he was forced to make an unscheduled landing in the hills just a few miles to the south of this town. He is staying overnight at the tavern while the blacksmith repairs the convexor, the device that accidentally snagged your cloak. Yeah, because that sounds like the kind of thing a random town blacksmith knows how to fix. Mexican magical flying craft motor or whatever. Dude fucking makes horseshoes and shit. And he's like, ah, yeah, I can fix that. <laughs> when you tell Ir and I that you are bound for Elzion, he offers to transport you there aboard Samoom, his flying craft. To travel the last leg of your journey to Elzion by air would save you many days, especially as you have yet to cross the great Masuran mountain range. Oh, this sounds so good. I am down with this. Gladly you accept Ear and I's offer, and you agree to meet him in the tap room at dawn so that he can take you to the place in the hills where his craft Samoom is grounded, unless this is a trap, which is also possible. It's also possible this is a trap. And by possible, I mean likely. We'll see what happens, though. You wake early and take time to clean your weapons and equipment before going downstairs to the tap room at dawn to meet with Ira and I. Together, you leave the tavern and pass through the town's east gate as a bell in a nearby tower clangs five times. For a mile, you walk along the caravan route to Hikas until you come to a place where a fallen toa tree lies across a ditch beside the road. Irenai stops here and points to a gentle hill, little more than half a mile distant. I'm sure she's behind that hummock, he muzzes, and he sets off with you following patiently behind. 
As you reach the top of the hill, you see his flying craft resting in a gully below. It is a huge balloon, which is attached by steel cables to a basket that lies on its side. This is a little bit less of a flying craft than I, that I was hoping for. I was thinking like Skyship. Dude's got a hot air balloon. Which is, I guess, you know, better than nothing. A tangle of metal pipes and brass cylinders hang suspended in a cradle under the balloon, and several parts of this strange engine are dented and scraped, indicating that Ir and I must have had a bumpy landing. Oh, this is filling me with confidence right now. On reaching the balloon, you struggle to set the basket upright while Ir and I fits the repaired convexor. Minutes later, he turns a valve and the engine splutters into life. After a few bangs and wheezes, it settles into a chugging rhythm, and you both scramble to climb aboard as the balloon rises and hoists the basket off the ground. Samoom ascends rapidly into the cloudless sky. Soon you can see the town of Bavari spread out below you like a detailed map. The southern Vasagonian coastline with its inlets and villages, and to the south, the snowy peaks of the great Masuran Mountains. Your and I tinkers with the engine, and you feel the balloon beginning to drift southwards, towards a gap in the peaks of the great mountain range. I do not have Grand Hunt Mastery and Tenosis, although I'd like to say that every other previous book, Lone Wolf always had those two, or the lower level of those two. Starting from the very damn beginning, no. When is it ever going to be like, if you possess Bardsmanship and Herb Mastery, turn to whatever? Never. It's never going to say that. Fire Snake, where'd you get this flying machine? Old man, from Bainden's used flying machine lot. <laughs> I don't possess these skills. Let's go to our disaster. Irinai keeps an equal distance between the two mountains as his craft approaches the gap. But as it drifts near, you feel the air temperature beginning to fall rapidly as you get closer to the snowy pe- <sighs> Just got ambushed by an unexpected yawn. As you get closer to the snowy peaks, suddenly the basket is buffeted by rising air currents, and you have to grip the handrail tightly with both hands to stay on your feet. Your Magnakai tracking skills warn you that the balloon is in the grip of thermal air currents that are swirling between the peaks. These are being created by the coming together of dry air masses from the Bavari Hills and humid jungle air from the Desian Uplands. You warn Ear and I, but he seems unconcerned. It may get a little rough, he says, as he struggles to keep his spectacles from being shaken off his nose. But Samoom is built to take it. She'll see us through. Saito, you're expecting your wariness here to be vindicated. Well, it does look like disaster is probably going to strike. As if in defiance of his words, the basket lurches violently as the balloon is hit by a strong crosswind. Irinai is unable to reach the engine valves to compensate for this sudden change of direction, and to your mounting horror... Had to pause there for horror to appropriately mount. To your mounting horror, you see the basket drifting towards a jagged outcrop of rock. No, I got elementalism. Let's elementalism sh some shit. I control fire and wind. I got this. You muster the elemental powers of your Kai Mastery to create a countercurrent from out of the thermal updrafts, and you pray that it will be strong enough to blow the balloon away from the jagged outcrop. Random number, 20 or higher endurance I get to add two. Come on, don't fuck this up, don't fuck this up. God damn it! Motherfucker! Ah! Dick burglar cock milk fucking Damn it! God! Alright, fucking, so I rolled a zero, <laughs> as is my want, as is my fucking custom, as you can always expect me to do in a situation like this. I didn't pray enough to make it today, that's right, I didn't. Alright, let's turn to the failure section. The balloon lurches away from the mountainside, yet the effect of your heroic effort is dramatically short-lived. The crosswind proves to be stronger than your Kai mastery. 
Cursing your ill fortune, you brace yourself against the inside of the basket as the outcrop looms nearer. Moments later, there is the sound of ripping cloth, and you are jolted off your feet. Irenai falls on top of you, and you lie entangled together at the bottom of the basket. Then the balloon is suddenly whisked away from the outcrop by a second crosswind. You disentangle yourself from the old man and struggle to your feet. You can feel the balloon is rapidly losing altitude, and when you peer over the rim of the basket, you see the trees of the lower mountain slopes rising towards you at a dizzying speed. Irenai pulls himself up beside you, but when he sees shreds of cloth trailing from the punctured canopy above, he faints and collapses. Thanks, this guy's useful. Hurriedly, you haul his frail body over your shoulder. Then you place one foot on the rim of the basket and get ready to make a desperate leap away from this doomed balloon as the top of the mountain pines come clearly into view. Look, motherfucking Kai Alchemy. I have Magi magic and it hasn't asked me for it a single damn time. But Kai Alchemy, left and right, Kai Alchemy. Also made a thief flabbergasted by singing, so there's that. Yeah, only role of awesomeness has been killing that pirate leader with the bow. Man, I'm failing left and right in this book. Fire Snake sucks compared to Lone Wolf. He is such a scrub-ass guy. You know why he was sent on this journey? I'm probably the one with the decoy Moonstone. <laughs> that's gonna be the plot twist at the end. My Moonstone is the one that's a decoy, and I was the expendable one that could be sent. The actual Moonstone is going with fucking <laughs> Lone Wolf, or somebody that's trustworthy. All right. I get there and they're like, aha, it's a fake. And I'm like, what? What? You sent me with a fake? And they were like, what? You thought we didn't trust the moon moonstone to some herb master astrologer bard? <laughs> and all the fucking elder magi are there and they're gathered in the room and they're all just roaring with laughter. It was like a... <laughs> Thank you, Fire Snake, but this Moonstone has been in another castle all along. Yeah. Alright, I don't have a high alchemy, so how fucked do I get? With the old magician draped over your shoulder, you leap from the basket and plummet headlong towards the ground. You see the balloon smashed into the timberland barely, barely moments before you hit the upper branches of this pine forest. The old man is torn from your grasp and you lose consciousness as you crash through the branches of the trees. Motherfucking! Ah, oh, are you shitting me? Consciousness returns through a kaleidoscopic swirl of color and pain. Lose eight endurance points. Eight. And then they're gonna make me fight some tough ass shit soon, and I'm gonna be like, and, and I'm not gonna win because they made me lose all my damn endurance. Bruised and aching, you pull yourself into a sitting position and see the wreckage of the balloon hanging among the trees and scattered across the rocks nearby. What, Saito? Here we go. Here we fucking go. You told me so. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you did. You did. Yeah, you did. Congratulations. Bruised and aching, you pull yourself into a sitting position and see the wreckage of the balloon hanging among the trees and scattered across the rocks nearby. A few feet away lies Irenai. He is still unconscious and you see at once that his left leg is badly broken. Gingerly, you pull yourself over to his side and you are about to examine his injured leg when you hear voices calling you from among the trees. Three Vaqueros natives appear from out of the pines and come hurrying over the rocks towards you. You examine the old magician and discover that he has stopped breathing. He is near to death. It is only through the use of your Kai curing skills that you are able to make him breathe again and bring, back, bring him back from the edge of the abyss. You set his fractured leg, but despite your best efforts, you cannot return him to consciousness. The three Vaqueros tell you that they know Irenai and they offer to take care of him. They construct a makeshift stretcher from their coats and carry him to their settlement, which is less than a mile distant. 
You stay here this night and use your healing skills to save the old man's leg before you eventually settle down to a few hours sleep. But I can't use my healing skills on myself, apparently. It's making you happy, Saito? Good, I'm really glad that you're happy. I'm really glad. Super fucking glad. I'm glad that my suffering and failure brings you joy. At dawn, you awake to find him still unconscious. You are anxious to continue your journey, and yet you feel compelled to help Ir and I regain his health. You talk with the Vaqueros and tell them that you must leave, and they assure you that Ir and I is safe with them. I leave and they fucking eat him. They promise to take good care of him. They, off they also offer to give you one of their sturdy mountain horses, an old mare called Jenny, to help speed your journey southwards. Gratefully, you accept their generous offer, and then you bid them farewell before you leave their settlement by way of a mountain track. It is around noon of the following day when the track finally emerges from the foothills of the Great Masoran Mountains and joins the coast road some 30 miles from Hikas. In the distance, you see a village, and you ride towards it. At first, the villagers seem as friendly and as peaceable as the mountain dwellers who gave you your horse, but the moment they see you approaching, they immediately freeze in their tracks. Some drop the items they are carrying, and others begin to tremble with fear. Their greatest fear is bards. I'll stop and talk to these anxious natives, just because they look like they really want to talk to me. You call out a friendly greeting to the nearest villager, and you see his face blanch. He throws up his hands in alarm and runs headlong into the nearest undergrowth. This begins a chain reaction among the other villagers, who shriek with panic and flee in all directions. Within a matter of minutes, this village has been transformed into a ghost town. Bemused, and a little unnerved by their inexplicable reaction, you pass through this cluster of empty bamboo huts and continue on along the road towards Hikas. The fuck was that about? I have a feeling it's, this is, does not bode well. You sit around in the tent next to the old man, frowning as the moonstone brings him back to full health while the headache from your fall just gets worse. That fucking moonstone. All right, let's go. You approach the gates of Hikas, just as the last rays of sunlight are dipping below the western horizon. Bathed in the sun's afterglow, this ancient city port looks warmly inviting, and you cast your eye appraisingly across the stone geometry of its protective wall, its conical towers, and its pyramidal dwellings. Every surface is embellished with runic symbols, yet few remain legible, for thousands of years have elapsed since they were carved. The Vaqueros at the East Gate recognize your Kai tunic, and offer you a guarded welcome. They warn you that a curfew is in force and tell you to be off the streets by dark. You pass through the gate and follow a long shadowy street that descends toward the wharves and taverns that line the banks of the Carcos River, a murky, silt-rich channel which divides the city in two. Mindful of the imminent curfew, you tether your horse to a rail and enter the nearest tavern in search of a room for the night. Inside, the air is hot and stale. A small number of men and women of mixed nationality stand at the counter and sit at small tables. Their low-voiced conversations break off as you let the tavern door shut behind you with a bang. Seated at a table, approach the counter. Um, I'll approach the counter... The men standing at the counter move away at your approach, and one of them, a bilious rogue with close-set eyes and a cleft chin, casts you a murderous glance. I punch him. You ignore him, and ask the innkeeper for a room and stabling for the night. He says the tavern is full, and he suggests you look elsewhere. Chalked on a board above the counter is the message, Rooms, two gold crowns nightly, and hanging on a line of brass hooks behind the Empire's... The Empire's? Hanging on a line of brass hooks behind the innkeeper's back are seven room keys. 
Spaghetti Western music starts. Nice. <laughs> Fistful of Moonstone. Fistful of Crowns. The man is lying. Every boarding room in this tavern is unoccupied. I'm gonna, um... I'm gonna ask the innkeeper why he's lying. Why not? Don't you know I'm a bard? I can perform and stuff. But once again, not allowed to use bardsmanship. The innkeeper says nothing. He just narrows his eyes and his jaw sets rock hard. Then the rogue and his shadowy companions sidle their way back to the counter and move to surround you. You heard him, says one of the men. There ain't no rooms. Yeah, that's right, sneers the rogue. So why don't you be getting on your way, friend? And with this, he whips a dagger from his belt and stabs it into the counter. At which point the innkeeper looks at him like, What the fuck are you doing to my counter? <laughs> He glances at his companions, and instantly they reach for the hilts of their swords. Do you still have your flute? Yes, I do, Fry Guy. I have my flute. Welcome back. Good to see ya. What's going on? Alright. I'm gonna leave the tavern. I don't want a problem here. So much for hospitality! You quips sarcastically as you walk to the door. They're like, wait, you're a bard? A tense silence fills the cavern, and the innkeeper and the crowd watch you go with hatred and fear burning in their eyes. You are only too glad to leave, but when you step outside into the darkening street, you discover to your dismay that your horse Johnny has disappeared. Man, I've had a lot of horses stolen from me. Of course, I stole a horse too, so... Two men appear in the doorway behind you with swords in their hands. You decide it would be futile to ask them if they have seen your horse, and so you walk off along the street in search of somewhere a little more friendly to stay this night. I'm about to get arrested for curfew violation. It's like the most scrub-tastic thing to get arrested for. Ferris Snake sings Green Day's I Walk Alone while exiting the tavern. The incident at the tavern and the loss of your horse leave you feeling angry and confused. For more than an hour, you walk the dark, deserted streets of Hikas as you struggle to make sense of what has happened. You are passing a junction, where the cobblestone street joins with a light, larger avenue, when suddenly you hear the approaching tramp of booted feet. A stern but anxious voice calls out, commanding you to halt! And when you peer into the darkness, you see a dozen Vaqueros militiamen. They are armed with spears and throwing nets, and they are standing in a line abreast to seal off the avenue. Alright, I'll obey them. Yeah, Lone Wolf totally would have killed those dudes. You're right, Saito. Lone Wolf would have been like, let's f f f fuck this, come on then. But Fire Snake's like, no, I am a lowly bard with no way to heal myself. And mediocre fighting skills. I'm just gonna go... I'm just gonna go look at the stars and smoke some herb or something. I'm just gonna go obey some militiamen. Hashtag Kai Lives Matter. Warily the Vaqueros move forward to surround you. Their spears held out at arm's length, as if they are afraid to come too close. Their officer, a young lieutenant, steps a pace nearer, and you can see that he is sweating profusely. It is a warm night, but this is not the reason he is perspiring. He is terrified. Then he recognizes the style of your tunic. And when he looks carefully at your face, you see the whipcord tension in his body begin to ease. You're a Kai? Yes, you reply. I'm a journeyman bound for Elzeon. 
The vaquero signals to his men, and expertly they couch their spears and form up into a column, in readiness to march. Well, Master Kai, says the lieutenant, you're going to have to come with us. Lone Wolf would have sentenced the surly townspeople to be his guides and guards on his journey, right? The militia have orders to impose the curfew and arrest anyone caught on the streets after dark. As you march alongside the young lieutenant on your way to the city's guardhouse, you ask him why such stern measures have been imposed, especially in Hikas, which is considered to be one of the most peaceful and civilized cities of Magnamund. The people of Hikas are living in fear of their lives, says the lieutenant. For the past month there's been a creature stalking our streets at night. It's killed more than 50 poor souls, and in terrible fashion, ripped them to pieces. There isn't anyone who's lived to tell what it looks like, but everyone's got their own ideas. Some say it's a, ma a shape changer that goes about at day in the guise of a man, and changes into a beast at night. Others say it's come from Gorgoron, seeking revenge on the old kingdom for the death of its master, Agarash the Damned. I don't know what to think. All I know is that it walks these streets, and every night someone dies a ghastly death by its hand. Sada says, I want to thank you at the bottom of my heart for getting Josiah to sing all his lines, Fry Guy. <laughs> it's such a terrible idea. Everyone else that's watching this is probably not thanking you. They're like, fuck my life. Why do I have to listen to this shit? Suddenly, a terrible shriek echoes through the empty streets. A woman standing on the balcony of a tall building nearby leans over the parapet and calls out to the lieutenant. Down by the river! She shouts, and she points over the rooftops to where the shriek was heard. The fiend is struck again! Quick, men, yells the lieutenant. Follow me. If we're swift, we may catch the beast this night. They all agree on one thing, it's going to kick your ass hard. I know, right? Especially since I lost so much endurance from that fall. I'm a little nervous about my ability to fight some beast. Some mysterious beast. That sounds like something that's going to have an inappropriate, inappropriate? An inappropriate amount of combat skill. You run with the militia along the narrow twisting streets towards the south quarter of Hikas, where the townhouses of wealthy merchants command expensive views of the river Karkos. Again, a shriek pierces the darkness, but this time it is echoed by a terrible inhuman howl. The beast! gasped the lieutenant, and he turns to rally his men onwards. Soon the street ahead meets a towpath which runs along the riverbank, and you slow your pace so you can turn the corner. As you do so, you see a man dressed in his nightclothes, leaning from the open window of a house close by. He appears to be in shock, for he is sobbing and clutching fitfully at his disheveled hair. You stop and call to him, and slowly he responds. He sees you through his tears and points frantically to several small bundles lying on the towpath beside the gangplank to a barge. The lieutenant rushes past you and hurries to the first bundle. You see him drop to his knees and shake his head in disbelief, and then he turns away and wretches. You magnify your vision and see to your horror what the bundles really are. They are the shredded remains of two men, two traitors who have been dragged from their beds aboard their barge and torn limb from limb by some nameless creature of the night. Well, it probably has a name. Heard that Lone Wolf the Musical will debut on Broadway next week? <laughs> Lieutenant has to drag Fire Snake away as he succumbs to the irresistible sensation to serenade the woman on the balcony. <laughs> nice. Just barred things. Desperately, you scan the towpath and the buildings which stand all along the riverbank. If only I had Witcher senses. Then you see something, and your heart skips a beat. In the darkness of a narrow alleyway, two amber eyes glint in the moonlight. You sharpen your focus and catch the faintest glimpse of a dark shape loping away. This is like a werewolf or something, isn't it? There! You shout, and you give chase, with the city militiamen and the lieutenant following after. <laughs> the passage... <laughs> 
I'm just imagining how hilarious it would be if this guy really did sing everything he said. Everyone, everywhere he went, everyone would stop and just look at him like, the fuck? Did he just sing that? <laughs> no wonder they sent me on this mission. They just wanted to get me the fuck out of the monastery. They're like, for God's sake, can you do something about Fire Snake? Can you send him on a very long journey, please? Please? He won't stop. He talks in his sleep, which means he sings in his sleep. The passageway twists and turns like an angry snake before it ends abruptly at a junction where a wider alley crosses it from left to right. Quickly, you drop to your knees and summon your tracking skills in an effort to determine which way the creature went. Random number. Do you have grand passmanship? No, even though I always had it before. Telenosis? No, even though I always had it before. So here we go. Guess what doesn't help here? Astrology. Herb mastery. Bardsmanship. Fucking magi magic either has failed me. It's never come into play in this stupid book. Ooh, but I rolled an 8 naturally. I actually got a good roll for once. Whatever the opposite of fucking Price is Right losing horn is, I play that sound now. That's not a good... That's not it. That's really not it. Also, he keeps hotboxing in the vault. <laughs> Alright, here we go. 111. You enter the right alley, and the militia, who are following closely, split into two groups. Roughly half their number searches the other alley, whilst the remainder stays with you. As you are running along the, this narrow thoroughfare, you suddenly hear the sound of splintering timbers somewhere in the distance. A hundred yards later, the alley opens out into a tree-lined plaza, which is bordered by shops selling rare artifacts of the Old Kingdom and expensive works of art. Their windows and doors are securely barred and shuttered and show no signs of a forced entry. Then your eye is drawn to a grand building on the far side of the plaza. It is a temple. Its great stone door is closed, but a smaller wooden door at the side has been torn off its hinges. You magnify your vision and see that beyond the door is a flight of stone steps, which ascend to a bell tower. Ooh, this seems like a, an appropriately epic place to uh, fight the werewolf or whatever it is. Sound of Link in classic Zelda when he finds an item. Isn't it like... -na -na -na. Cautiously you approach the shattered door. You unsheathe your weapon and scan the darkened stairs before silently you ascend the steps. You have climbed 20 steps when suddenly you hear a hideous snickering growl and an icy chill runs the length of your spine. There is an ominous creak of stone on stone, and a movement in the darkness above, and then a crashing fills your ears. Out of the darkness, you see a great marble statue come smashing down on the narrow stairway. It rapidly gathers speed as it tumbles end over end towards you. Kai Alchemy again! Yo, Joe Deaver! You know, there are 16 fucking abilities in this game. You don't always just have to use Kai Alchemy every damn time. Kai Alchemy! The God Ability. If you have Kai Alchemy, you get to use that shit like eight times per book. What about Magi Magic, dude? What about Elementalism? Well, I have gotten to use Elementalism a little bit. It's the only one I took that was useful. Fire Snake really should have listened to his counselor and taken Kai Alchemy rather than Herb Mastery. Should have taken at least one more year of Spanish. It's really helpful in the job market. Yeah. C. Alright, no, I don't have Kai Alchemy. Fuck yourself. As the great statue tumbles down the steps, you try to anticipate where it will fall, so that you can attempt to leap aside and save yourself from being crushed beneath it. Random number, Grand Hunt Mastery. Don't have it. Add two. Current endurance is 20 or higher. I do have plat. So I get to add two. This is probably instant death if you fail here. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. All right, I got a four plus two is six, which is enough. I got enough. 
You wait until the last moment before you step over the falling statue. It shears the surface from the steps on which just seconds ago you were standing, but you escape unscathed. You see the statue finally reach the bottom of the stairwell where it smashes into several large segments which block the narrow doorway and fill the base of the stairwell with thick dust. Stealing yourself for what may lie ahead, you hurry up the stairs in pursuit of your prey, the Scourge of Hecus. You reach an empty landing, where a new circular stairway ascends to the top of the bell tower. I have Platt. Josiah 2016. I have Platt. What? Did I say that? I was thinking about stopping to drink this potion real quick. This Slomsper potion, in case I'm gonna need it. I mispronounced that as Platt. Did I? What, what was I saying I have that about? Oh, I have, I have Platt. I have Platt. I don't remember saying that at all. <laughs> Alright, I'm gonna just drink this potion real quick. Hold on a Geralt, drinking potions before battle. You reach an empty landing where a new circular stairway ascends to the top of the bell tower. There are two sets of fresh tracks in the dust here. One set are human prints, but the other set are unlike anything you have ever seen before. With your Kai senses alert to every sight, sound and smell. You ascend the spiral stairs. You are halfway to the top of the tower when you hear a man's voice whimpering for help. It sounds as if he is trapped somewhere near the top of the stairs. You raise your weapon and quicken your pace until you arrive inside the bell chamber. Here a great bronze bell hangs suspended by chains from the apex of the tower. Something moves in the shadows away to your left, and you raise your weapon in readiness to strike out, but you stay your hand when you see that it is a bearded man. He is dressed in the robes of a cleric of the temple, and he is cowering in fright. Cowering with fright. He sees you and points to the bell. It's... it's there. Behind the bell. For a sheer sake, help me. Help me. I don't have Grand Hunt Mastery or Telegnosis, so... I don't have Platt. I don't have Platt. Durance. It's there! Behind the bell! For a sheer sake, help me! Blah blah blah! Macron is a bitch! So I just said Durance, so I was trying to do a little Durance there. If you possess neither of these skills, turn to 297. That's where I have to turn. What? What? You move nearer to the trembling man and try to calm him with soothing words and a promise that you will protect him. <laughs> Okay, judging from Lone Wolf's career, that is not a promise Akai should ever make, because people die left and right around you. You look to the bell and use your sixth sense as an, in an attempt to locate the creature, but you can detect nothing unusual. Then you hear a faint gurgling growl, and a knot of fear tightens in your throat. Now you can detect a powerful aura of evil. You glance at the cowering cleric, and your fear becomes an icy terror when you realize that he is the source of this evil. He continues to plead with you to save him, but then he sees the shock register on your face and he abandons his pretense. On my flute, I swear I will protect you, says Noxmu, yeah. The pupils of his eyes shimmer and become spheres that glow darkly amber, and in a terrifying instant, his body transforms. 
One moment, he is a bearded holy man, and in a split-second blur, he becomes a snarling hulk of black fur death. With a breathtaking speed, he leaps at you and slashes at your throat with his razor-sharp talons. Instinct makes you propel yourself backwards to avoid these deadly claws. And as you spring away, you slip and tumble headlong down the spiral stairs. That's the, the monster doesn't kill you. You die from falling down the stairs and breaking your neck. Kind of a bit like Monk. Wherever they go, people are butchered. So those are some serious claws there. Alright, so he's like a were-bear thing. Man-bear-pig. Pick a random number, alright. I got a five. That's probably not too bad, right? Oh, fuck. Here we go. The creature leaps upon you as you are falling backwards, and you tumble down the circular stairs, locked together in a deadly embrace. It hits the floor of the landing below, and its body cushions your impact, enabling you to recover quickly and unsheathe your weapon. The creature is momentarily stunned by the fall, and you seize the opportunity to attack it before it can get to its feet. Stunned Deathstalker has a 38 combat skill and 38 endurance. Alright. I can ignore any endurance losses sustained in the first round of combat. It's immune to mind blast. I'm not in daylight anymore, unfortunately. We saw Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. During Kai movie night and have the skill of bardsmanship turn to page 52 to try to put it to sleep like that three-headed dog in the movie. I have seen Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. I think I've seen it twice, actually. I do remember the three-headed dog vaguely, but I don't remember what they did to make it sleep or whatever. Just because he has a lot of body hair? Yeah. And giant claws. Just because he has a lot of body hair and he doesn't like to clip his fingernails, we ain't gotta judge. All right, here we go. 38. I can't reduce it by anything. So here we go. This is gonna hurt me. It's gonna hurt me. 28, 38. All right, so I get my... those two back. 28, 31. All right, this is going good. This is going good. 28, 21. All right, 2318. All right, that's acceptable, I guess. 2318. 1913. Ugh, this is rough. 1913. Yes! I lost none and he lost 12. That's good. Please, last round. Please just don't let me lose any more endurance, okay? Okay, please. Yeah! I barely lost any endurance there. I mean, I lost some, but not that much. Man, if only there were two of them, my fighting two gladiators with 40 CS apiece would look prescient. Yeah, I mean, you basically predicted the future, except for the fact that there's not two, and except for the fact that it's not a gladiator, and except for the fact that it has 38 combat skill and not 40. But beyond that, though, you called it, bro. <laughs> All right, I won. That's what's important here. <sighs> okay, made it. Just tell me there's nothing else. I don't want to fight anything else. I'm too weak. The creature emits a desperate howl as your last mighty blow seals its doom. It lurches at you, its eyes white in their red-rimmed sockets, its great clawed arms swinging blindly. And then this supernatural horror surrenders to death and is brought crashing to the floor. For a few moments, its great body convulses and then lies still. Wisps of evil-smelling gas arise from beneath the fur, and you are forced to snatch your cloak to your face to deaden the sickly sweet stench of decay. You turn and hurry down the stairs in time to see the lieutenant and his militia breaking through the rubble which blocks the exit from the bell tower. 
His men ascend the stairs and remove the vile, rotting remains of the Death Stalker, which are placed upon a pyre outside in the tree-lined plaza. Soon the carcass of this murderous creature is ablaze, and word of its death spreads swiftly across the city. The curfew is lifted, and a large crowd comes and gathers around the dying embers of the pyre to cheer and rejoice in the destruction of the creature, which, for the past month, has murdered their kinfolk and terrorized their peaceful city. And I go find that one fucking innkeeper guy, and I say, you got a room for me now, motherfucker? Yeah, that's what I thought. Don't you feel bad about not giving me a room now? I just saved your town. Sorry if your CS prediction was off by two points. Yeah, that's not acceptable, Saito. I expect better from you. I expect better. Sorry I didn't pick astrology. I picked useful disciplines. <laughs> Fucking astrology. Astrology I got to use once and it wasn't very useful at all. Herb mastery I've never gotten to use. Bardsmanship I got to use once and it was okay, but only once. And and elementalism I've gotten to use a few times, but it hasn't exactly been mind blowing. All right, terrorize their peaceful city. Go. Upon hearing the news that you have slain the Death Stalker, the mayor of Hika summons you to his grand hall in the city's north quarter. Proudly, the Vicaros lieutenant and his militia escort you across the city, and during your march you receive the adulation of the grateful populace. The mayor hails you as the savior of Hikas, and he bestows upon you the freedom of the city. At least you got to learn that Fire Snake is biased against snakes. Oh yeah, right, because the snake was like sinister or something, treacherous. The freedom of the city. Does that mean I get to, like, actually stay in an inn or something? Because I kind of got treated roughly by your peoples. He decrees that the plaza, where the remains of the Death Stalker were destroyed, shall from this day forward be named after you in perpetual honor of your brave and gallant deed. Now they're going to call it Fire Snake Plaza? Nice. Nice. You are invited to stay at the Grand Hall and feast with the mayor and the other dignitaries of the city. You accept the invitation and enjoy a sumptuous meal. Restore three endurance points. I like it when I get those he heels. Early the next morning, the mayor presents you with a fine white stallion to help speed your journey to Elzion. You thank him for his generosity, and shortly before noon, you ride out through the gates of the Grand Hall. Go south along the Avenue of the Sun, and cross the Bridge of Lanterns, which spans the city's river. Citizens cheer as you pass through the southern quarter, and they alert the guards at the busy south gatehouse, so that by the time you arrive there, you are able to ride through without delay. Fire Snake Plaza sounds like some kind of brothel in North Vegas. <laughs> Means you can sleep in the streets without the militia harassing you. Oh yeah, fucking cops. They always come and wake you up. You can't sleep here. Motherfucker, can you not see? The fact that I'm sleeping here should indicate to you that my life is kind of fucked. I obviously don't have anywhere else to sleep. What do you want me to do? Cops should fucking leave homeless people the fuck alone. It's not like, you know, if you see somebody sleeping in a fucking doorway or something, it's not like they've got a nice home to go back to and they just didn't feel like it, so they're fucking sleeping in that doorway instead. I guess in some a few strange cases involving alcohol and or fights with one's significant other, that something like that could be possible, but in general, no. All right. Citizens cheer as you pass through the southern quarter, and they alert the guards at the busy south gatehouse, so that by the time you arrive there, you are able to ride through without delay. A mile beyond the south gate, the road ascends to a ridge where you stop to look back at Hikas for the first time, the last time. It's the last time, but it's like the first time. Every time I look at Hikas, it's like the first time. Heart Hikas. I left my heart in Hikas. 
It is a warm and windy morning, and as you cast your gaze across the rooftops and towers of the ancient city, the sultry breeze howls like a wild animal. For a few moments, you feel a chill in your blood, for the sound reminds you of the Deathstalker's ghastly cry. But then you shake your head and dismiss it. The creature is dead, and there are still many miles left for you to travel before your quest is done. You salute the city farewell and set off at a brisk pace along the weather-beaten road that leads to Golago. Where the fuck is Golago? Golago, Golago, oh, oh, oh. Just need to check this real quick. Picus. Golago. Why am I even going to Golago? Look at the map. Oh, you can't really see this because it's covered by the book cover. Calling it, there's another Death Stalker. That was way too much foreshadowing. There's not another Death Stalker, Saito. Sleeping in a doorway. Oh, they chose Bartsmanship in life. <laughs> oh, isn't that the fucking truth? Wow. Bardsmanship, well, at least it will help you when you have to busk for coins on the street. <laughs> uh, look. I'm in Hikus, okay? Elsian's down here. Why the fuck am I even going to Galago? To come down here? Why can't I just... I mean, I... If I can't cut across overland, fine. But at least can't I just take this road right here? Like... Like, this is way the fuck out of my way. Why am I even going to Golago? Will you take me to Golago? Will you take me to Golago? The road from Higus to Golago is an ancient trail which crosses rich plantations of tropical crops that are cultivated by the Vaqueros and then meanders through wild expanses of jungle that have for centuries defied all attempts at cultivation. As you ride this lush road, you are reminded of your history lessons at the Kai Monastery, and you recall some of the things you were taught about this ancient realm. Desi is ruled by the Elder Magi, who are all that remain of a race of great magicians who once ruled Central Magnamund thousands of years ago. They were the first practitioners of magic upon this world, and they were wise and powerful leaders until their numbers were decimated by a great plague that was released by their enemies, the center druids of rule. Yeah, those guys are assholes. The performers in the other city talked about some rock concert in Golago, so Firesnake decided to go there. Golapalooza. <laughs> Nice. Those who survived sought refuge here in fertile Desi and have lived here ever since. At noon, you reach a place where the road passes beside a majestic waterfall, and you stop here to rest your horse and enjoy the beautiful scenery. Oh, do I have a meal? See, oh, I do. Great. Okay, good, then. I was going to say, you know, when they were giving me all these feasts and the celebrations back in fucking town, couldn't they have given me some food to take with me? Seriously? Alright, I eat. I enjoy the scenery. Then you continue your ride and your strong horse makes excellent progress, carrying you all the way to the coastal town of Golago to arrive there shortly before sunset. Saito says, that freaks me out how sometimes Josiah will start laughing, then suddenly becomes very quiet for a period, before simply saying, nice. <laughs> that doesn't sound like something I do. That's ridiculous. <laughs> nice. You are in good spirits when you reach the ancient gates of Golago. Your day's ride has been swift and enjoyable, and you are looking forward to beginning the final leg of your journey, 
to Elzion tomorrow at first light. You are now only two days' ride away from that wondrous city. The town of Goligo has a mysterious and exotic aura. Its ancient streets are cobbled with lime green stone, and ornate structures of vivid vaqueros art embellish every building and street corner. There is a festival taking place here tonight, and the town is in a lively carnival mood. As you ride down a steep, narrow street towards the beach, you can see a crowd of native vaqueros are gathered there in brightly colored costumes. Some wear elaborate headgear made from lacquered wood and feathers, and others are covered from neck to ankle with garments made from vibrant jungle blooms. There is a full moon tonight, and the people of this town are celebrating the fertility of their land with ritual offerings of food and wine to the goddess Ashir. So these people are having fun. This sounds like a party town. It's like Mardi Gras up in here and shit. It is a joyous festival, and everyone on the beach is smiling and happy. Women up on balconies on the second level are flashing their tits at the crowd for no discernible reason. Gulligan Wild. There's a festival everywhere. Of course there is. Townsfolk would have given fire snakes some food, but all they had was roasted death stalker meat. <laughs> death stalker, that's what's for dinner. Do I want to go to the beach and join in the festival? Let me guess, that'll be yet another opportunity not to use bardsmanship when it would make sense for me to do so. So yeah, let's go to the festival. The peace brought about by the Moonstone. Yeah, everywhere the Moonstone goes, there's a festival. Conflagration Man, 5055. It's like 5083 or something. I expected you to know the exact year, Saito. I expected you to. It's 5083. Wow. 5055. Don't don't talk to me about man. The 5050s were a crazy time. Okay. What? Well, hold on. When was he, when was when was? Uh, it says when he was born. Fire snake. It says when he was born. Where is it? I remember it said somewhere. Well, he was 20 years old, so it was 20 years before this. Yeah, 5063. So 5055, Fire Snake wasn't even born yet. Alright, let's, let's go join the festival. You tie your horse's reins to a post driven into the ground at the edge of the beach. And then you walk across the fine white sand and pass among the throng of dancing, singing people. A pulsating rhythm of native drums provides the music to which they move and play. You are caught up in a procession of gaily dressed vaqueros, who are each carrying baskets piled high with exotic fruits, works of art, and intricate wood carvings inlaid with semi-precious stones. To the rhythm of the drums, they carry you with them towards a wooden platform constructed- Ah, oh, a wooden platform! Lone Wolf would be freaking the fuck out right now. A wooden platform constructed near the middle of the beach. There, they place their offerings to the goddess Ashir. When you find yourself standing at this platform, at the head of the procession, suddenly the drumming stops. Everyone who has approached the platform before you has made an offering, and yet your hands are empty. Suddenly, it is as if the eyes of the entire town you are watching are watching you in expectation, and you feel compelled to make an offering. Or I can leave the festival by turning to 321. What do I want to offer? <laughs> Special item. I'm going to give him the Moonstone. Fuck you. I just beat all y'all's offerings. Offering champion right here. Right here. Who's the best offering guy? This guy. Just give him the Moonstone. Uh, I'll offer a back... I don't think I really have any gold crowns. I have three, which is probably not enough. I'll offer a backpack item. Yeah, 
As you place your offering upon the platform, you are refreshed by a surge of vitality and filled with an unexpected sense of well-being. You may restore three lost endurance points for each backpack item that you place upon the offerings platform. Yes, healing! What am I doing here? So I'm down 13 points. I could use about... I could use about nine points of healing probably and that'd be good. So let's get rid of this ball. Let's get rid of these fucking slippers. And... These candles. And this ball of chalk. And I'm going to heal myself up to 31. Lay down a line of chalk to a shear. <laughs> I get what you're saying there. You're, you're implying that chalk is cocaine. It's funny. You spend an hour enjoying the Carnival Spirit of the Beach Festival before you return to your horse and go in search of a place to stay for the night. You ride along a street running parallel to the beach and enter the courtyard of a large two-story hostel with stables. A young boy takes your horse's reins and leads him away to an enclosure at the side of this brightly painted building, and you enter the hostel's front door to find it is empty. Now I've got to sign up to, like, do a chore or something. I just use elementalism for whatever it is. I don't remember the last time I got the best room. I do remember it being disappointing, though. It seems that everyone is down at the beach this evening. Then you hear a noise from beyond an open doorway, and a balding man appears. He rubs his bloodshot eyes and yawns, revealing a mouthful of gold teeth. I punch him. You ask if he has a room for the night, and lazily he nods his head. Like, dude. It's prestigious for you to have me here. I'm the savior of whatever that last town was. They named a plaza after me and shit. I have two types of room and service, he says. There's standard and there's best. Standard costs two gold crowns a night and you don't get no food. Best costs four gold crowns and you get lots of food in the morning. Here's the problem. Here's the problem. One, I can't afford best room. I only have three crowns. But if I don't get best room, I'm not going to get any food, which means I'm going to starve to the tune of three fucking points of damage. Says you could barter a weapon, backpack item, or special item at your discretion. Hmm, really? I don't really want to give up any of my items particularly. So, I'm gonna have to take, uh, the shitty room. And have one crown left. Standard room for the night. The hostel keeper pockets your crowns, and leads you up a flight of rickety bamboo stairs to a corridor which is hung with gaudy tapestries. He points to the first door on the left and then bids you good night. What about my key? You say. He looks at you and shrugs. No key, he says, and then he turns away and shuffles back down the stairs. <laughs> hey, uh, is she here? Can I get a candle back there? You push open the door to find a small clean room with a bed and bamboo table. Random number time, I guess. Oh good, a four. I get the lower result. That's what I like to see. 
You enjoy a restful sleep at the hostel, and you wake at daybreak to the sound of voices and the crashing of iron pots and pans. Your room is located above the kitchens, and through the cracks in the bamboo floor, you can see the owner and his wife preparing food for breakfast. What about my key? It's off, the hostel keeper replied. <laughs> isn't, that the, isn't that the truth, man? Your room is located above the kitchens and through the cracks in the bamboo floor. You can see the owner and his wife preparing food for breakfast. You put on your cloak and gather up your equipment before going down to the paddock to collect your horse. Amazingly, your horse isn't stolen this time. What? The hostel keeper waves farewell from the kitchen window as you mount your horse and canter away across the courtyard. I do like to canter across some courtyards. And I'm about to starve. Why couldn't I have bought some food or something? Got some food at the festival. The early morning streets of Golago are empty as you ride towards its southern gate. Most of the inhabitants are sleeping off last night's celebrations, and nobody sees you leave the town and set off along the jungle trail to Elzion. For most of the morning, your view of the surrounding land is restricted by the dense walls of verdant foliage that border upon this ancient trail. It is not until noon, when you crest a ridge of high ground, that you catch sight of what lies beyond the seemingly endless jungle. Less than a mile to the north is the titanic chasm of Gorgoron. It is a dark and forbidding sight, like a deep festering wound in the land that time has been unable to heal. Its sheer walls and immeasurable depth call to mind images of the Machen Gorge, a dread chasm which lies to the south of your homeland province of Ruin, Ruinon. We just learned another bio fact about Firesink, apparently he's from Ruinon. Legend says that these vast canyons are scars inflicted upon the flesh of Magnamund by the vengeful hand of Nar. Beyond the ridge, the trail descends to the ruins of an ancient town. Here you stop to rest your horse and drink from a pool of clear water that bubbles freely from the loamy soil. Unless you possess Grand Hunt Mastery, you must now starve and lose three endurance points. You continue your ride along the jungle trail and make good progress, although you are haunted all the while by a profound sense of unease. You attribute these feelings to the sight of Gorgoron. You have heard many dark tales about this chasm, which, until now, you had dismissed as nothing more than fanciful ghost stories. Having seen the chasm with your own eyes, you were no longer so ready to disbelieve them. At sundown, you reach the palmy fringes of an ancient settlement that surrendered to the jungle centuries ago. The moon rises like a silver shield in the cloudless night sky, and you make camp at the side of the trail, sheltered beneath a canopy of mosses and vines. The jungle is alive with the tiny noises of its nocturnal creatures. They seem to make your horse unusually nervous until you soothe him with your magnetic skills of animal control. You are tired after your long ride through this humid rainforest, and soon you drift off to sleep. It seems as if you have only just closed your eyes when you are stirred to instant wakefulness by the sound of a ghastly howl. Great. That sounds good. That sounds super good. What? 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 I say what? Saito was right? You sit up with a start and reach instinctively for your weapon. Your horse is neighing wildly. He rears up repeatedly on his hind legs and fights to break the reins which hold him fixed to a tree. He is clearly terrified of something from which he cannot escape. You wipe the sleep from your bleary eyes and scan the darkness, and then you see the object of his terror, and your blood freezes in your veins. Creeping slowly from the shadowy undergrowth is the Death Stalker. His amber eyes blazing like two evil gems. Fuck yourself, Zyno. <laughs> I know what you're gonna say. Have you read this? You've read this. You've already read this past me, haven't you? You've read them all?
I think you cheated. Kadak the Death Stalker, nice Knox, for real. I shall name you Kadak. No, you haven't? Creeping slowly from the shadowy undergrowth is the Death Stalker, his amber eyes blazing like two evil gems. At first, you cannot believe what you are seeing. The beast is dead. You saw the flames consume his carcass. Then the realization strikes you that this is not the beast you slew in Hikas. This is his mate. She has hunted you, and now she comes for you in the dead of night, and she is ravenous for revenge. Mmm, tasty revenge. Alright, another scary death stalker coming at me. I'm not ready for this. She howls, and the jungle falls silent. Now her amber eyes blaze with evil fire as she bounds out of the undergrowth and launches her vengeful attack. I don't have a bow anymore. I do have fucking Kai Alchemy. That thing is in every damn choice. Elementalism, though, I could use that, and I do have it, so maybe I can set this fucker on fire or something. Anytime a book says X is dead, you can be sure it's not dead or there's another one. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Elementalism, let's go. You use the elemental power of your discipline to whip up the damp earth and bombard the creature with a shower of rock and soil. She shrieks as the sharp shards of granite cut her face and paws, and for a few moments she falters, but she does not abandon her attack. Quickly you raise your weapon in readiness to defend yourself as she presses home her assault. Great. That was really useful. Thanks, elementalism. Oh good, this one's tougher. Snarling and spitting, the savage beast comes hurtling through the darkness to rake you with her terrible claws. Bravely, you stand your ground and prepare to strike your first blow in this desperate fight to the death. And this isn't, this isn't daytime, is it? This is day, this is night fucking time. Okay, good. That's helpful. Also, what? I don't know what the fuck you just typed right there or how a person would pronounce that. What it translates to? Uh, probably something like, I told you so. Alright, let's fight the other Death Stalker. This is really gonna hurt, because it's combat skills 42 and I can't reduce it by any in any way. I don't get any special advantages here. This is gonna hurt. I could, I could straight up lose this fight, in fact. 28 and 40, round 1, go. I lost 1, it lost 8. That's good. That needs to happen every time and we'll be set. 21 and 32, go. Or 27 and 32. It did happen again. I lost 1, it lost 8. This is great. Gloater's gonna gloat. <laughs> Thanks, Saito. Thanks. Thanks for that. 26 and 24, go. Okay, we both lost 4. 22 and 20. I lost four, it lost five. All right, all right, well, we're hanging in there. We got this, we got this, 18 and 15. I lost five, it lost two, that's not good at all. 13 and 13, come on, come on. Ooh, I lost five, it lost two, that's not good. Eight and 11. No, no, I lost five, it lost two again. Three and nine. No! And I lost the fight. Okay, let's try it again. We gotta try it again. That's another death. How many deaths for this book? So many. This is this my this is probably my most death tastic book since whatever the book was with the Chaos Master. That's the book I literally could not actually win. I can always drink that potion before starting up again. The thing is, I was saving it for when like, I'm really overwhelmed by combat skill. Because this thing only beats me by a little bit of combat skill. I might need it. I could drink it, though. Fuck it, I'll drink it.
I'll drink it. Man, we all got a number of deep-seated issues. Oh, no, it has 40 endurance, not 28. Okay, here we go. 28 and 40, round one, go. I lost two, it lost seven. That's good. I'm feeling that. I'm feeling that. 26 to 33. 26 to 33, go. I lost two, it lost seven. I'm feeling that. I'm feeling that. 24, 26, go. I lost four, it lost five. I'm not feeling that as much. 20 and 21, come on. I lost two, it lost eight. Now that I'm super feeling. That is great. That's what needs to happen. That is what needs to happen right there. 18 and 13, come on. All right, all right, all right, all right. I lost, I lost two. It lost seven. All right, solid, solid. 16 and six, let's end this, let's end this. Yes, 14 and zero. I only lost two and it is dead. That's not bad. I have a, I have a few endurance points left over after the fight. I'm not completely tapped. And, uh... And I won. That's not so bad. It's not great, but it's not so bad. If only you didn't lose eight endurance in some ill-advised escapade with a crazy old dude. I know, right? And the fucked up thing is nobody in my chat even told me I shouldn't do it. I relied on my chat buddies to help me out with good advice, and nobody even suggested that I not go with that guy. That's what's fucked up. That is what's fucked up. That is what's fucked up, right there. <laughs> Alright, I won. Oh! Okay. Whew. Man, I wish I hadn't wasted the potion now. The Death Stalker's mate howls with pain and terror as your fatal blow pierces her evil heart. She stumbles backwards, slashing at her own chest with her razor-sharp claws in a frenzied madness of anger and frustration. Then, with a final gurgling cry, death claims her and she crashes down into the dense foliage and is still. Slowly the noises of the jungle return as the nocturnal animals of this old kingdom sense that the terrible threat of her presence has passed. The sun rises over the jungle and lights this steamy, humid morning. By the growing light, you dig a grave in the soft earth and lay the remains of the Deathstalker's mate to rest here, among the ruins of this ancient settlement. Then you offer up a prayer to the god Kai for having bestowed upon you strength and courage enough to triumph over this creature of evil, before you mount your horse and set off along the jungle trail to Elzian. Turn to 350. All right. That is victory. We just won the book, finally. This is the longest one ever. The longest one ever. This one's been crazy long. Crazy long. It is dusk when at last you reach the wondrous city of Elzion. It is a magical metropolis that sparkles like a fiery crimson jewel in the last rays of the setting sun. You pass through its broad outer wall and cross the canal which encircles its tallest edifice, the Tower of Truth. As you approach a vast gatehouse, the portcullis rises and a troop of Vaqueros guards rush forward to greet you. They have been keeping watch for your arrival for many days and had all but given up hope that you would appear. They escort you swiftly into the tower's vaulted council chamber where you are received by Lord Ramoa and the illustrious members of the High Council of the Elder Magi. The Grand Chamber is cleared of all but the most senior council members and a gasp of reverence fills its echoing reaches when, at Lord Ramoa's request, you open your satchel and reveal the moonstone to their learned eyes. I like to think that I pull the moonstone out and hold it up over my head like the fucking Triforce. Ramoa requests that you recount the details of your journey here, and when you have finished, he and his kinsmen praise you warmly for the greatness of your achievement. And I'd also like to think that Firesnake just sang the whole details of his journey here. And then my horse got stolen again. Yeah, it really sucked. You know, like, he just sang, like, the entire details of the whole thing. 
another fucking death stalker are you kidding me like he just you know like the whole that'd be funny and on all the fucking elder mads are just looking at each other and just like what the fuck is happening right now why did lone wolf send this guy What was that thing called? Was it called a Death Stalker? Yeah, it was. Stairway to Elzian? Nice. Congratulations, Grandmaster. You have proved your courage and resourcefulness. Lone Wolf was right to entrust the task of returning the Moonstone to you. You are a credit to your a credit to your homeland and to your noble order you have completed the task set by your supreme master and you have triumphed in the face of great adversity however your mission is not yet fully completed the second and most challenging part of your journey awaits a journey that will take you deep into the wild and lawless reaches of southern magnamund where no kai has ever ventured before if you truly possess the courage to return the Moonstone to the Isle of Lorne, then your quest continues in the next exciting Lone Wolf New Order adventure entitled The Buccaneers of Shadakai. That does sound cool. And that's true. Actually, Lone Wolf never went to Southern Magnamund. All 20 of his books take place in Northern Magnamund. There's like two continents, like North, like North America and South America. It's kind of like that. So it's like all the... Con all the Adventures he went on took place in North America or North Northern Magamond. So now there's this whole other southern continent that maybe that's where all of all of uh, his his adventures are going to take place from now on. I don't know. We finally finished this one, man. It's been almost six and a half hours on this one. I mean, counting my play of it yesterday plus today, longest one. Of course, I did fuck around a lot during this one. You're still on book 10 or so, you think? Okay. Yeah. I don't know how I feel about this New Order series so far. It feels a little bit hard. Like, it feels like going back to the beginning again, which is weird because your character is supposed to be a Grand Master, but I didn't feel like a Grand Master in this book. I think when you go through the Lone Wolf books, you start off feeling really weak as a, as a Kai initiate, but then you feel stronger and stronger as you go. And by the time you're a Grand Master, you kind of feel like a badass. You know, toward the end of the Lone Wolf books, you feel like a badass, and you're doing really epic shit. This book, you're, you're dealing with the dangers of, like, ordinary travel, and you're getting your ass kicked by it. You don't feel like a Grand Master in this book at all. You feel like a Kai Initiate again. So I don't know. It's sort of weird in that in that respect. But still fun. They're all fun. Still waiting for Fire Snake's archery competition moment. <laughs> I hate you. Oh, I hate you. Okay. So, that is going to do it for another Lone Wolf book, polished off, number 21, Voyage of the Moonstone, finished, complete, done. I can tell you right now, next book, first fucking thing I'm taking is Grand Weapon Mastery, because I need that combat skill. You can get by without any of the other ones, but having low combat skill just kicks your ass too hard in the fights. So I'm taking Grand Weapon Mastery, the very next book. Even though it's really boring, you never get to use it for anything cool. You pretty much need it just to get through the fights without losing all your damn endurance. Giant electricity spitting spiders are a common danger for any traveler. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, there were a few things like the Death Stalkers and the, and you know, but like <laughs> most of the problems that he faced in this whole book were just like ordinary dangers of travel. It was the kind of stuff that this book felt like like Lone Wolf book book 4 and book 5 and book 6. That's what it felt like. It wasn't you weren't going and doing some epic shit. You were just traveling through an area and dealing with the problems of traveling through an area mostly. Like like books for like books like you know, the early like the first, you know, five or six Lone Wolf books. And uh just didn't feel like a Grand Master, really. Well, plus the fact that I took a bunch of really useless-ass uh, abilities.
I felt like a spoony bard. Take Deliverance. Yeah, I know Deliverance is really good, and I'll probably take that next after Grand Mastery, but... I'm gonna get Grand Weapon Mastery first. Five more points of combat skill would be amazing. It'd be amazing. So anyway, that is gonna do it for this one. Thank you for watching all six and a half hours of Josiah Plays Lone Wolf Book 21 Voyage of the Moonstones.